Hello, and welcome back to our channel today. Before I let you jump into the book, I need to preface it with a little bit of information. So this series was written in a different format than I usually use. If you've been following along, you know that I go back and forth between the male and the female perspective, and then you'll have one chapter from her perspective and then one from his, and that's how the story progresses. This series is a family series, and rather than telling each individual story one at a time, I decided to follow each of the couples in each book. Now it's an older format um, that used to be used in the nineties. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do it was because of the challenge that it took to write in this way. It was a different type of writing for me. Another reason that I decided to do it is because all of these stories are actually happening at the same time. And rather than going back and repeating events, I wanted to show each of the stories. So I tried to make it easier to follow by doing this is that I have selected a different voice for each character's chapter. So Olivia's voice is going to be different than George's, who is going to be different than Ellie's. George's voice, who he's like 28, is going to be um, a little bit deeper and more masculine. And so I tried to make it so that as the chapter started, you would be able to tell that it was a new character by their voice. Now, also at the beginning of every chapter, I have them state whose point of view that chapter is in, make it easier to follow along. So you're gonna know who's there, but we do jump quite a bit keeping up with these storylines. Let me just give you a little bit about Ellie is the younger sister. She's impetuous. She's the youngest, not the youngest in the family, but the youngest sister in the family. She's impetuous, a little bit crazy, and she makes quick decisions based on her heart. Olivia's the opposite. She's the older sister. She's methodical. She's thoughtful, except for the one time she wasn't, which led to tragedy in her life. And you'll read about that in the book. And we have George, who is the oldest brother. He's just not a good communicator and he's kind of hard to live with. Anyway, so you'll meet George. So we have Olivia or George, then Olivia, and then there's the missing brother and he doesn't come into the story. He comes in later, Ellie and then Porter. Anyway, I hope you enjoy these stories that I loved about it is that it's very much how family life works. You're not like a family is everyone in it, right? And so there's all sorts of things happening in a family at the same time. I wanted to show that it's not like just one person in a family falls in love at a time. <laughs> They could all be falling in love. They could all be falling out of love. They could all be having issues. And then I wanted to throw out Bonnie. She is my more mature female lead and she's facing some, there's a transition. I found that women generally go through transition periods um, based on where they are in life. And I think men do too, but for women, it's really pronounced. So you have your transition into being married and all that kind of stuff, which isn't that hard. It's kind of like being single, but you're awesomely get to be with your best friend. But then you start having babies and there's this identity thing that happens that's like shifts because now you've got these babies and you used to be a certain person and you're feeling drawn to be this other person. And so you're going to change to be what is needed during that time in your life. And then when all those babies get into school, there's another shift that happens and you're all of a sudden able to go to the store and get out of the car in less than four minutes. And it's kind of this other like reclaiming parts of you that you had put aside in order to be a mom. And then um, as your children grow and they become teenagers, and you leave behind the little kid stage and you find that you're part of this group of, of people that's like totally awesome and doing really great things and amazing things. And you kind of shift again and you pick up more of yourself that you'd left behind. And then as your kids grow up and move out of the house, you have, there's another shift. And so anyway, Bonnie is going through one of these shifts and I had a male editor one time tell me that he really just didn't like her. She's such a great example of the struggle that we have as women. It's like, do I want to be where I was? Do I want to be who I was? I can't go back to where I was. I have to go forward, but I'm not sure who that person is that I'm becoming. Anyway, Bonnie is going through all of that and really love her transition period. It does stretch between all three books. And so as it is in a transitions, there's ups and downs. So I just give her grace and let her move through this time period. Um, is there anything else? 
can't think of anything else, but I think you're really gonna love it. There are secrets that will be revealed, family secrets that are deep and dark. So the other thing, if you wanted to follow along in the book, it is available on Amazon, so you can read along with it if you want, or if you feel like, man, I would just rather read this, go ahead and pick up a copy. All right, so I'm gonna let you get going into this audiobook, and I hope you have a really great journey. I'll see you on the other side. The Unexpected Groom a Lime Peak Ranch Family Saga Romance Novel Book 1 Written by Lucy McConnell Chapter 1 Olivia Dumont A warm June breeze lazily danced around Lime Peak, encouraging the sage to release its earthy and somewhat sharp scent into the air. The jagged hill provided stunning views all day long and welcome shade until mid-morning. Snuggled into a small mountain range on the outskirts of Eureka, Utah, the Fair Catch Ranch had the best of all that Utah had to offer a rodeo family. Rodeo royalty, some called the Dumonts and Ruggles, elite Western families who raised their kids in the saddle, destined to gain sponsorships before graduating high school. 29-year-old Olivia Dumont scoffed at the term. Royals didn't have to muck stalls, haul hay, or clean dirt out of their ears. They didn't smell like a barn after a day's work, dust their aunt's front room, or clean a horse's hoof. No sir, that trickle running between her shoulder blades was not a royal glow, it was sweat, pure and simple. Jasper, Olivia's prized Palomino, lifted his chin and turned his ears forward. This was their first time roping together in over eight months. He hadn't forgotten his role, thank the heavens. Olivia, on the other hand, fumbled with the reins, cursing her clumsy left hand. She gritted her teeth and forced back tears of self-pity. If George, her older brother and roping partner for the night, saw her cry, this experiment would be over, and she'd have to work all that much harder to convince any of her siblings to rope with her again. Olivia pushed air between her lips in a slow, measured manner. The steers bumped and shifted in the chute, banging into the metal. They used their horns and strong back legs to crowd forward, shoving their weight against the headgate. When they couldn't break through the gate by force, they settled into their single file line once again. Olivia rubbed her thumb over the ridges of her five-strand heading rope. The five-strand weave packed more material into a smaller diameter. She'd grabbed the rope off the demo wall on her way out of the office, having eyed it for several weeks and wondering if it would fit in her crippled hand. Pushing the stirrups forward with her heels and wiggling her backside, she edged Jasper deeper into the box. He was stunning with his ears perked, listening for the chute to open. Dad had picked up Jasper's workouts while Olivia was still in a fog from the anesthesia. He was somewhere around the yard tonight, probably in the barn with his phone, ready to call 911 when she messed this up. She fumbled to settle the reins in her cramped fingers so she could hold the rope coils with that hand too. Jasper's in better shape than I am, she thought. George trotted his horse, Gypsy, in circles outside the box, politely killing time while Olivia botched basic tasks. George was great at ignoring the obvious and had a real talent for it. Olivia often wondered if that's what had gone wrong in his marriage. Olivia, get your goat out of my rosebushes. Olivia popped her gaze up to where Aunt Bonnie waved from her back porch, then scooted on over to where Mr. Can Can enjoyed the sweet flavor of lemon-colored roses. For the love. She edged Jasper out of the box at a walk, frustration mounting like dust in the barn. Sorry, she called to George. He waved to let her know he was just fine working his horse through the paces of a good warm-up. She hooked her rope over the saddle horn before encouraging Jasper to canter across the arena. At least she could still ride. Not being able to rope had taken away part of her identity, not being able to ride would have been terminal. She pulled her cowgirl hat down, using the wide brim to block out the low-hanging sun. Darn goat. She'd meant to keep an eye on him, but had gotten caught up in what was going on inside the arena. The dry air brushed her arms like a caress, the only caress she'd have in the near future, if she had anything to say about it. Getting back in the saddle, literally and figuratively, was her only focus. 
dating, men, romance, that would all have to wait until she'd become whole once again. Well, as whole as she was going to get. Mr. Cancan had no trouble sniffing out Aunt Bonnie's roses if left to his own devices. He usually spent the dinner hour working his way up and down the gravel drive that branched off the main road into town and meandered into the valley. No one complained when he munched through weeds and even enjoyed dallying in the hayfield. But if one petal went missing from Aunt Bonnie's rosebushes or one measly head of lettuce from her garden, Olivia was notified immediately. The whole valley was notified immediately. Valley was a generous term. Bowl is a better description of their small piece of heaven amidst the sagebrush and limestone. Just large enough for twenty acres of alfalfa, ten acres of grass hay, a five-acre corral where the cattle wintered, two barns, two houses with simple yards, an arena, a round pen, a chicken coop, a large garden where Aunt Bonnie spent the cooler morning hours, and hay storage. Oh, and a goat pen with an open door. The two original homes were divided by a driveway. On either side of that drive were lots set aside for each of the Dumont children. George had finished building a beautiful home on the east lot closest to the main road through town. The gravel drive ran right up to the arena where they unloaded horses, cattle, calves, and at one point in Olivia's high school rodeo career, goats. Two barns, mirror images of one another, framed either side of the arena. Behind each of them was a hay barn. Spreading out behind the buildings was a plot of the greenest hay in all of Utah. An irrigation wheel line rested on the far side of the field, waiting for its turn with the irrigation water. The whole operation was tucked up into the hills, a world of its own. A safe world to grow up in, where rodeo and ranch life blended into a cocktail of beautiful moments, sunrises, sunsets, dust, and determination. Dismounting, Olivia scrambled over the fence, her boots hitting the dark brown soil with a thud. Mr. Cancan skittered his butt around in a half circle and then bolted to the grass. He stopped just as suddenly as he started, bent his head, and ripped out a large chunk of the lawn. Aunt Bonnie shook her head, her hands planted on her thin hips. She wore a leather cuff with the Fair Catch Ranch brand expertly carved and accented with turquoise beads and matching earrings. Her jeans had more bling on the pockets than a Vegas showgirl's costume, and her shoulder length, copper hair was perfectly in place. If 50 was the new 40, then Bonnie was overachieving and holding on to her mid 30s like a champ. Why does he always come after my flowers? she demanded, sending the goat an exasperated stare. Olivia hooked two fingers under Mr. Cancan's collar, being sure to use her right hand. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. I'd buy that if we had a fence. Aunt Bonnie waved the dish towel in her hand as a farewell and disappeared inside the house. Olivia smiled as she led Mr. Cancan across the dirt road separating the Ruggles and Dumont sides of the ranch. Fences weren't necessary between roping partners, and her dad and Dallas Ruggles were two of the best. Dallas and Bonnie weren't really her aunt and uncle, but growing up doing homework on Bonnie's kitchen table, eating the best peanut butter cookies on the planet, and spending countless hours in the barn and arena learning from Dallas made them family. Live, yelled George from the arena. Come on. I'm on my way. She tossed a forkful of hay to Mr. Cancan and flipped the latch on his pen before sprinting to the fence. Three quick whistles had Jasper trotting her way, the stirrups bouncing against his sides and the reins slapping his neck. He stopped right in front of her and put his head down like a penitent child, bumping her stomach. She rubbed his caramel-colored neck. You're a goof. Stepping around, she tucked her foot into the stirrup and swung into the saddle. Even that move was different. Her left hand couldn't grip the horn, so she used her right on the back of the saddle. Little changes. Small steps. I can do this. George shook his head. Can we rope now? Olivia unhooked her rope from the saddle horn. I can. All you've done tonight is catch air. It had taken a good thirty minutes roping with a dummy to prove to George she was ready to try with a real steer. 
In the process, he'd missed several times. That wasn't like him. George had earned the nickname Iceman at the high school national finals because of his ability to catch under any circumstance. He shoved his straw hat low on his head. Big talk, little sis. Olivia laughed. This was livin'. She guided Jasper into the box, turned him, and backed up until his blonde tail was in the corner. At fourteen, the horse was in his prime and an old pro who handled himself with pride. She patted his neck again. His ears flicked back and then to the side, listening as the steer shifted in the chute. Olivia adjusted her seat, waiting until the steer was facing forward and ready to bolt. She forced the reins between her pointer and middle fingers and then hooked them in the permanent crook of her ring and pinky finger. After lining up the coils of the rope, she draped them over all her fingers, using her thumb to keep them from sliding off. Her grip was weak, but she ignored that. Tonight was about trying new things so she could do something as old as the West. She fed her loop and increased the spoke. With a deep breath, she nodded. George hit the remote in his breast pocket, opening the chute and sending the steer to kick up dirt. Olivia spurred Jasper out of the box in hot pursuit. With two rotations of her right arm and wrist, she let the rope fly and caught the steer right around the protective bands on his horns. Dallying, Jasper turned on his own, bringing the steer in perfect alignment for George to rope the heels. Olivia stared at her empty left hand as Jasper put on the brakes, making Olivia squeeze her legs to hang on. She stared in shock at the reins hanging loose around Jasper's neck. She hadn't even felt the leather slip from her grasp. Had no idea that she'd lost the ability to control her mount and rope. The steer veered right to avoid bumping into Jasper's legs. George swung once and the rope sailed through the air, missing the back hoofs by a good three feet. Olivia unwound the rope from the saddle horn and tossed it away. The steer trotted to the open gate at the end of the corral, dragging it behind him. Neither brother nor sister said a word. George should have been able to compensate for her mistake and catch. Then again, she should have been able to hold her reins. George went after the steer to retrieve her rope. You don't have to do that. I messed up, she called. Ranch rules, George called over his shoulder. Olivia narrowed her eyes. Two years ago, George would have waved her on and agreed that it was her error that cost them a time. I'll get it. Olivia gathered the reins and kicked Jasper into a lope. They made it to the steer about the same time and sent him running toward the pen. I said, I'll get it. I missed, George insisted. You wouldn't have missed if. I should have had that one. I don't need you to make me feel better. I don't need to make you feel worse, either. Stop being such a big brother. Stop being such a bratty sister. They argued their way across the arena, leaving a trail of dust and irritation behind them. Dad strode out of the barn. His chest was broad and lifted, his hat pulled low. Now you've done it, George said in a low growl. Olivia smirked at him. I'm not worried. That's because you're his favorite, George joked. Polly's. You're the golden child. You're using too much elbow, Dad called. An NFR champion team roper three years in a row, came in second twice, and not only knocked on the door to world champion, he blew right through it. Dad took a position on the outside of the stripping chute, resting one foot on the lowest rail. George gave Olivia a look before dismounting. He pushed the calf through the opening, and Dad unhooked the rope. He passed it to George and stood up, resting his arms on the top of the fence. His plaid, button-up shirt was covered with dirt and smudges from changing the oil in the John Deere earlier that afternoon. George remounted, recoiling her rope as he trotted Gypsy over to Olivia. He handed her the rope, saying quietly, like I don't know that. If you know it, then stop doing it called Dad. Olivia turned her horse to hide her smile. Dad had eagle ears. 
It didn't matter that George was 32 years old, dad didn't take lip from anyone. Run those last three and then come on in. Dad's invitation was given as an order. Ranch business tonight. Olivia waved to let her dad know she'd heard him. We won't be long. A man of few words, George touched the brim of his hat. Dad pushed away from the fence and headed towards the back door. Ranch business involved the whole family. Olivia fed her loop, adjusting the rope in her left hand. Your hand bugging you? asked George. Cause we can stop if you need to. Annoyed because George had even asked, Olivia kept her head down, hiding behind her wide brim. I'm fine. She hooked the reins with her pointer finger, trying a new hold, and waited for George to get Gypsy to settle. The dapple gray was keyed up after the last run and pranced in the dust. What's the meeting about? she asked. Scheduling. We need to know who's going to which rodeos this summer so we can get organized. Oh. She slouched in the saddle. George would be at every rodeo, his sponsors required a strict schedule, and if he was going to make it to the finals in Vegas this year, he needed the practice. His roping partner lived in St. George and ran a ranch there for his family. Practicing together was a rarity, which is why Olivia had finally convinced him to let her head so he could heal. Second string did not sit well with her. The siblings ran the three steers and Olivia's rope caught them every time. Every time. Relief swiped a smile across her face. She could rope. It was everything that came after that she'd have to relearn. Nevertheless, there was hope. I'm getting stronger, better. Maybe next year, she could buy her permit and hit the PRCA circuit again. George caught two out of the three. Olivia recoiled her loop, considering her older brother as they cooled their horses. At 32, he had a few wrinkles around his eyes. His brown hair curled over his collar. His forehead wrinkled, and he was working his bottom lip, something awful. What's on your mind? she asked. Nothing. Carol? George and Carol had gotten married five years ago, shortly after finding out Carol was pregnant and before she started to show. The couple had lived in Dallas and Bonnie's basement apartment, the very one Olivia and Ellie, their younger sister, shared now. No one asked questions when Carol packed up their son, Levi, and moved in with her mom. That was over a year ago, but they were both still wearing their rings. Olivia couldn't help but notice that every time George looked at Carol, there was a river of love in his eyes. I don't want to talk about it. George spurred his horse forward and disappeared into the shadows of the barn. Olivia let him go. The Dumont men were a brooding bunch when the mood struck, and she wasn't inclined to throw herself in the middle of whatever drama Carol had stirred up this week. When she got to the barn, she took her time unsaddling Jasper. Tonight's ranch meeting was about as enticing as talking to George about his marriage difficulties. Chapter 2 George Dumont George slipped the bridle off his dapple gray, gypsy, and hung it on the hook outside her stall. She shook her mane like she was glad to be rid of the restraints. Much like Carol did when she pulled her hair out of a tight ponytail. He loved it when Carol did that. Loved it even more when he dug his fingers into her silky blonde hair and massaged her scalp. She'd go to putty and sag against his chest, moaning softly. He missed his wife. He wanted Carol to come home. There was a difference between having a woman around and having his woman to come home to. He'd spent the last year building her a house in hopes that she'd recognize the giant effort he made to make her happy and move in with him. She hadn't. Oh, she'd been impressed with the wraparound porch and the stone and clabbered exterior, but she'd never set foot inside. He wished she would. Wished he could walk with her from room to room, her hand in his, giving her the grand tour of what their lives could be together. He'd purposefully kept the decorating to a minimum and painted the walls plain cream or white. He wanted Carol to pick colors to fill their home. 
the only room he'd decorated at all was Levi's. His son had a wooden tutan cowboy room, complete with a log cabin bed and dresser, bandana pattern curtains, and a toy chest full of horses, soldiers, Lincoln logs, and matchbox cars. The clip-clop on the concrete floor told him Olivia and Jasper had made it to the barn. He slipped out while she was still in Jasper's stall, brushing down the horse, giving him oats, worried she'd ask him more questions he didn't want to answer. Halfway across the barnyard, his phone rang. His heart jumped when he recognized Carol's ringtone. Perhaps remembering the feel of her hair running through his fingers, or thinking about the miracle of a little boy they'd created, or all his wishful thinking, but he answered the phone with, hey, beautiful, just like he had when they'd first started dating. The second the endearment was out, he bit the inside of his cheek. He knew better. There was a slight pause and then a soft, hello. A warm feeling softened the arch of George's shoulders. He glanced at her profile picture. Her kiwi green eyes smiled back at him. Angie asked if I could take her shifts next Friday and Saturday night. Is there any chance you could take Levi for me? What days, he stalled. Friday and Saturday night, or even just one of the nights. I could use the tips. George kicked at a rock. It skittered across the drive and knocked two more away. That's what talking to Carol was like lately. He'd say something and it would knock into several other touchy topics. This weekend is strawberry days, I'm roping. He rolled his eyes at himself for sounding like an idiot. Carol knew he'd rope. She also knew he couldn't stay home or his sponsors would have a fit. He'd lose a paycheck. So why she was asking? Was this a game? Was she trying to make him look like a bad father? He shuffled his boots. She wasn't like that. He had to believe the best about her intentions or the darkness would swallow up their marriage. He fought that fight. Not because he was some saint, but because he believed in the love they shared, believed in them, and believed in marriage. How about I take him with me? George blurted. He'd never even thought of hauling Levi along to a rodeo before. Trying to keep up with a toddler on his own would have been impossible. There were so many opportunities for the boy to be hurt. Only a few seconds could mean the difference between, he shuddered. But Levi was older now. He was out of diapers and mostly out of tantrums. The longer George thought about it, the better the idea sounded. Carol cleared her throat. I'm pretty sure Mom and Ellie are going too. Are they riding? Of course. They competed in barrel racing in poles. Then the answer is no. He ground his teeth. Never had he loved a woman more than he loved Carol, and never had a woman frustrated him more in his thirty-two years. He could demand to take his son, but that would only create another barrier between them. He could insist she take the money he offered every month so she wouldn't have to scramble for a babysitter. He could tell her she was as stubborn as a mule and as blind as Mr. Can, Can His grip on the phone tightened, and he pulled it away from his ear. Pastor Rick's sermon on building a strong family sprang into his head. Be careful with your words. Once they are said, they can be forgiven but not forgotten. With a deep breath, he infused his, I guess I'll see you and Levi on Monday then, with a smile that he wasn't really feeling. She didn't answer right away. The silence made George wonder if she'd cancel Levi's weekly writing lesson to get back at him for not helping her out. He'll be there. Believe the best in her. The words whispered across his heart, springing hope like goosebumps. I'll have Princess saddled in case you feel like riding too. We'll see. They said goodbye, and George tucked his phone into his back pocket. He thought of all the little kids he saw at the rodeos in their boots and cowboy hats. They were the cutest little stinkers on the planet. Levi would fit right in. Now that the idea of taking his boy to the rodeo had gotten into his head, he couldn't get it out. Somehow, he'd have to get his family put back together. God willing, 
it would be before Levi was too old to remember a time when they weren't under one roof. And if God wasn't willing, then George would wear out his knees trying to change his mind. Chapter 3 Olivia Dumont Olivia scanned the group gathered on Dallas and Bonnie's back deck. She was dying for an ice pack, but there was no way to get one without drawing unwanted attention to herself. Dad and Mom sat together, their thighs touching and Dad's arm draped across the back of her chair. George leaned against the deck rail, his ankles crossed and his arms folded. Ellie, her only sister, reclined in one of the handcrafted chairs. Her long, shiny blonde hair hung over one shoulder, her bare toes wiggled free, and her boots were lined up next to the seat. Porter, the youngest Dumont, leaned his elbows on his knees and hung his head. He'd graduated from Tintic High School just over a month ago and still had the surly teenage thing going for him. Half the time, his hair fell over his eyes, and Mom was constantly telling him to get a haircut. Dad told Mom to lighten up. Dallas and Bonnie finished off the circle. Bonnie's hands were busy with a piece of gray string as she crocheted a band of thick lace that would eventually become a necklace or bracelet. Her talent with everything from beads to wire and leather to horsehair allowed her to craft custom jewelry which she sold for a tidy profit through a few stores in Cobble Creek, Wyoming, all year long. Then, once a year, she rented a booth during the four-day carnival and rodeo in South Jordan, Utah. She rarely brought more than a few pieces home. The only person missing from the family meeting was William. George often joked, when mom and dad weren't anywhere near, that it was no wonder William had wanted to get off the ranch so badly, since he was trapped between Olivia and Ellie in birth order. William had gotten a full-ride scholarship to Utah State and then landed on Lehigh Silicon Slopes working for Adobe. He only came home for Mother's Day, Christmas, and Easter and kept his visits short because if he stayed too long, he and Dad butted heads and Mom cried. Dallas and Bonnie hadn't had children of their own. Their big house had been a refuge for Olivia and her siblings when they needed a break from the pressure of being a Dumont. Bonnie's cookie jar was always full, and Dallas welcomed help with his current project, even if that help was just talking his ear off while he worked. He said their chatter made the time fly right on by. Dallas had a real talent when it came to building, and the deck was a piece of art. He'd also made the deck chairs and the long table that was tucked up against the house to allow room for everyone to get comfortable while they figured out the summer schedule. We'll cut the lower field tomorrow and rake on Tuesday and bale on Thursday before we go. Who put in for strawberry days? asked Dad. I did, said George. Me too, added Ellie. I'll be there, muttered Porter. I'm going. Dallas took a swig of his Mountain Dew. Bonnie? Dad asked Dallas's wife. I'm staying home. I've got a lot to do to get ready for South Jordan. Olivia nodded. I'm coming. Mom slipped her hand over Dad's shoulder. I think me and homecoming have a shot at beating Ellie and Zinger. Ellie's eyes lit up. We'll see about that. Care to make a friendly wager? I'm game, though I don't promise to keep it friendly. Mom rubbed her palms together. What do you have in mind? Loser has to buy winner something from Bonnie's booth. Deal. There's a necklace I've been eyeing up. Bonnie flapped her hands at them. Stop. You are welcome to just have the necklace. Nah. Ellie's going to buy it for me. Mom winked at Dad. Ellie examined her nails. I'm not worried. Olivia's stomach churned. She should be in on that bet. Maybe she should just go for it, head out there and compete with the rest of them in barrels. She tipped her chin down and turned her palms up. The fingers of her left hand curled in, the pinky finger hanging out to the side much farther than it should. Tiny scars laced from her palm to the tips of her pads. Could she hold the reins? Not if her hand ached like this. Dad turned towards Olivia. That leaves you to drive the haystacker. Olivia buried her hands between her knees and her desires deep inside her heart. 
No problem. Leave the bales the stacker can't get to, and George and I will bring them in when we get back. An argument balanced on the tip of her tongue like a kid on the edge of the high dive. The idea that she might not be able to bring in the hay by herself kept her from jumping headfirst into the deep end with her dad. Both hands curled into fists, and she bit down on the pain. Liv? Dad egged for a verbal agreement. Silence fell across the deck like a heavy cloud. George rubbed his nose. Ellie examined the clouds. Bonnie tipped her head to the side, sympathy brewing in her gaze. Dallas tucked his chin, making his sagging cheeks hang over his collared shirt. Who was she kidding? The hay bales weighed between 60 and 70 pounds. Her fingers couldn't take the weight. I'll leave it for you. But you don't want to, observed Bonnie. Olivia forced her hands to relax. You guys have done so much for me. It's time I start carrying my weight again. Sounds good to me. Dad leaned back in his chair and kicked a foot out in front of him. Olivia leaned forward. Her heart pounded an eager rhythm. You can start with Dr. Robert Canton. She threw herself back into the chair with a grunt of disgust. The last thing I need is to go to another doctor. Olivia matched his posture even as she shuddered at the thought of an afternoon wasted in some white-walled office where a guy with a stethoscope told her she was done with rodeo, done with roping, done with life on the ranch, and should find herself a nice desk job that didn't require proficient typing skills. She'd proven the doctors were ignorant when it came to writing. That was the easy part. And tonight she'd proven she could rope, even though fire burned through her hand. Dr. Canton is coming to you, well, us. Dad uncrossed his arms and draped his arm across the back of Mom's chair. He's renting the apartment above the barn for a month. Olivia wrinkled her forehead. The dorm-like apartments above the barns were used during the clinics they hosted in the spring and sometimes fall. They never rented them for extended periods. Why? asked Porter. He didn't say much, said Dad. I gathered he was looking for a quiet place to spend some time with his kid. Dad scratched his neck. He wants to be involved with the ranch while he's here. Olivia can show him around and help him get settled. Pastor Rick said Dad had a gift for seeing those who needed to be brought back into the fold. Olivia? Not so much. She hadn't exactly found her gifts of a spiritual nature quite yet, but she knew it wasn't babysitting some know-it-all doctor. Dad, she protested. Liv, Mom cut in, a familiar warning note in her voice. Fine. Olivia nodded. Her hand ached, and she was dying for a bowl of ice water to submerge it in. The sooner they got this meeting over with, the sooner she'd be able to slip off to the barn and tend to her hand without anyone seeing. What was an afternoon getting the guy and his kids settled, anyway? Once they were tucked into the apartment, she'd get working on the hay and prove to everyone that she could do more than act as a tour guide. This was her shot and she was more than ready to take it. Chapter 4 Eleanor, Ellie, Dumont Ellie kept one ear tuned towards the hallway outside the main office of the family rope factory while Logan Labram did a fine job of nibbling on the other. She ran her hands up his thick biceps and across his rounded, muscular shoulders, enjoying the sensation of his breath on her bare neck and the low burn he created in her belly. I love you, he murmured against her skin, his lips warm. She pulled back to see the truth of the words shining in his stormy gray eyes. I love you too. She hooked her arm behind his neck and pulled him down for a steamy confirmation that had her heart thundering like her championship barrel horse on a sprint. Logan's strong hands moved up and down her back, bringing their bodies flush. Somehow, the light click of high heels on linoleum made it through the haze of passion in Ellie's brain. She gasped, pulled back, and searched the room for some escape. My mom, she hissed. Logan dropped down and rolled under her desk, one of three in the room, and the only one that had an opening toward the back wall. Olivia's desk faced off with Mom's desk in the middle of the room. 
Ellie wiped her mouth, hoping she didn't have lipstick smeared to kingdom come. She did her best to tidy her hair, knowing some pieces had slipped from the loose knot when Logan dug his fingers in back there. She sat quickly and Logan pulled her chair in, his hand coming to rest on her ankle just as the door swung open and Anna Dumont glided in. I found him. Mom tapped her foot, one hand on her hip. Her lips were thin, set in a determined line. Logan's hand tightened on her ankle. Ellie swallowed the squeak that threatened to escape as she feigned interest in QuickBooks. Who? Porter. He's late. This is the third time since graduation. Mom paced in front of Ellie's desk. I think he needs more structure. Porter came in carrying a partially filled garbage bag with an empty one tucked into his back pocket. He had on a plaid hooey hat, his hair curling along the brim, and a t-shirt and jeans. Where you been? asked Ellie. Logan began tracing circles over her shin, his fingers leaving trails of heat in their wake. Heaven help her. There was an accident on the freeway. Porter picked up the garbage can in the corner and emptied it. The Fair Catch Ranch was located just inside of town, and the factory was located across the main road and to the west. The closest freeway was I-15, and that was 20 minutes east. Oh, was all she could think to say through the haze Logan created with his touch. He should stop, or she was going to do something to give them away. If Mom was upset about Porter being late, she'd open the gates of Hades with a fury if she found Logan hiding under Ellie's desk. Mom stopped pacing and faced her youngest. Did you get registered for UVU? Not yet. Porter pulled out his phone and attached a set of earbuds. Mom pinched the bridge of her nose. You can't work for DR Ropes without some kind of training or education. Porter put in one bud. Maybe I don't want to. You want to be a janitor forever? Ellie had been the janitor when she was in high school. So had William and Olivia. It was a great job for a kid who had to have a flexible schedule and whose parents believed in making their kids work. Not only had they emptied the garbage cans, they helped clean up the waxing station and swept the thread room. Maybe. He put in the other bud and shuffled out. Logan went to move. Panicked because her mom was still in the room, Ellie said, does he remind you of William? Her voice was too loud, the pitch too high. William wasn't exactly a safe topic, the guy could push mom's buttons like a four-year-old in an elevator. But she had to say something. Logan froze in place. Mom retrieved her leather purse. William always knew what he wanted. And what he didn't, Ellie added without thinking. Mom gave her a look that said she agreed but wasn't happy about it. The difference between them is that Porter seems lost. I'm not sure he knows where he's going or what he wants. She adjusted her purse strap. I'll see you later. Love you. Bye. Mom shut the office door behind her preferring to keep the tiny threads that floated through the air from twisting ropes in the factory off the computers. Ellie waited until she heard the loud clang of the metal door before she shoved her chair back and dove under the desk with Logan, where their lips came together in an explosion of urgent passion. Ellie had many things in this world, blessings she thanked the good Lord for every night before going to bed. Logan Labram was at the top of the list. If only he wasn't the one thing her family wouldn't approve of. Chapter 5 George Dumont That's my buckaroo. George waved excitedly at Levi as he finished his pole run at a trot. That was the first time the five-year-old had completed the pattern without slowing to a walk or knocking over a pole. His weekly lessons were paying off, and George couldn't be a prouder papa. Every Dumont ran poles as a kid, boy or girl. The event taught skills to both the rider and the horse. In this case, the horse knew what she was doing. At least one of them should. Levi was catching on quickly, though. He'd take after his daddy sure as the sunrise. Wahoo! 
Carol's call came from the side of the arena, moving all his attention her way. She looked exceptionally good in her tight jeans, form-fitting t-shirt, and flip-flops. The curves on display were his favorite in all the world, and he missed them like he would miss his lungs if they were taken from his body. Watching her climb the fence and swing one long leg over after the other to perch on the top reminded him of all the times she'd sat there watching him practice. That first summer they were together, he missed practically every throw cause his eyes were on her and not the steer. He thought his roping partner was going to ditch him and find someone new. Memories of the picnic and fireworks and the wild abandon that they'd been all caught up in assaulted him. They could get that back. He'd been praying they'd find a way to be together, but Carol had a stubborn streak wider than the North Forty. There was a reason she wouldn't come back. Whenever her defenses went down, when she softened at his touch, he'd see something rear up behind her eyes and stop her from giving in. If he could figure out that reason, he'd be able to win her back. Levi trotted past his mom, showing off all his teeth in a wide grin. George approached, moving Gypsy at a slower pace. When they reached the fence, he resisted the urge to lean over and peck a kiss on Carol's rosy cheek. If they lived on the ranch, Levi could ride every night. They could be out here kicking up dust as a family. Princess, the horse he'd given Carol for their wedding, was in need of more exercise than a few turns on the walker during the week. He nudged Carol's leg. Did you see what our son did? When she met his gaze, her eyes were full of the sweetness that had first drawn him to her side. Seemed like that was several lifetimes ago and yet the proof that it still existed was right there in front of him. I did. She waved at Levi. That was awesome, buddy. You didn't do too bad either. She patted George's thigh, leaving behind a tangled mess of thoughts in a puddle of heat. He'd figured out a piece of the puzzle. It wasn't George being a father she had a problem with, it was him being her husband. Levi, he called to get his mind off of Carol's touch and back to the safety of the corral. Let's end on a good note. Go put Millie up. Okay, Dad. The way his little voice carried across the big expanse of sky and dirt made George's love for him expand ten times. One day, his kid wouldn't be so little in the middle of all this, and that would be a very hard day for Dad. Do you need help with the saddle? Carol twisted on the fence, ready to jump down. Levi looked good and insulted at the suggestion. I can do it. Carol gave him that look that said she didn't believe a word he said. George reached out and stilled Carol. He's good. Millie knew what she was doing around the poles and in the barn, and Levi needed the chance to prove he could take care of the animal. He's four, she countered. Porter's in the barn he'll keep an eye on him. At 18, Porter was overqualified to help Levi unsaddle a horse. Too bad he wasn't qualified for much else in life, besides rodeo. Carol wrapped her arms across her middle. Must be nice having someone around to pick up the slack. The wistful note in her voice made George perk up. Your mom giving you grief again? She lifted one shoulder, her eyes tracing the hoof prints in the dirt. Same old story. George ground his teeth to keep from snapping at Carol. Her mom wanted to be footloose and fancy free. Had never really cared for taking care of Carol when she was growing up either. George could only guess the kind of childcare she provided for Levi. I'm sorry. He was so very sorry she felt the need to move back in with a woman who had barely wanted her in order to get away from him. When he'd asked Carol what he'd done that was so bad, she'd said, it's nothing you can change, so there's no sense in talking about it. Thanks. She lifted her chin. It's not so bad. The edge in her tone warned him off asking for details. Nudging Gypsy, he made a tight circle and brought her right up to the fence, her belly brushing Carol's leg. Carol yelped and grabbed the fence. Hop on. She gave him the same I don't believe you look that she'd given Levi only a few minutes before. I'm not wearing the right shoes. 
they both looked down to take in her flip-flops. She'd painted her toenails dusty pink, just a shade or two darker than her lips. Before he could contemplate those lips and the wonderful things he could do with them, George patted Gypsy's rump. I'll keep you safe. Carol eyed the barn. It's not that far. He smiled, knowing that if she were going to turn him down, she would have done so by now. It's not, but you miss riding. Her cheek quirked up into a smile. That I do. Using the fence rail, she was able to get on behind him with practiced grace. George steadied her with a hand here and there, wondering if she felt the comfortable awakening between their bodies. George kicked Gypsy into an easy lope, and Carol's hands went to his belt loops. The two of them moved in sync with the horse twice around the arena. George slowed the horse to a walk, and Carol leaned her cheek against his back. He could feel her take a deep breath, feel the distance between them melting away. Following his own advice to Levi, George decided to end on a good note. He turned Gypsy toward the barn and let her have her lead. She knew the way home. If his many prayers were answered, Carol would too. Chapter 6 Bonnie Ruggles Dallas's saddlebag had seen better days. But then, Bonnie Ruggles had too. She pressed her hand into her lower abdomen to stop the pain shooting through what could only be her ovary. After a few shallow breaths, the wave receded, and she could straighten up again. She put a package of beef jerky into the leather bag, plus two packets of beef-flavored instant noodles in a bag of mandums. It was a wonder Dallas was still alive, considering the way he ate. Of course, he only ate like that on the trail. When he was home, Bonnie fed him salads and veggies right along with his steak and ignored his griping. Dallas swaggered into the kitchen, his spurs jangling and his belt buckle shining. He wore a plain red shirt, button-up, with a pocket on the left side. He had gotten thicker over the last few years. Thanks. He swung the bag over his shoulder. I hate leaving you here by yourself. Bonnie scoffed. How he managed to treat her with kid gloves after watching her carry a load that would have most men in tears, she'll never know. Logan's coming to do chores, and Anna and I are going to that Italian place in Provo. It'll be fun. Dallas's face clouded over. Bonnie immediately checked her excitement level. He fumbled with the latch on his saddlebag. If you want to go out, why didn't you say so? I could stay. I'd take you for a steak dinner. She shook her head much too fast and caught herself. She wasn't being a very good wife, shoving her husband out the door and looking forward to having him gone for a few days. I want lasagna and ravioli. Dallas had a chuck wagon palate. In the early years of their marriage, Bonnie would make Italian, Mexican, even Chinese, but the reception at the table was chilly. As time progressed, she'd moved her stuffed shells and lemon chicken recipes to the back of the recipe box. She'd pull them out when making a meal for a new mother or a sick friend just to remind herself of what she could accomplish in the kitchen. Sometimes, when she dared look at that shadowy part of her heart, the one where she shoved all her misgivings, doubts, and unhappiness, she'd long for Dallas to hit the road. He participated in many local jackpot ropings, but there were a few rodeos that he couldn't resist. While he was away, the wife could play. The time alone was like a small tropical island with a soothing breeze in the middle of an ocean of ranch life, a break in the constant wave of work. She loved Dallas, but she didn't always love the ranch. But to say so would wound him and their marriage beyond repair, because Dallas saw the ranch as an extension of himself. If he went to Romano's, he'd complain about everything from the violinist to the marinara sauce and make her miserable in the process. Besides, she hurried on, anxious to get him on the back of a horse pointed north. They need you, and you look forward to this all year long. The Delta Rodeo is one of your favorites. The corners of his eyes lifted. 
John and I are going to give George and his partner a run for their money this go-round. Moving as if the matter was all settled, Bonnie opened the screen door and held it as Dallas maneuvered his bags and broad shoulders through the opening. You'd better tell me all about it when you get back. She smiled, knowing full well that he wouldn't say more than ten words on the subject. He'd shuck his boots and socks in the mudroom and head to the shower while she put on a spread for the entire family to celebrate being together again. We'll be out of reception on the drive but should be fine once we get there. The saddlebag fell to his forearm and he grunted. I know. She pecked a kiss on his cheek and stepped inside. Be safe. I will. He grinned once and headed off to the barn. Bonnie turned to the sink. She loaded the dishwasher and wiped down the counters, getting every crumb. She could live off cold cereal if she wanted, and no one would mess up the kitchen for a few days. The thought lifted her spirits considerably. When the sound of horses moving faded and the dust settled, she turned on the soundtrack to Fiddler on the Roof and danced, letting the song in her heart free while she had the chance. Chapter 7 Dr. Robert Canton. Leaning forward to ease the pressure on his lower back, Dr. Robert Canton slowed the vehicle to accommodate the twists and turns through the canyon. Boulders of all shapes and sizes piled next to the road. Some were black as coal, and others tan and sandy. Small pieces of sagebrush dared to make homes on the side of the cliff. Riding shotgun was his seven-year-old son, Jax, who was tired of being in the car. He tucked into a diary of a wimpy kid book first thing this morning and hardly lifted his golden brown eyes to take in the Rocky Mountains, the cherry orchards in Santaquin and Payson, or the sheep farms and wide open spaces south of Utah Lake. Robert drank it all in with wild abandon. This place had special meaning for him. A meaning he had kept close, not even sharing with his heaven-bound wife. He wished he'd told her before the accident. Wished he'd shared the one secret that sat in the back of his heart like a piece of coal. He should have trusted her more. Still, he wondered how he could build a life a beautiful life with a vivacious woman and keep something from her. She wouldn't have left him. It wasn't that kind of secret. But it was big to him. It was this thing that he needed to face head on before he could finally put Jessica to rest in his heart. A giant gateway with a Fair Catch Ranch logo imprinted in iron appeared up ahead. Robert signaled and made the turnoff, hitting the dirt road too fast. He slammed on the brakes and the car fishtailed. Jax dropped his book to the floor with a gasp and held fast to the door handle. Robert regained control, his heart racing. He barely registered the house on the right as he checked Jax, who was still breathing hard. After Jessica died in the car wreck, Jax wouldn't go near a vehicle except the school bus. They'd had to take public transportation to Jessica's funeral or risk missing it altogether. But that was over a year ago. With a lot of long talks and some exposure therapy, Jax was finally comfortable in a car again. Robert didn't want to mess that up with one ill-managed turn. Look out. Jax threw his hands over his face. Robert jerked his attention back to the road and saw a goat directly in their path. He swerved, laying on the horn, but the goat moved with him. Yanking the wheel back the other way and spraying rocks behind him, Robert was able to miss the animal. Jack screamed. Robert cursed and slammed on the brakes. When the dirt cloud cleared, they spun around to see the goat, now on the side of the road, put his nose down and yank out a mouthful of weeds, chewing as if he hadn't escaped certain death by the hairs on his chinny chin chin. Jax copied Robert's curse word as he flipped back around in his seat and pressed his hand over his heart. Robert stared at him. Not sure what to say. Do as I say, not as I do wasn't exactly stellar parenting. See, Lord. This is why you should have saved Jessica. I never swore around her. A screen door slammed and an irate woman tore down the front steps of the house on the right. Are you crazy? She yelled, throwing her hands in the air. Still jacked up on adrenaline, Robert scrambled out of his seatbelt. Me. He met her at the front bumper, barely noticing the way the sun bounced off her matcha-colored hair hanging loosely over her shoulders. That goat has a death wish she ran right in front of my car. Ha. She folded her arms as if she'd won the first round of their verbal boxing match already. He's too old to run. You were probably texting. That one really stung considering Jessica I don't text and drive. Ha. She folded her arms as if she'd won the first round of their verbal boxing match already. He's too old to run. You were probably texting. That one really stung considering Jessica. I don't text and drive. She tossed her hair over her shoulder. Look, I get that you city guys are on a schedule, but if you're going to drive down this gravel lane, you're going to have to slow it down. 
It's not safe for the animals, our guests, or you to plow through here like you're cruising IF-15. Robert's head was spinning trying to keep up with her. He glanced down at his brown button-up shirt and khaki pants, standard doctor wear that could also be mistaken for a UPS uniform. Hmm. I may look like a city guy, but that doesn't mean you can take me to task when clearly your animal is to blame. There has to be a leash law or something. Her mouth fell open as if he just asked for a prescription for penicillin to treat cancer. Before she could reply, a roundish woman came out of the house on the left and stood on the porch, the screen door whining and slamming behind her. For heaven's sake, Olivia, what is going on out here? The woman, who must be named Olivia, threw a hand his direction as if just looking at him would explain everything. Robert considered her for a moment, the formal-sounding name at odds with her worn jeans and faded plaid shirt. He would have easily called her Liv or Vi or any number of other things, such as sweetheart, based on the lovely heart-shaped face, full cheeks, and eyes that were like jewels. He'd seen a citron gem once that was that exact shade of brown with orange undertones. He thought it was unique among the diamonds, rubies, and emeralds at the gem show. The brown was even more unique as her eyes burned with righteous anger. Before his thoughts could go any more astray, he tore his eyes off her body and checked on Jack's through the windshield. The boy was staring at the cattle on the other end of the property. He almost took out Mr. Can Can and the fence. And he ruined George's grading job on the driveway. He'll be ticked off when he sees those tire tracks. The woman shook her head. Olivia Dumont, that is no delivery man. She hurried down the steps, skiing like a head nurse short-staffed on the night shift. I'm Bonnie Ruggles. You must be Dr. Canton. Bonnie held out her hand as she walked. Time slowed down. Robert moved like he was in a funhouse mirror trick, Bonnie getting farther away and the harder to reach the more he tried. He stared at her light brown hair and took in her dark brown eyes. He'd pondered this moment on and off during the drive, wondering if some part of him would recognize her. An instinct he didn't know he had. This was Bonnie Ruggles. She'd been Bonnie Miller when she made the decision that impacted Robert's life. The impact pushed him to take a leave of absence from practice and move his son out west. Somehow, he managed to accept her proffered hand. She pumped hard enough for the both of them before letting him go. I'm sorry about all this. She motioned to Olivia, who had folded her arms and tucked her chin, glaring for all she was worth at his front tire. She's got a blind spot where that goat is concerned. If Bonnie noticed Robert's tongue glued to the top of his mouth, she didn't say a thing. Instead, she marched around the car and swung open the passenger side door. This must be Jack's. Father and son nodded in unison. I've got warm cookies for the both of you inside if you're interested. We're not the Holiday Inn, but we aim to please. Sure. Jax's voice was small, but he smiled. This moment was one Robert hadn't thought much about, his son meeting this woman. The impact of seeing Jax look up at Bonnie for the first time had the impact of a sonic boom. Like the pressure he'd felt to come out here, the idea continually pounding against his consciousness, and yes. Even the nudge from the Lord, they were all there to create this bond. Jax was always a quiet kid, the still one amidst the classroom chaos. But after Jessica died, he had drawn inward. They could spend hours in the same room, and his son wouldn't speak a word. How was the drive? asked Bonnie. Long, answered Jax. I'll bet. Did you see anything interesting? There was a giant spider in the bathtub in our hotel last night. What color was it? Black, and it had this weird leg. We put a glass on top of it so we could look at it for a while. That was a smart thing to do. What did you see? I counted the legs. Jax continued on, answering Bonnie's every question. She knew just the right ones to ask to keep him talking as she ushered the two men up the steps. My car. He'd left it off to the side but still in the road. Leave it. Bonnie waved off his concern as if cars parked in the middle of the road here all the time. For all he knew, they did. As Olivia had so kindly pointed out, he was a city man, unschooled in country ways. 
with a mental shrug, he followed after her. Robert couldn't help the sense of relief at having another adult around. Being a single parent came with the constant pressure of responsibility. Olivia moved to follow them. How Robert knew that, he wasn't sure, since he hadn't been looking at her. But there was this awareness hovering about that had tuned into Olivia. The signal was fuzzy, but it was there. He wasn't sure how he felt about that. What are you gonna do about Mr. Can Can? Bonnie asked over her shoulder. Olivia rolled her eyes as well as any teenager, though she was certainly not. He's working on the weeds. Just then, a UPS truck turned up the driveway. Olivia squeaked and hurried off to grab the goat by the collar and pull him out of danger. She didn't yell at the driver, so Robert assumed he was traveling at an acceptable speed. Bonnie swung open the protesting door, and Jax floated through on the smell of cocoa and sugar. His thin shoulders climbed down from his ears, relaxing in the familiar and comforting aromas. Robert hung back, holding the door for Bonnie but also feeling like Indiana Jones taking a giant leap of faith. This was his point of no return. If he walked through the door, he could never go back to blissful ignorance. There was a place in his head, where daydreams existed, that would be replaced with reality. Sometimes, daydreams were spoiled by too much reality. Chapter 8 Olivia Dumont Olivia signed for the delivery and the driver was off before she had a chance to say thanks. The postage marks were in Spanish and English, and the box was heavy for its size. Probably leather from Mexico for Bonnie's jewelry products. Most leather workers had to order outside of the country because the chemicals used to process hides were banned in the U.S. She set the box off to the side of the lane and kicked rocks as she made her way down to Mr. Can Can. He probably shoved the latch with his nose and opened the fence. No one really cared, except the guy who drove the dirt road like he was Lightning McQueen. The goat was content with a patch of dandelions. He probably wouldn't wander into the road again, but she tied him off to the fence with a stray piece of baling twine to be safe. Might as well. Who knew if the doctor would listen to her warning about slowing down? In her experience, doctors only listened to themselves. The orange string tied easily and was strong enough to keep Mr. Can Can out of trouble. The twine was a blessing and a curse. A blessing, because it could be used to temporarily mend everything from fences to tack. A curse, because no matter how hard they tried to round up the strings, there were always a few strays left to cause problems in the weed mower or swathe. Olivia measured out the length of Mr. Can Can's tether so he couldn't get into the drive but could still eat the bitter leaves. She glared at the slipknot. There has to be a leash law, she mimicked the doctor's ridiculous comment. A leash law? For goats? On private property. Yeah, they have those. She straightened and took in the ranch, trying to see it all through the city slicker's perspective. To an outsider, the place might look like an odd collection of buildings and a slew of smelly animals. To her, the Fair Catch Ranch was one of the most beautiful places on God's green earth. Olivia nodded once before stomping over to collect Bonnie's package and head toward the house. She dragged the side of her foot to even out one of the ruts, all the time feeling like she had a burr under her saddle. If she did, she knew just who put it there. Doctors, every single one of them was impossibly infuriating. A leash law? Just another attempt to place limits on the people and goats around them. Like he knew what was best for her animal. Mr. Can Can had been keeping the weeds down around the Fair Catch Ranch for over eight years. Olivia's stride lengthened. She was perfectly within her rights to reprimand him for driving too fast on private property, but had he taken responsibility for that? Of course not. He'd just run his hand through his short cropped brown hair and looked at her like she was crazy. He never once glanced at her hand, though. The thought made her come to a sudden halt in the dirt road. Everyone stared. Especially the first time they met her. They tried not to make it obvious, but their gaze would inevitably drop to her fingers, then dash quickly to the side. Not this guy. 
He'd kept his troubled blue eyes right on hers, their sky-colored depths sparking with indignation. Never mind. There was no point in thinking about the color of his eyes. She shook her head to clear it. The sooner she got Mr. Crease in his pants settled, the sooner she could get to the arena. Her success with roping was like tasting cream cheese frosting for the first time, it only left her wanting more. She was going to take one of the smaller goats out and try her hand at goat tying. Dad had refused to let her near the clinic they had offered last spring, afraid she might re-injure her hand when she flanked the goat. That wasn't her concern. What Olivia was worried about was gathering the legs. Holding three wiggly goat legs in her left hand would be a trick. Tucking her hair behind her ear, she tucked back the fear, too. Today wasn't about proving anything to anyone but herself. Once she was certain she could still tie, she'd insist on being part of every clinic offered by the ranch and maybe even put on a few of her own. She worked full-time in the office at the family rope factory, so she had something outside of ranch life, but she missed rodeo. Living with her family, who breathed roping, horses, and all things cowboy, and not being able to participate, was like taking a bubble bath while leaving one leg outside the bathtub. Not exactly a satisfying experience. That's why teaching had an appeal. She still had all the knowledge stored away, and spending time with the next generation of cowgirls would allow her to get both feet into the bath. She could post the announcement on the Facebook pages for the local rodeo clubs, and there. Boof! Olivia bounced off the back of the doctor, who was holding open Bonnie's door and staring inside. He started as if he hadn't heard her approach. She hadn't seen him in the shade from the porch. His brown clothes blended right in, and she had been thinking of other things. Sorry. Her eyes dropped down. The crease in his pants looked a lot different from behind. Flushing at her thoughts, Olivia griped, You going in? He blinked several times and shuffled to one side, letting the door swing shut. I'll wait out here. Olivia tucked the package under her left arm and pulled the door open. Don't worry, I got this. Setting the box just inside the door, she turned back to find a man who looked as lost and lonely as a litter of kittens on the side of the road. Up to this point, she hadn't given much thought to why the doctor was here. What would send a man into a new state with his son? When Olivia was a girl in pigtails and scraped knees, the apartments above the barns were full of hired hands who needed some time to work through their issues and enough hard work to help them sleep at night. As the kids grew into the chores while simultaneously growing into men, the rooms would slowly empty. This guy reminded her of those men from long ago. Another thought followed right on the heels of that one, her mother would be appalled at the way she'd treated their guest. Almost running over the goat she'd won state championship with was no excuse to give a stranger a tongue lashing. Now, if he'd actually hit Mr. Can Can, he'd be fair game and not even her mother would hold her back. But. Hey, I'm sorry I yelled at you. If you promise not to smear my goat with your bumper, I promise to lighten up. He looked at her as though he'd stepped from another dimension where a whole different situation played out. Deal? She stuck out her hand. He considered her hand for a moment, hanging out there like an olive branch. Olivia squirmed inside. Just when she was about to withdraw her hand and the offer for peace between them, he pressed his palm to hers, and something amazing happened. The warmth from his touch went directly to her cheeks and then trickled ever so pleasantly into her lower belly, where it pulled. He stepped closer, and she came to him, her body moving of its own free will. Unable to lift her eyes higher than his shirt button, she forced the heat down her throat with a monumental swallow. Are, are you coming in? Had she already asked him that? Maybe. She wasn't at all certain that much of anything had happened before this moment, nor worried about what might happen next. His brow lowered as he turned towards the door. I think I'll stay out here for a bit. He stepped back, taking all the heat and the delicious tummy swirls with him. Why, she blurted, not understanding why she'd reacted to him that way. The longer he was over there and she was over here, the clearer her thoughts became and she remembered her plan for the afternoon. Never mind. 
she waved off his answer. You're our guest, so feel free to sit wherever. She hurried through the door. The man would probably leave them a scathing review on Yelp. Passing through the immaculate visiting room in the front of the house, Olivia breezed through the kitchen, snagging a chocolate coconut cookie on the way. Bonnie and Jax were at the kitchen table, a plethora of coloring books, crayons, and cookies before them. Knock, knock, said Bonnie. Who's there? asked Jax. Yeah. Yahoo! Yahoo, ride M cowboy. Jax laughed like any second grader would at a pathetic knock-knock joke. At least Bonnie was charming half their guests. She had such a way with kids. There was a time when Olivia was a surly 13-year-old that she'd wished Bonnie was her mother. Not that Anna Dumont was a bad mom, she was a good parent, which meant she set boundaries. She also spent a lot of time building up the company that supported their family. She was driven and smart and had a passion for business. But that left Bonnie to help with math homework, read stories, and bake cookies. Now that she was older, Olivia could appreciate what each woman had taught her. In truth, it was probably her mother's blood coursing through her veins that made Olivia so determined to get back into rodeo. Though Bonnie and Dallas were considered family, they didn't share the same genealogy as the Dumont children which never stopped them from taking one of the boys in hand when needed or soothing a girl's broken heart. They were like second parents. Which is why it irked Olivia that Dr. McSpeedy out there wasn't in here accepting Bonnie's offer of hospitality. If he bothered to taste even one of her cookies, he'd see they were the most delicious cookies on the planet. Doctors were too uptight. His short-trimmed hair and clean-shaven cleft chin were as strict as military standards, and he probably was too. Her pulse had sure jumped into a double march at his touch. Shoving those thoughts aside, she hurried out to the goat pen, where she caught the smallest one. You ready for some fun? she whispered as she slipped on a collar. He bleated in response, and Olivia took that as a yes. Time to get to work and get her mind off Dr. Robert Canton. Chapter 9 Ellie Dumont For Ellie, the third day of any rodeo was filled with mishaps. She didn't know how this happened, but it always did. The accidents never happened in the arena, it was outside the arena that problems popped up. Her name would be left off the program. Her fees wouldn't be recorded. The stalls she reserved would have someone else's horses in them her tie-down would break. When she tripped over a roping dummy at high school state finals, scraping her palms, her friends joked that the rodeo gods were out to get her. Ellie believed in one god, and as she loped circles to warm up her horse, she offered a prayer to him that she and Zinger would be safe in and out of the arena. Mom loped homecoming on her left. The animal was a hand taller than Zinger and a redhead if ever there was one. He was the type of horse legends were made of with his swift change of lead and lightning turns around the barrels. His temperament left nothing to be desired. One time, when he was about two, Levi had wandered into the barn. George scrambled in a minute later to find homecoming nudging Levi away from the other horse's stalls with his nose, Levi giggling so hard he could hardly walk. How homecoming got out of his stall, no one could figure out. They figured he knew all along how to unlatch his gate, but never had reason to until Levi needed protection. Not all horses were like that, but homecoming was why mom won so many buckles. Not to date though. We're here to win, right, boy? Ellie leaned back and patted Zinger's rump. Zinger got his name from being the exact same color as a chocolate Zinger, a deep cocoa that straddled the line between brown and black with a white stripe down his belly like cream filling. He settled into a trot, allowing Mom and Homecoming to come alongside. How you feeling? asked Mom. Good. Ellie nodded. Her phone beeped, and she pulled it out of her chest pocket to see a text from Logan. Go get M. Love you. Ellie smiled at the screen. She bit her lip as she typed back a quick love you back and stashed the phone. Who was that? asked Mom. She was sitting tall in the saddle and not looking at Ellie, which meant she was extremely curious but unwilling to let on. 
Ellie scrambled for the reins. Olivia. Olivia? Mom's eyebrow went up. Ellie clenched her belly. She really didn't want to get into the whole Logan thing, ever. Well, one day she'd have to if she planned to marry the guy. But that wasn't going to happen until her mom figured out that Logan wasn't his dad. Mr. Labram had once tried to put DR ropes out of business. When he didn't succeed, he languished in self-pity, driving off his wife and oldest daughter with verbal abuse and financial ruin. Logan stayed and took care of his dad, knowing full well the man didn't deserve his charity. Ellie admired him for his kind heart. Her dad would call him a softy, but she loved his tenderness. Craved it even. Thankfully, mom's phone rang at that moment, and she moved to the side of the arena to take the call. Ellie hoped it wasn't Olivia. Hey there, Miss Ellie. Matt Fargo brought his horse alongside Zinger. Hey, Mr. Matt, Ellie returned. Matt's family went as far back into rodeo as Ellie's, and they'd grown up riding the same circuit with their daddies, hanging on the fences until they were old enough to compete themselves. Broad-shouldered and built thick in the torso, though Matt was all muscle, the Fargo men were steer wrestlers, quick-handed with excellent technique, and they could break three seconds without breaking a sweat. Do you remember the time we snuck into the calf pen to get a look at your draw? Matt asked, showing off his perfect teeth. Ellie remembered the way his eye teeth used to poke out like fangs before he had braces. The girls didn't seem to care, they followed him around like he was royalty. The Prince of Rodeo, Ellie had dubbed him back then. The name still fit, the man was nice to look at, but he did nothing for Ellie. She laughed. How did we confuse the steer pen with the calf pen? I still have a bruise on my thigh from where that mean little beast hooked me with his horn. Matt leaned closer and lowered his voice. Now that's something I'd like to see. Oh. Ellie swatted him away. Stop flirting, you'll make the other girls hate me. Matt laughed. I'll see you around, Miss Ellie. He touched the brim of his hat. Bye, Mr. Matt. Ellie waved. What was that all about? asked her mom as she sidled up to Ellie. Seeing Matt must have taken mom's mind off the whole text thing. Just Matt being a goof. Ellie shrugged. He's grown up into quite the man. I hear he's got a nice spread in West Mountain. Ellie picked a string off her pink shirt. I hadn't heard. I think he's interested. Mom pumped her eyebrows. Ellie laughed off her comment. The only thing Matt is interested in is having a good time, and he can have that with any other girl here. Mom shook her head. Ellie, you're blind if you can't see the way men look at you. You're more than old enough to think about settling down with someone, and the Fargo men are good men. Ellie sighed. Before she could explain that marrying Matt would be like marrying George, her name was called at the gate. She used the call as an excuse to get out of a conversation she didn't know how to end and spurred Zinger into a run. Chapter 10 Dr. Robert Canton Nestled between two mountain peaks, the Fair Catch Ranch was an oasis in the middle of the desert. Beyond the fence line, the land was covered in scraggly green bushes and rocks lots of rocks and it rose up and up until it touched the sky. A sky that looked like it was blushing as the sun went down. Why did that color bring Olivia's cheeks to mind? Maybe because he'd spent the last hour trying not to watch her ride in the arena. The apartment was situated such that he had a clear view of the arena out his living room window. The alternative was watching the Mariners lose to the Astros, which wasn't going to hold his attention. Not when Olivia was so graceful on a horse, an extension of the animal with her hair streaming out behind her as she raced from one fence to the other. Just as he was about to turn away, she brought out a small goat. Not the one he'd almost run over, but a younger, lighter colored one that she'd stake to the far end. A moment later, she burst into the arena on her horse and then jumped off, stumbling forward. She'd fallen, pulling her left hand up to her chest and taking the brunt of the fall with her shoulder. That didn't slow her down any. She got to her feet and ran up the line to the goat, where she flipped it on its side and tied its legs lickety-split. With a nod, she untied the legs and set the goat back up on all fours. The process was repeated over and over again. Each time, Olivia's dismount grew more graceful, her movements more sure. When she turned her horse toward the barn, Robert wanted to be there to greet her, to tell her how impressed he was with her determination. 
Shaking off the thought, he turned away from the window to find Jack sound asleep on the couch with cookie crumbs on his cheeks. Robert smiled, thinking of the silly knock-knock jokes Jax had so proudly told him over dinner. The kid had fallen for Bonnie in a New York minute. He ran his hands through his short hair as his stomach churned. Maybe coming here was a mistake. He thought seeing his birth mom would give him an anchor he'd been missing since Jessica passed. He thought he could come here and walk in like it was no big deal. He'd been wrong. It was a huge deal. He'd wondered if she would recognize him if some part of her would know it was him. There was no spark of recognition. Why should there be? The last time she'd seen him, he was less than an hour old. He switched from running his hands through his hair to rubbing his stomach. His parents hadn't hidden the fact that he was adopted. They were honest and open people with big hearts who loved him wholeheartedly. He'd never wondered what was on the other side of that adoption certificate and eventually it had faded into the past. And yet, he'd never told his wife. Even when Jax was born. The words had been right there and he couldn't push them over the edge. The fear that blew the words inside of him was like a small stack of Legos. He'd have to break apart each layer to build something better. And so he'd ask his mom for the file. She dug it out of the attic and they combed through the faded ink pages together. He learned Bonnie's name and her old address and a few things about her health. But nothing that helped him break apart his Legos. He picked up Jack's, loving the way he snuggled in like he'd done when he was a baby. The bunkhouse over the barn was an interesting setup. There was a communal kitchen, dining area, and gathering room with a television and couch. The bookshelves were stuffed to the gills with Lewis Lammer, Zane Gray, and Larry McMurtry books. The bottom shelf had an assortment of tattered board games. Off the main room, five bedrooms, with locks on their doors, gave guests a bit of privacy. With just the two of them staying the month, Jax had his pick of bedrooms. He'd chosen the room with the horse quilt and curtains. Robert slid him under the covers and pressed a kiss to his forehead. He left the door partially open in case Jax woke up during the night and called for him. His bedroom next door didn't have any animals on the blanket. In the soft light from the bedside lamp, the brown blanket reminded him of Olivia's matcha-colored hair. Grunting softly, he yanked it back. This place was getting inside his head. Chapter 11 Olivia Dumont What was your time? Olivia asked Ellie. She tucked the phone between her cheek and her shoulder so she could fold clothes while they talked. If Ellie was home, they'd be folding together and watching the latest episode of Once Upon a Time. 19.35, Ellie replied. Way to go. That was a decent time, but Ellie could do better. Olivia didn't need to tell her that, she was hard enough on herself. Did you beat mom? Ellie scoffed. No. I'll have to make good on my bet when we get home. Sorry. Is she gloating? She's kind of upset at me right now. What happened? She wants me to marry Matt Fargo, and I don't want to. The Prince of Rodeo? The one and only. Why don't you? Matt was a good-looking guy with ambition. He'd bought land in West Mountain and was making a name for himself apart from his dad. Something Olivia could admire. Ellie sighed loudly. I'm not interested. Olivia pictured the two of them together. With Ellie's long, honey-colored hair and Matt's razor-sharp jaw, they'd make quite the pair. Mom was probably picturing the beautiful babies you two would make together. Polly's. I don't need Matt to make beautiful babies. Um. You know how that works, right? Olivia teased. Ellie laughed. You know what I meant. She cleared her throat. We're changing subjects now. Tell me about the lost soul above the barn. There's two of them, he has a kid. Olivia paused, thinking of Jax's quiet demeanor. In the short time since their arrival, he'd colored and rarely spoke. She wished he'd build a fort in the haystack, throw manure at the side of the barn, or collect bugs out of the garden. Anything lively and childlike. She couldn't imagine what it would be like to lose your mom at his age. Oh. Yeah. Olivia took a deep breath, changing her thoughts over to Jax's dad. Honestly, the dad is stubborn and odd. He wouldn't eat a cookie, and he hardly said a word. She snorted. Except to tell me there should be a leash law for goats. What? He did not say that. Ellie was properly aghast at the suggestion. 
He did. I can't wait to meet him, she deadpanned. For some reason, the idea of her gorgeous sister meeting Dr. Canton didn't sit well with Olivia. Ellie was so pretty, any guy would look good by her side. Robert's smooth cheeks, military haircut, and troubled sky-blue eyes would pair extremely well with Ellie's sun-kissed beauty queen look. Crap. Changing the subject again. Olivia shook out a towel with a snap before folding it. This is your year to make a run for the finals, E. You've got the horse, you're healthy, and you don't have any distractions. I'm so excited for you. Olivia had had her run at the PRCA, and she'd messed it up. The week she should have qualified in barrels, she was lying on an operating table having her hand put back together. Her ride never got the time it deserved. Thanks. Ellie's answer was as flat as the shirt Olivia had ironed not ten minutes ago. I wish we could do this together. Maybe we can. Olivia pressed her lips together quickly before blurting, I tied tonight. You did? Ellie sounded cautiously excited. Their parents wouldn't have the same reaction, which was why she hadn't told them. Yeah. I didn't have a timer going or anything, but it felt good. And your hand. Worked out just fine. She pulled her fingers into a fist. Her grip wasn't as tight as it should be. She'd had to modify her grab, just like she'd had to modify her hold on the reins and rope the other night. Instead of forming a C with her thumb and fingers to scoop the legs, she'd had to use her wrist and all her fingers. And she'd had to bring her hold down toward the knees a bit to cross the legs in the correct spot. She couldn't do things the way she used to. To her dad, that meant she couldn't do them at all. And no amount of arguing would make her point. She'd have to find a way to show him that she was still a competitor. You going to tell dad? Ellie's voice was a whisper. Olivia shook her head even though Ellie couldn't see her. Not yet. I need to do something big that will prove I'm ready. Olivia hugged a soft, lavender-scented towel to her chest. She talked about proving something to her dad, but really, she needed to prove it to herself. There was no guarantee she would ever win another buckle, ever take another roping jackpot. The thought that she could be classified as the crippled daughter of a roping legend sent icy trickles down her spine. Well, when you do, I'll be cheering you on. Olivia grinned. Her sister was seriously cool. Even if I beat you, she teased. Especially if you can beat me. Ellie laughed. Chapter 12 Dr. Robert Canton Part of the deal Robert worked out with John Dumont included helping with daily chores. He wasn't about to be late for his first day of work, so he and Jax were up with the sun. Shortly after, there was a loud knock on the main door. Robert ran his eyes over Jax. They'd stopped at the IFA in Payson yesterday to get outfitted for their cowboy adventure. Jax had on a new pair of boots, a plaid snap-up shirt with a collar and short sleeves, and a pair of wranglers. Robert had been surprised to find the jeans fit his skinny kid without the adjustable elastic in the waistband. You ready, cowboy? Robert asked. Yep. Jax hooked his thumbs in his belt loops, making Robert grin. He pulled open the door and the handle came off in his hand. He stared at the metal bar, not quite believing what had just happened. Morning. Olivia's smile wilted as she looked at the broken door. I don't know what happened. Robert held the piece out to her. She took it carefully, as if he'd break her with a touch. Then he remembered what it had felt like to hold her hand the night before, and his cheeks turned the color of sunset. I don't have time to fix this now. She took a couple steps into the room and set the handle on the breakfast bar. You can fix that. Jax asked. Yes sir. Olivia ruffled his hair. You can help if you want. Sure, he chirped. Right now, we've got a barn full of hungry horses you ready to use those muscles. She reached out to give Jax's bicep a light squeeze. Robert's eyes went to the smooth skin on Olivia's biceps. She wasn't a body lifter or anything, but she had some nice definition. Round shoulders. The long, graceful neck. Let's go here asked. Jax didn't need any more of an invitation. He shot down the hallway and stairs quicker than Robert could blink. I haven't seen him this excited in a while. He did his best to shut the door behind him, but without a handle, it hung up in a couple inches. Is this safe? He asked. Olivia was already at the top of the stairs. It'll be fine. He looked at the door once again. 
he'd never left a door unlocked in his life. It just wasn't done in his house of order, and it left him with a sense of unease. The stairway was on the outside of the barn, so they had to walk around to the front doors. Jax was waiting for them at the line between sunlight and shadow. He stared into the dark barn with wide eyes. Several horses leaned their heads over the stall doors and were staring back. One kicked the wall, and another blew a raspberry. There were knickers and hoof stomps. Jax grabbed Olivia's hand. They're hungry, said Olivia. They'll settle down once we feed them. She led him to an open door off to the right, chattering away to ease Jax's discomfort. Robert couldn't help smiling as he watched his son soak up her every word, as if it were gospel. Robert followed. Inside the room were bags of feed, saddles, leather this and that, horseshoes, new and old, tools, shovels, pitchforks, and a hundred other things he couldn't put names to. We work these horses like Olympic athletes, so we need to feed them like athletes. Olivia patted a large white sack. This is conditioner. It helps them put on muscle like a protein shake for a bodybuilder. Jax nodded as if he knew that bodybuilders drank protein. You two can measure this out and put it in the feeders. She handed Robert a small plastic bucket with a line drawn in black sharpie several inches from the top. I'll go first and toss hay. We got this. Right, bud. Robert held out his fist for a bump and Jax complied. All right. She left them to go do her thing and Robert took a moment to show Jax the line in the bucket and how to scoop the conditioner. Once they had it just right, they went out to the line of horse stalls. Olivia had already loaded several feeders. She wiped a stray strand of hair off her forehead and pointed to the first stall. That's Princess. At the mention of her name, the horse's ears twisted. She pulled her head, covered in hay leaves, out of the feeder and eyed them warily. Robert lifted Jax up so he could pour the grain over the hay. Princess stomped her front hoof and snorted. Jack squealed, but he finished the job. Robert's attention was taken by Olivia as she swung the pitchfork loaded with hay over her head and into the feeder. Her body was one graceful arch in movement, her brow tight with concentration. There was a clang as the fork hit the metal and the hay dropped into position. Dad. Jax bumped his leg with a bucket. Come on. Right. Robert shook off the distraction. Once inside the tack room, he watched Jax load the next bucket as he considered why he continued to watch Olivia. First last night in the arena, and just now, she totally captivated his thoughts. The way she moved with grace and surety was refreshing and beautiful. She made work and hard work at that charming. Dad. Jax was already at the door with a full bucket. Coming. He hurried out, noting that in the time they'd filled one bucket, Olivia had finished feeding the rest of the horses. She was now sweeping out the walkway with efficient quick swipes of the broom. They fed the next horse and headed back to the tack room. I think this would be faster if we took the bag out there and scooped. Robert wrapped his arms around the feed container and lifted with a grunt. He nodded toward the door and Jax went out ahead of him. What you doing? Asked Olivia as he set the bag in front of the next stall. He lifted Jax to drop the feed and said, I thought this would be faster. She eyed the bag. That's not exactly he grabbed the top of the sack and yanked hard. A rip echoed in the rafters and feed poured from the ruined bag to cover his brand new boots. Whoa. Jack stared. You made a mess. His neck burned as he noted the just swept floor and wasted feed. Sorry. Olivia took a deep breath. I'll get a shovel. She disappeared into the tack room and came back with a shovel and another bucket. Let's get the horses done first and clean up second. Her cheeks were pulled wide in a smile as she talked to Jax. Not him. Have you ever ridden a horse? She asked Jax as they worked. He shook his head, his eyes wide with fear. We won't ride today, she assured him. But it's a good thing you're helping feed. It lets the animals get used to having you around. In a few days, you'll be friends. With her help, they made short work of the feeding. Jack squatted down and used his hands to scoop the pellets into the larger bucket while Olivia used a shovel. Robert was struck by how normal Jax looked. He wasn't a kid missing his mom. He wasn't a son worried about his grieving father. He wasn't staring out the window or lost in a book, he was fully engaged in the moment. He was living. Robert tucked his hands in his pockets, letting Jax have the moment. When the bucket was full, he reached for it, figuring the least he could do was carry it back to the tack room. I've got it. Olivia grabbed the handle. No. Let me. Robert pulled back. The bucket tipped, spilling grain. He fumbled for a second before dropping the whole thing on Olivia's foot. Umph. She bit her lip, her eyes darting to Jax. Robert could hear the curse word she was holding back. I'm so sorry. He dove for the bucket and started scooping grain with his hands. Jax joined him. Olivia limped a few steps. I've had worse. Robert straightened. He'd broken the door, spilled horse food, and now injured her. He'd been an awful guest. How can I help? Um, don't. Let me at least take a look at your foot. You could have a broken toe. She swatted his suggestion away. I don't think so. Look, I know what I'm doing. I'm a doctor. 
Olivia's back went rigid. She held out a stiff arm. You stay right there. Her tone didn't allow for argument. Robert exchanged a look with Jax. Dad can fix it he's good with stuff like that. Thank you Jax. Robert patted his son's shoulder. His praise meant more than any award. I'm sure he's fantastic. Olivia said the word fantastic with enough sarcasm to paint the barn. I'll be fine. She limped to the broom and began sweeping up Robert's mess. I'll bet Bonnie has breakfast ready. Why don't you two head over to her back door and load up on German pancakes? Great. I'm starving. Jax took off at a run. Robert shook his head. Wish I had his energy. Yep. Olivia nodded once, her eyes trained on the task before her. There were tight lines at the corners of her eyes. Pain lines. He'd put them there, and he felt horrible for it. Bowing he'd make up for his mistake, he followed Jax across the barnyard and up the back steps, where the smell of melted butter and cooked eggs greeted them. He hovered at the screen door, unable to swing it open and step inside her home. A home that she hadn't wanted to bring him into. Come in, we're just dishing up. Panic spiked through his veins. If she knew it was him, would she still want him there? I've got dirty boots. Jax nodded. Dad spilled a whole bag of horse food in the barn. Olivia's still cleaning it up. Oh. Bonnie turned to him with one eyebrow lifted in question. I think I've stretched Olivia's patience this morning. Well, that's not hard to do these days. Bonnie talked through the door. She's not the same since well, I should let her tell you about her hand. Needless to say, she's had a tough year, and some scars aren't visible to the naked eye. She pushed open the screen door and offered Robert the plate. You can sit at that table if you'd like. I want to eat outside. Jax dripped syrup across the hardwood. Bonnie caught Robert's eye, a smile on her face. I guess we more alike than I thought. I'll get him to clean up the mess. Don't you worry a thing about it. That's not the first spill on my floor, and God willing, it won't be the last. He didn't mean any harm. She made sure Jax was settled on the steps and had a couple of napkins tucked under his plate before heading back inside. Robert didn't want to compare Bonnie to his mom, it sort of happened all on its own. His mom hated spills. Robert was always on guard when they ate at his parents, worried that Jax would make a mess. Not that mom was mean or anything. She just liked to keep a pristine home. She wasn't like that when he was a kid, but as time went by, she'd become more focused on the little things. He wondered if Bonnie was the other way. If she'd been worried about little things when she had him and that's why she gave him up. He eyed the screen door. There was no way to know unless he asked her flat out and he wasn't going to do that. Whatever life Bonnie had made for herself after having him, she deserved to keep. He wasn't here to cause waves or disrupt a good thing. He was here to find peace. The trouble was, all he'd done this morning was make messes. He could hardly talk to Bonnie now and he ticked off the one person who was his point of contact. It was time for him to take a long walk and reevaluate his decision to come to the Fair Catch Ranch. Chapter 13 Olivia Dumont Olivia watched Robert trudge out to the Ruggles barn, his steps heavy and fast, like he couldn't get away from Bonnie's back door fast enough. She shook her head. That man was worse than a bull in a china shop. He didn't need delicate items to break, he could do a bang-up job on just about anything. Bonnie, she called in warning as she quick-stepped across the back deck towards the screen door, troubles headed out back. Robert had already done a number on her dad's barn, and Dallas was ten times more particular about his workspace. She yanked open the door, a tirade about having to clean up after the walking tornado on the tip of her tongue. What trouble? asked Jax. His lips and cheeks dotted with frosting. Licking beaters was tricky. Olivia grabbed the words she was about to say by the tail and tossed them away. Did I say trouble? She laughed nervously. I meant the trailers out back. Jax went back to concentrating on the beater. Olivia widened her eyes for Bonnie and jerked her head towards the back door. Bonnie lifted to her tiptoes to see out the window above the sink. She shrugged. Logan's out there this morning. He'll keep an eye on things. Olivia retrieved a spoon out of the drawer and sampled the frosting. Sweet, cream cheese-ish, with a hint of salt. Perfect. He was bent on getting out of here. What happened? A heaviness swooped into the room. Bonnie blinked and gave a slight shake of her head, unwilling or unable to answer. He walks a lot since my mom died, said Jax, his big brown eyes filled with more understanding than a child should be privy to. The casual way he said my mom died added another layer to the heaviness in the room. 
he doesn't go far. Bonnie put her arm around Jax's little shoulders and gave him a squeeze. She was so great with kids, letting them open up when they were ready and never pushing for more. With Olivia and Ellie, all she had to do was put a cookie and a glass of milk in front of them and she knew their deepest secrets. With George and William, she had to be a bit more patient. Olivia wasn't sure if anyone got through to Porter these days. He didn't eat breakfast. Bonnie looked pointedly at the freshly frosted cinnamon rolls. Her tone clearly said she expected Olivia to remedy the situation. Olivia pulled her shoulders forward. Why me? Why did she have to get saddled with the klutz who carried enough emotional baggage to fill a horse stall? She wasn't like her dad, who knew how to heal a man's soul, and she wasn't like Bonnie, who had the patience of Job. But one look at Jax and the frustration Robert inspired shriveled. With a resigned sigh, Olivia reached for a napkin. I'll take him a roll. Make it two. Bonnie grinned. Olivia loaded the gooey masterpieces onto a paper plate and headed out the back door, ready to make nice. Not that she'd been mean to the guy, per se. But when he'd thrown out the I'm a doctor line, she wanted to punch his smug face. And her foot was fine. A little sore, but nothing she couldn't walk off. All his examination would have done was waste time. Time was the one thing she didn't have, because she'd finally figured out what she needed to do to get her confidence back. She needed to bring in the hay. All the hay. Every last bale. Making her way across the deck and down the steps, Olivia wasn't so sure about this plan. She hadn't lifted a bale of hay in a long time. If she needed one off the stack, she usually climbed up and kicked it down. Bucking hay was hard work. Work she respected. Robert hadn't gone inside the barn. Thank goodness. Things inside the barn were breakable, things outside the barn, like fences and machinery, were durable. He paced from the backyard to the barn door with practiced efficiency. Jax was right, he didn't go far. Logan jogged out, heading for his truck, but when he spotted Olivia, he changed directions. Morning, he called before they were even close. Good morning. Olivia didn't stop walking. She was on a mission to make nice with their tenant, and she needed to focus. Apologizing wasn't her favorite thing in the world, and there was a large lump of crow stuck in her throat. Are there more where those came from? Logan asked, still headed her direction. He eyed the plate of cinnamon rolls and licked his lips. His while e coyote impersonation was funny. The guy lived alone and was on the skinny side. He probably didn't get much by the way of home-cooked meals. Bonnie's got a whole pan. Sweet. He touched the brim of his hat and kept right on walking up the back steps. As Olivia got closer to the barn, the deep lines framing Robert's mouth became visible. He moved like a man swimming through troubled waters. I brought you a cinnamon roll. Olivia held up the plate. She fell into step with him. My, but he has long legs. She was used to keeping up with men who had more to do in a day than hours to do it all in, but Robert walked faster than her dad and brothers. He glanced at the plate and then away, not slowing down. Thanks, but I'm good. His blatant refusal of Bonnie's baked goods raked over Olivia's skin. Bonnie was looking out for him, her nurturing personality extending like a free gift to their guest. And Olivia had had to swallow some bitter-tasting pride to walk out here with a peace offering. She tamped down the urge to give him what for. After all, she didn't know the guy from Adam. Maybe he was some kind of health nut or something, and refined sugar was the devil. She'd once had a doctor tell her that she needed to drink half a cup of olive oil to help grease her joints because she didn't get enough fat in her diet. She'd tried it and had been sick for days. Reaching for another topic, she said, Jax told us about your wife. I'm sorry for your loss. Robert didn't turn her way, and the lines on his cheeks deepened to furrows fit for planting corn. Thanks. I'm sorry for snapping at you about my foot, too. 
Robert stopped, his boots grinding against the rocks. Really? You're sorry now that you know I'm widowed, but you weren't fifteen minutes ago. Olivia's mouth fell open at the hot sting of pepper sprinkled over his words. She'd come to smooth things over, and not only had he refused her cinnamon roll offer, he questioned her sincerity? Not on her ranch. Hey, that's not fair. Fifteen minutes ago, I was limping because you dropped twenty-five pounds of grain on my foot. That was an accident, and it wouldn't have happened if your bucket wasn't a piece of crap. Clearly the man was delusional. I suppose the doorknob was my fault too. It's your barn, he fired back. That was the last straw. That's where you're wrong. That's my dad's barn. He built it with his own two hands, right down to the last nail. If you have an issue with his carpentry skills, I suggest you take it up with him, and good luck with that. She shoved the cinnamon rolls into his chest, not caring that the icing made them stick there. She'd really meant to hand it to him, but her actions were backed with fury, no one insulted her family. She folded her arms, enjoying the shocked look on his face, the way his arms were out to the side and the plate plopped to the ground, leaving the cinnamon roll stuck to the Mariner's logo on his t-shirt. Taking a page from her dad's book, Olivia decided this guy could use a day of hard work. Enjoy your snack, because it's the last one you'll get till the hay is stacked. Robert leaned over and snatched the plate off the ground, wedged it between his chest and the pastries, and shucked them to the dirt. He then threw the plate on top of them. I'm ready right now. She threw her hands in the air. Have it your way. That'll be a first. She stalked back to the house with him matching her stride for stride. Stupid long legs. Wrenching open the door, she stuck her head inside and said, Bonnie, I need you and Jax to drive the truck. We've got hay to buck. Bonnie eyed her up and down as if measuring her determination. Olivia gripped the doorway, ready to defend her decision if Bonnie started in on the reasons she shouldn't be doing this. Her face was already warm and probably pink from arguing with Dr. I'm right about everything. Bonnie methodically folded the towel she was holding and set it on the counter. We'll be out in just a minute. Is Logan still around? Olivia hoped he was and she hoped he wasn't. If Logan was around, he would be a huge help, and if he helped, Olivia couldn't exactly say she had hauled hay by herself. She wasn't counting Robert. He had zero experience and would tire quickly. He was as close to not having help as she could get. He left a few minutes ago, answered Bonnie. Olivia nodded. We'll be fine. Follow me, she ordered Robert. He did, though he kept looking at her out of the corner of his eye all suspicious-like. He reminded her of a two-year-old horse being saddled for the first time. The trust only extended so far. Olivia grabbed four pairs of gloves from the tack room. She tossed one to Robert. You'll need these. He may deserve every ounce of hard-earned pain he would acquire that day, but she wasn't cruel enough to make him haul hay without gloves. His jeans were new, thick denim. Strong enough to protect him for the day, but by the time they hit the washing machine, they'd be broken and good. She slipped one of her size small gloves over her left hand. Then she added a medium-sized one on top of that, and finally an extra large as well. The bailing string was thin and strong, and could cause a healthy hand to seize with muscle spasms after a while. She wasn't sure what it would do to her hand. With all the layers of leather, she could hardly move, but there was just enough flexibility to work with. She closed her eyes. Dear Lord, this is either the stupidest thing I've done, or it's the next step on my road to recovery. Make me stronger than I think I am, and protect me from my stupidity. When she was done praying, she looked up to find Robert watching her with concern. She knew how her hand looked to others, all crisscrossed with scars and the last two fingers hanging at an odd angle. It didn't take a brain surgeon to figure out that something bad had happened. You got something to say, doctor? He shook his head. Then let's get going. Chapter 14 Ellie Dumont
Ellie closed her eyes, hoping that when she opened them Matt Fargo would not be riding his paint into the practice arena. It was the middle of the afternoon, the middle of the barrel racing, and the middle of Zinger's warm-ups. Matt wasn't set to bulldog until late that evening. He should be reclining in the shade somewhere, not heading her direction with a purposeful set to his whisker-covered jaw. Logan had a short beard, the whiskers soft and thick. She sure enjoyed the feel of it when he kissed her neck. She smiled to herself. Even when I look at other men, I think of him. When she opened her eyes, Matt was right in front of her, a half-grin on his undeniably handsome face. Afternoon, Miss Ellie. Mr. Matt. Good ride last night. She kept Zinger moving, turning him toward the gate. Tara Briggs went through the gate, her horse's nose in the air and feet prancing. She turned him in tight circles to get him on the right lead. Ellie was up next. Matt followed. Thanks. You, too. Shaved off three seconds. Great, he'd watched. It's not hard to do when your first ride is a disaster. We should celebrate. How do you plan on doing that? Matt was something of a prankster, and she wasn't in the mood for one of his jokes. Can I take you out for dinner? Matt looked right at her, his country boy charm floating around like butterflies and dandelion fluff. If she were any other girl, she'd swoon right out of her saddle right now. But honestly, no part of her could muster up excitement about going on a date with the rodeo prince. Her heart was already gone. Thanks for the offer, but I'm going to hang here until my mom's done. We have a bet going. Ellie looked around, hoping nobody had heard them talking. The cowboy working the gate was watching Tara, and the other riders were doing circles, keeping their horses warm. Ellie groaned. She didn't need any rumors that she and Matt were a couple. Logan thought they were in a good place, a place they could start telling people they were dating. Ellie wasn't ready for that. Logan was, well, he wasn't a weakling, he'd held up under more hardships than most people. She just didn't want to put him through the trial of her mother's wrath. Speaking of mom. Mom was not fifteen feet away, beaming like a Christmas tree. Ellie stifled a groan. I don't mind waiting. Matt smiled. Thanks anyway. He touched his fingers to his hat brim and winked. Let me know if you change your mind. Not going to happen. She smiled and waved goodbye. There might be some awkwardness if they bumped into one another at the snack shack, but overall, their friendship would survive. Mom cantered to her side, looking all too eager. No doubt she had visions of uniting the first families of rodeo in a backyard wedding with Zinger and homecoming in attendance. So, she prodded. He asked you out, didn't he? So, nothing. I've got a turkey sandwich in the trailer calling my name. Mom's lips became a solid line. Eleanor Dumont, what has gotten into you? Matt is a great guy. He is. Tara trotted by, a broad grin on her face. Ellie had completely missed watching Tara's run. Shoot. He's just not the guy for me. Ellie turned Zinger toward the open gates. His ears turned forward, and he crow-hopped twice. He hated going through the gate. Always had. She adjusted her grip on the leather and wiggled her behind deeper into the saddle. The announcer called her name. She spurred Zinger forward, all the time trying to figure out what the look on her mom's face meant. Once through the gate, Jasper took off like a shot, careening around the first barrel with too much speed, clipping it with his flank. Ellie didn't turn to see if the barrel went down, she was already focused on the second one. Jasper huffed with exertion. They cleared that with no trouble, and she kicked hard to get Jasper to pick it up on the third turn. Holding tight to the horn and pushing the reins up his neck to give him all the space in the world to run hard, her legs flapping like bird wings, she crossed the timeline and gasped for air. Zinger sidestepped, letting the adrenaline in his blood overrule his good training. Dad grabbed the bridle, and the horse settled immediately. 
You hit the first barrel. Did it go down? She flipped in the saddle to look at the arena. The crew was already running back out. It teetered. You got lucky. Where was your head coming in? She patted Zinger's neck. All over. I'll say, snapped Mom. Ellie bit her tongue. This wasn't the last she'd hear about turning down Matt Fargo. She could take the razzying about Matt because she didn't love Matt. One day. One day Mom would recognize what a great guy Logan was on his own and not the spawn of her mortal enemy. Then, then she would tell her family. Until then, she'd do all she could to avoid a full-on family feud. Everything except stop seeing Logan. She wasn't going to let her family come between them. If Mom forced her hand? Ellie gulped. She'd choose Logan. She would always choose Logan. Chapter 15 Dr. Robert Canton Every muscle in Robert's body including several he hadn't known existed hurt. Most disconcerting were his hands. The joints hurt from hooking his fingers under the twine to lift the heavy bales. They had to weigh at least 40 pounds each, and all that torque was absorbed by his fingers. And Olivia's. Not seeing the scars and slight deformity of her left hand before this morning was a testament to how self-absorbed he'd been when he arrived. Now, all he could think about was how she must be in so much more pain than he was, and she was still going. Walking alongside the paint-splattered truck, she would lift the bale and bucket with her knee to get it on the back of the trailer. Robert would take it from there, doing his best to stack as Olivia directed. Bonnie and Jax were in the cab of the truck. Jax was sitting on her lap, driving, while Bonnie kept an eye on everything from Olivia to the next bale and back again. Before today, Robert had considered himself in decent shape. He cycled with a guy from the practice a couple times a week and lifted with another on the days off. His stomach wasn't a washboard, but it was flat, and he'd always been able to do the physical things around the house that needed doing. None of his workouts had prepared him for this. This went beyond pain and ended at mental and physical numbness. Olivia hopped on the trailer and smacked the side twice, signaling that they were done with this load. Robert scanned the field and wondered how in the world they would finish. From here to the bottom of the mountain were rows and rows of bales. They'd only done the edges, and the bales that were under trees gave them much appreciated shade for part of the day. He sank onto a bale as Jax cranked the wheel, turning the truck toward the hay shelter behind the barn. Once Olivia explained the process, they fell into a silent rhythm. Robert had wanted to ask her about her hand. Had wanted to know how scars like that were made. He racked his brain with an appropriate way to pry into Olivia's life for the first little while. But not long into their job, he had to focus his thoughts on the work in order to keep up with her, and he put his questions aside. Bonnie pulled to a stop and the parking brake whined. Jack scampered out of the cab. I could use some of that energy muttered Robert. The kid climbed up the existing stack of hay like a monkey. Robert eyed the stack, admiring the straight lines and columns. His work wasn't that perfect. If you'll throw them down, I'll stack. Olivia hopped off the trailer and looked up at him expectantly. K. Just a minute. He was telling his legs to stand. Telling them and telling them and they weren't listening. Olivia nodded and headed over to the goat pen. She opened a plastic garbage can and pulled out a scoop of pellets, which she dropped in the feeder. Jax was by her side in a blink. Can I try? Olivia smiled. Sure. Here. She scooped a handful of the feed into Jax's palms and had him put his hand out. A small black goat stuck his chin in Jax's palm and covered his hand in saliva as he ate. Jax tipped his head back and laughed as if the joyful sound couldn't get out fast enough. That moment right there made every muscle ache he'd gained today worth it. He'd get up and do it again tomorrow to see that look on his son's face. Robert turned at the sound of a door hinge and watched Bonnie slide out of the driver's side. She moved easily no signs of arthritis or joint pain. She was the picture of youth. Despite the genes they shared, Robert felt like a 60-year-old and could only imagine that tomorrow he'd feel 70. Bonnie worked her hands into a pair of gloves. Feeling like he wasn't pulling his weight, Robert got to his feet and held up a hand. We can get this he said. Sometime during the long day, he and Olivia had become a wee partnership in this overwhelming endeavor. Bonnie winked. These aren't for hauling hay, they're for driving the beast. Oh was all he could think to say. She climbed up into this strange-looking contraption and turned the key. Robert watched as it lumbered into the field, sucking up bales and stacking them perfectly. Like the ones in the shelter that he'd admired. What the heck? Are you kidding me? He bounded off the trailer, heading toward the goats. Why did I break my back if you had a tractor that could move all this? He waved his hands indicating the trailer full of hay. Olivia handed the bucket of feed to Jax. Keep going, they're hungry. She smiled at him and he smiled back. 
Brushing past Robert, she left a sheet of ice on his shoulder. The stacker is too big to get under the trees, and it's hard to maneuver in the corners. She hopped up on the trailer and kicked a bale to the ground. If you're so worn out, go on inside. I can finish up out here. She kicked another bale, and it tumbled down the pile, landing next to the first. His eyes darted to her left hand and then back up again. If she could handle the pain, so could he. I'll stack. He yanked the first bale off the ground, his shoulders protesting loudly. He told them to shut up and kept moving. He promised his body a full night's sleep if he made it that long. Chapter 16 Olivia Dumont Olivia dropped the last bale from the trailer on top of the stack, sending hay leaves and dust into the air. Sweat dripped down her back and gathered in all her nooks and crannies. Even her hair was damp from the effort of bucking hay bale after hay bale. There were probably hay leaves sprinkled over her French braid, stuck in place until she could lather and rinse them free. A slap of her gloves against her jeans raised a small dust cloud. That was all she could do to freshen up until later tonight. The leaves that had fallen down her shirt and itched something fierce would have to stay there until the work was done. Robert grunted as he climbed down the stack. For a city slicker, he'd done all right today, matching her bale for bale. Either she was getting soft, or he was stronger than she'd given him credit for. Man, he had a way of getting under her skin that just made her want to, ugh. Even though he was a novice at all things country, he was condescending. She'd seen his eyes go to her hand when she explained what they were going to do. She thought he was different in that respect. But just like every other person on this ranch, save Bonnie, he thought he could save her from herself. If her hand wasn't screaming for one of those big pain pills, she would have told him to stuff it. Maybe she did need saving, but she wasn't about to take advice from a guy who didn't recognize a haystacker when he saw one. Robert reached the ground, and she averted her gaze so he wouldn't know she had been watching him. Shielding her eyes against the sun, she surveyed the view. From atop the haystack, she could see for miles across the valley, all the way up to the main road and to the top of the old silver mine to the south. She was on top of her world. The loud chug-chug of the stacker drew the attention of every animal and person in the barnyard. The horse's ears twitched, their eyes wide. The chickens squawked and raced up the gangplank into their roosts. Even Mr. Can, Can could hear this machine coming, and he scooted backwards until his rump butted up against the fence. Bonnie opened the door, and Jax scampered out to stand by his dad. Olivia plopped her backside on the top bale and watched Jax watch the stacker dump five rows of bales into the hay shelter slick as you please. His little feet moved this way and that, and his mouth ran faster than a pony on the prairie. In contrast, Robert's movements were slow, no, brooding. Yeah, he had this whole mysterious stranger thing going that piqued her curiosity, but she had too much going on to try and crack through his shell. With a small grunt, she was on her feet and headed down the stack to the truck. The passenger door protested when she swung it open. She patted the seat. I know how you feel. Retrieving the water from the cooler on the floor, she guzzled half the bottle before she had to breathe. Bonnie was just getting down from the stacker, and Olivia hurried over to take her place. They'd done the hard part, and as much as Olivia wanted to soak in a warm tub, she had to finish the job. Had to prove that she was capable of carrying her load, that her hand may not be whole, but her spirit was still strong. There's Advil in the glove box, Bonnie said. She brushed off Olivia's shoulder, searching her eyes for some sign that Olivia could go on. I'm counting on it. Olivia didn't look away. Her hand hurt. That was all there was to it. Bonnie would see that pain. But nothing felt torn or broken or unworkable. As far as Olivia could tell, beneath the three layers of leather, she was in one piece. Bonnie squeezed Olivia's shoulder, the touch saying that she was proud of what Olivia had done, proud of her for wanting to do it in the first place. Come on, Jax. Let's make some sandwiches. Bonnie gathered the boy to her like a hen gathering her chick. He went right under her wing and grinned. Olivia climbed up into the cab and shut the door behind her. She found the medicine and took a double dose. 
a big pain pill would knock her out. She didn't have that luxury. Checking the time on the dashboard clock, she made a mental note of when she could take the next dose. If she'd been smart, she would have taken one before they started. Oh well, at least she knew for next time. She used her right hand for all the controls and hooked the knob on the steering wheel with her left. Daggers shot up her wrist and she cried out, pulling her hand to her chest and cradling it there. Her muscles had seized into a hooked position. Spasms bit into her flesh like pit bulls. She sucked in through her teeth, fawn language running through her head. Biting down on the sour words, Olivia counted to 10 and then 20 and then 45, using the numbers to focus on while trying to mentally relax. She opened her eyes to find Robert watching her, his brow wrinkled in concern, his broad shoulders tense. Olivia forced a weak grin and moved her hand away from her chest. His continued gaze pounded on her louder than the haystacker. No, wait, that was her heart thumping a wild and peculiar rhythm. Their eyes connected, and a jolt of attraction shot from her belly to her boots. Dr. Robert Canton didn't look anything like a doctor. Covered in dirt and sweat and scruff, he looked like a man, a hard-working, rough and tumble man's man. The kind that turned women's heads, could turn Olivia's head if she let him. Annoyed at herself, Olivia jerked her gaze away. An audience was the last thing Olivia needed as she struggled. Especially a medical audience. Robert could ruin everything she'd worked for today with one well-meaning but destructive comment to her mom. Lifting her chin, she changed her grip on the wheel, using the palm of her hand more than her fingers, and shifted into drive. She took the stacker out and around the arena and headed into the field, leaving Robert and any thoughts of his manliness behind. Several hours later, Olivia lifted her head off Bonnie's table as the best cook this side of Utah Lake set down a plate of slow-cooked balsamic roast and baby carrots. Had there ever been a more beautiful sight? Olivia took in a deep whiff, wishing the heavenly smell carried healing properties that could work their way into her hand, and her back, and her arms. Her back and arms were muscle pain, something that came from working hard all the livelong day. Her hand, her hand hurt clear down to the metal pins. You pushed hard today. Bonnie patted her back. I did. Olivia sipped from a tall glass of milk. You find what you were looking for? Bonnie asked, her face open with curiosity. Even though Bonnie had spent the morning on the haystacker, she didn't look any worse for wear. Her jeans were crisp, and her hair was haley free. If Olivia lived a hundred years, she'd still not have the grace Bonnie carried in her back pocket. Olivia pulled her shoulders back. She was beat up, but she was alive, and the job was done. When she paid off the medical bills, she could build her house and work her land without having to beg for help during the harvest. Her family could finally stop looking at her like a sick lamb that needed coddling. I may not be the woman that I was a year ago, but I'm not anything less. Good. But I wasn't talking about you. Bonnie busied herself stacking napkins. You pushed Robert pretty hard for a first-timer. Clumsily, Olivia ripped her roll apart and used it to scoop up some meat. It came up dripping with sauce. Her mouth watered. He needed some humbling. Still does. She shoved the bite into her mouth, the warm beef melting on her tongue. Bonnie sked. All I did was put him to work. I even gave him an out at the hay barn. Olivia finished off her roll and meat but left the carrots, because she didn't think she could hold a fork. Her right hand was sore too, a byproduct of bailing twine. It would relax overnight. She should have put three gloves on both hands. I got the hay in today, in one day. Just like Dad, George, and everyone else does when it's their turn. Bonnie put her hand on her hip. They don't have three pins in their bones. Today proved that that doesn't make a difference. Bonnie sighed. Honey, just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to. Olivia wiped her mouth with a napkin. I don't understand. I thought you were on my side. I am. 
I just don't want you killing yourself over a battle that doesn't have to be fought. You think I wasted my day? Betrayal pricked Olivia's heart. Bonnie was her champion, her confidant, her loyal friend. Her disapproval sat about as comfortable as the hay leaves under Olivia's bra. No, this fight you needed to fight. But not for your dad or George or anyone else. This one you needed to fight to prove something to yourself. Those are the right battles to pick. Bonnie swiped a wet rag across the counter. You don't need to go throwing it in their faces. It's not about the hay, not for them. It's about how scared they were when you were hurt, how much their hearts ached to see you in pain. Don't fight that love, Olivia. Olivia stared at her plate, wondering if all this time she'd had it wrong. She felt the fussing and babying as an insult. That her family thought she was less than them in some way, that she wasn't as much a part of the group because she couldn't haul hay or work a shovel. All she'd been thinking was that her family saw her as weak when in reality, they'd valued her above the ranch chores, above rodeo, even above themselves as they'd picked up her slack around the ranch and in the office. Bonnie gathered her feet underneath her. I think you owe our guest a thank you. Dinner sat heavy in Olivia's gut. If she'd read her own family wrong, it was highly likely that she'd read Dr. Robert Canton wrong, too. The image of him, all dirty and delightful, had chased her around the field all afternoon. That could be the real him. Wouldn't that be, interesting? But, Olivia really didn't want to see him. Not after the way she'd behaved. She plastered his shirt with frosting and cinnamon rolls. Not to mention the way he'd behaved, acting like a know-it-all. They didn't have complementary personalities and ended up snapping at each other like two lead Maras in the same stall. He's not the only one who needed humbling today. Bonnie pressed a tinfoil-covered plate into Olivia's good hand. And he didn't eat with Jacks tonight, so make sure he eats now. Well, that's unacceptable. A body couldn't survive long on the ranch if it didn't receive sustenance. Bonnie's balsamic roast was the best food for tired muscles. Fine, but I'm not sticking around to make small chat with him. That man says all the wrong things. Bonnie's chuckle followed Ellie out the screen door. Chapter 17 Dr. Robert Canton Jax's shower had been interesting, considering that the kid was asleep on his feet. Deciding that rinsing off was good enough, Robert allowed him to fall into bed in just his underwear and a t-shirt. He'd have no memory of showering and therefore wouldn't put up a fight in the morning when Robert insisted he repeat the process. Now, if only Robert could muster up enough energy to get himself in the shower, he was seriously considering sleeping right where he was on the couch. He wondered if he'd be able to walk tomorrow or if he'd have to borrow one of Olivia's tractors to get from the barn to the house for sustenance. He hadn't been to the store, didn't even know where one was in this small town. He could roll into the bucket and have Olivia drive him around. Not that she'd enjoy that. The woman couldn't stand to be within five feet of him. As if his thoughts had summoned her, Olivia knocked and then pushed open the door that couldn't stay shut. Seemed like a year ago that he'd broken the stupid knob when in reality it had only been that morning. Hello. She called softly. Over here. He lifted a hand, wondering if she could see in the dark because he hadn't bothered to turn on any lights. She flipped the switch and he covered his eyes. Hey. Here. She set something warm on his lap. I thought you might be hungry. I'm too tired to chew. She pulled off the tinfoil, and the most wonderful smell brought him fully awake. Steam from the carrots warmed his face. He took a bite of the roll and moaned. This melts in my mouth he said through the bread. If she already hated him, talking with his mouth full wasn't going to make a difference. Olivia smiled. Bonnie is the world's best cook. He paused mid-chew. All this time he'd gone hungry because he couldn't bring himself to cross that line where Bonnie cooked for him. His worries were unfounded and as thin as the paper on an exam room table, but they were his worries nonetheless, and he had to give them a chance to work themselves out. Time spent with Bonnie should have made him more comfortable. It didn't. Each time he saw her, all he could think about was the fact that she didn't recognize him, didn't know that he was the child she placed for adoption. As the saying went, there was an elephant in the room or barn, in this case. But he was the only one who could see it. All the hunger pains since he'd gotten here and in one bite, his worries were kicked out the door. I thought you had he stared at the plate like it had betrayed him. Olivia snorted, a sound that was most definitely feminine. When would I have had time? True. He studied her as he took another bite. She was a contradiction in some ways. 
she'd probably bucked more bales than he had today, and yet she was delicate in her movements now, graceful even. Besides, I'm not much in the kitchen. If I had made that, you wouldn't want to eat it. The bread went down his throat as scratchy hay. Another worry thought popped in his head. He hadn't wanted to take anything from Bonnie while he was here. His birth parents and upbringing had been her gift to him a chance to start his life out in a better place than she could offer at the time. He didn't take that gift for granted. He didn't want anything more from her, and he didn't want to feel as though he owed her. The whole situation had become as looped as one of the random ropes that hung over the fence. The food landed in his stomach, and things suddenly seemed a little brighter. He really needed to get out of his head for a bit. Feeling as though he had been dragged behind the paint-splattered hay truck, his thoughts were reduced to eat, sleep, survive. He got off his backside and went to the kitchen drawer for a fork. Olivia threw her braid over her shoulder. Listen, I wanted to thank you for your help today. You did good. Really. Cause I'm pretty sure there's a bucket somewhere that would disagree with you on that one. She tipped her head. Maybe not so much in the barn, but in the field you did great. Don't let it go to your head or anything. She tucked her hair behind her ear, and he noticed her swollen and red hand. Without a word, he searched for a large bowl and set it in the sink to fill with cold water. The freezer had two ice cube trays, and he emptied one into the water. Here. He set the bowl on the counter and nodded towards it before taking another bite. She hesitated before plunging her hand into the icy bath. She hissed a sound that was oddly full of relief. Robert kept his eyes on his plate, watching the food disappear. He got the impression Olivia didn't want to bring attention to herself or her injury. She must really be hurting if she hadn't dumped the whole thing over his head. A few minutes later, she broke the silence. Mom keeps Epsom salts with peppermint and eucalyptus under the bathroom counter. She jerked her chin towards the bathroom. Two cups in a warm bath and you'll be able to get out of bed in the morning. I haven't taken a bath since I was five. You haven't played this hard since you were five. Played? He asked incredulously. This is your idea of a good time. The words came out almost flirty, and he wondered where the tone had come from. Even before he was married, he hadn't flirted much. She laughed. He watched her, mesmerized by the transition in her face. I wouldn't call it a good time, but I'd call it a good day's work. She wrapped her right arm around the bowl and lifted it off the counter, keeping her left in the water. I'll bring this back tomorrow. Let me guess, we'll be hauling hay. Nope. She smiled. The hay's done. I have something special in mind for tomorrow if the weather holds. It smells like rain. She left, not bothering to shut the door behind her, because, well, that was not going to happen. Now that he had some food in his belly, Robert decided he had enough energy to take a bath. He propped a chair in front of the door, still not used to the idea of leaving doors unlocked, and went to find those Epsom salts, because he really wanted to be able to get out of bed tomorrow and see what Olivia had planned. Chapter 18 George Dumont A warm summer rain washed through the rodeo grounds early in the morning. It watered down the sand in the arena, which would keep the dust down, but the day would get muggy as the temperature rose. A Utah man wasn't used to moisture in the air, George would rather deal with the dust. The weatherman said that the storm was on a western route and would set up camp just below Utah Lake. George was glad he wasn't stuck at home in the mud. He stepped out of the live-in horse trailer, 30 feet of luxury for humans in the front and party for the animals in the back, and took in a deep breath of fresh mountain air. The smell was sweet and damp with the promise of blue skies. Three young kids, couldn't have been more than five years old, tore past him. They were dressed like little cowboys with Wrangler jeans and button-up plaid shirts. Their cowboy hats dribbled forward on their heads as they ran, and they shoved them back, impatient to get on with whatever game they were playing. A smile tickled George's lips. Levi would fit right in around here. He rubbed his wedding ring, the calluses around it a testament to the work he put into his marriage. He wanted to know that when he went home, Carol would be there. He wasn't a caveman. He didn't think she should be barefoot and pregnant with a pot of stew ready upon his arrival. What he wanted was to know that when they lay down at night, they were lying in the same bed. Heck, for now, he'd settle for the same house. And he wanted Levi to run in and jump on the bed and wake them up. Shoving his hat down, he set his jaw. He was going to get his family back, and by darn it, he had a plan. He was once the man Carol wanted, he'd do what he had to do to become the man she deserved. Pushing her never worked out, so he'd make her an offer she couldn't refuse. He'd give her the one thing that would draw her to the fair catch ranch. 
he'd give her the house. Chapter 19 Olivia Dumont As it turned out, Saturday was a wash. Literally. Rain swept into their little valley like an unexpected guest, drenching the arena and turning the dirt drive into a mudslide. After doing a few chores in the barn, Olivia gave Robert and Jax the day off. Robert looked like he could have kissed her. Not literally. His warm gaze was probably because he was walking like a hundred-year-old man with a pebble in his boot. He disappeared into the apartment and didn't reappear again until dinner. When he came to the table, he was pillow-rumpled and all sorts of gruff. The five o'clock shadow cutting across his jaw had Olivia taking second and third glances at him out of the corner of her eye. She'd thought about that scruff way too much before falling asleep. She wondered how it would feel against her cheek, her neck. She melted when a man kissed her neck, it was her Achilles heel, her ambrosia. And for some odd reason, she kept imagining Robert's lips finding their way to that sensitive spot below her ear. When the sun came up Sunday morning, she had a quick heart-to-heart -heart with the Lord about the directions her thoughts had traveled before getting into the shower and then joining everyone for Sunday pancakes. Bonnie passed out blueberry pancakes in bare feet. She wore a cheery yellow chevron-patterned apron over her maroon dress and accented the basic cut with custom jewelry and a hand-tooled leather belt. With a woman like that as her guide, Olivia dressed to the nines for Sunday services. After much internal debate, she'd chosen a bohemian, lace summer dress that hit just above her knee, a pair of tan boots with light stitching, dangle earrings, and a leather cuff with the Fair Catch Ranch logo, a Christmas gift from Bonnie. She wore her hair down in big waves. Alas, after a couple hours, her hair would be as straight as a fence line. But the way Robert had cleared his throat, several times, when she took her seat, the curls were well worth the effort. Not that she was looking for attention. But the confirmation that she still had a little aha uh -huh after getting all sweaty and working hard alongside the guy put a smile on her face. Morning. Good morning, he replied. Hi, chirped Jax. Hi. Olivia smiled at their coordinating outfits. Robert and Jax had dressed in khaki pants, with their button-up shirts open at the collar and their boots polished to a high shine. They were stinking adorable with their hair parted in straight lines on the right side and slicked into place. She could just imagine the two of them in front of the bathroom mirror, teasing and smiling. She blinked quickly when she realized she'd pictured them in front of her bathroom mirror. There was no need to go to such extremes. Robert had a life outside of the fair catch, and she'd better remember that. Robert's eyes were all over the place, as if he was having a hard time looking at her but she got the distinct impression that it wasn't because of her scars, and her cheeks flushed. Maybe she wasn't the only one who had had a heart-to-heart -heart with the Lord over their errant thoughts that morning. She ducked her chin to hide her secret smile. I'm so glad you are coming with us this morning. Bonnie set a jug of homemade maple syrup on the table alongside a platter of crispy bacon. She offered grace, and they dug in. What's the pastor like? asked Robert. He's quieter than some pastors I've known, replied Bonnie. Quieter? Bonnie wiped her lips with a napkin. If you're looking for fire and brimstone, you'll be disappointed. Olivia grinned. Like Uncle Dallas? Bonnie chuckled. That man loves a good pulpit pounding. What about you? Robert asked Olivia as he stopped Jax from drowning his pancakes with the syrup. I like him. He's thoughtful and teaches scripture. She pushed a blueberry around her plate. He can be funny, but his sense of humor is drier than an irrigation ditch in August, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss the joke. Jax reached for his orange juice, dragging his sleeves through the puddle of syrup on his plate. Robert was looking at Olivia and didn't see the sticky disaster unfolding. Pay attention. Got it. Robert winked. Olivia giggled. Robert was paying attention all right, but not to his kid. Um. Olivia reached for Jax's hands to keep him from spreading the mess. 
Only her hand didn't open up the way she told it to, and she sent a cup of juice flying, splashing all over Jax's pants and shirt. Robert jumped up to avoid getting wet. What? Jax's mouth fell open. He brushed at his front, spreading the syrup. Sorry. Olivia scrambled to her feet, her face flaming. What a klutz. Bonnie handed her a roll of paper towels and hurried back into the house for a wet washcloth. They'd had enough spills around the breakfast table that two women knew the drill. Robert frowned as he helped wipe everything up. Sorry, Olivia mumbled. Are you okay? she asked Jax. The poor kid hadn't uttered a sound. I, he looked down at his shirt. When he looked back up, crocodile tears threatened. Olivia rushed around the table and crouched in front of him. I'll wash your clothes. It's my fault, bud. I was the one who spilled. Curse her stupid, broken hand. For a few minutes there, after Robert's appreciative glances, she'd forgotten. You didn't mean to, he mumbled. No, but I'm still sorry it happened. The words hung heavy with how many things she wished had never happened. Robert put his hand on Jax's back, the only place there wasn't something sticky. The poor kid. I'm going to take him to change. I'll finish with this, and then I'll see you all at church. Olivia flicked her head to get her hair off her face and piled napkins and paper towels in the middle of the table. Why don't you head over to the barn? Robert said to Jax. You can take off your shirt and pants at the bottom of the stairs. In front of the horses? Jax asked incredulously. They won't look. Bonnie came through the screen door holding two wet rags. They're too busy eating breakfast. Jack scowled in concentration, probably trying to figure out if she was pulling his leg. Just leave your clothes there and I'll come get them, Olivia encouraged. Jax made his way down the steps, stopping once to look over his shoulder. Olivia got the impression he expected them all to be laughing at him. They weren't, she couldn't count the times she or her siblings had had to strip in the barn as kids, and not once had the horses paid them any attention. Bonnie wiped and dried the table. Robert cocked his head. You're not riding over with us? he asked Olivia. She shook her head. I'll get there early and save seats. But. Bonnie can show you the way. Olivia grabbed two plates to take inside. Bonnie took an armful of dishes and went in to load the dishwasher. Robert snagged Olivia's elbow and stopped her escape. It's just juice. He stared into her eyes, his gaze full of meaning. Olivia looked down. If only that were true, she mumbled. She thought bringing in the hay would give her her confidence back. And in a way it had. She believed she could do the work required to farm, and with some effort, she'd be able to rodeo again. But she couldn't change her appearance. Couldn't change the fact that she wasn't beautiful. From the accident on, she would be pretty except her hand. The feelings were petty and small, others had it much worse, yet they were real, and she felt them. Robert released her and she stepped away. Summer tended to empty the pews as people attended family reunions, camped the beautiful Wasatch Mountains or the desert sand dunes, and trooped off to Disneyland. Nevertheless, Bonnie dutifully introduced Robert and Jax to as many people as she could before services started. After taking a quick look around to make sure no one was watching, she finally took a moment to evaluate her hand. She'd taken a muscle relaxer before bed. They knocked her out flat, and she hadn't had time this morning to really pay attention to all the little muscles. She started by flexing the fingers. While there was stiffness and soreness, the lack of sharp, shooting pains was a blessing. Next, she curled the hand into a fist. Yes, there was less strength than before, but that would come back with time and continued physical therapy. She needed to start her exercises again, but overall, things were good. The pain was a concern. Maybe that would never go away. Maybe she would have to find a way to live with that. People did. 
Mrs. Anderson limped all day every day because of the arthritis in her hips. The pain never let up for her, and yet she continued teaching school and coming to church and being a mom. Yes, physical pain could be managed. It was the other type of pain that held her captive today. Pastor Rick made his way to the pulpit and Olivia scooted across the row so the others could fit on the pew. Robert came in first, tucking Jacks in a clean pair of jeans and a polo shirt, between him and Bonnie. Hello, dear, said Mrs. Bird, turning around from the pew in front. Olivia groaned inwardly. Mrs. Bird was fine, but Mr. Bird was a curmudgeon. She should have paid closer attention when she picked her seat. If she hadn't been so caught up in thinking about Robert and feeling bad about herself, she would have noticed who was sitting in front of them and moved accordingly. Hello. Olivia mumbled her way through the opening hymn and did her best to concentrate on the sermon with Robert's leg brushing hers. He'd shaved today. Thank goodness. She didn't think she could withstand sitting next to the rough and tumble version of him, complete with stubble. He could easily be a rogue. That zing of attraction that had burst through her yesterday threatened to erupt again. Olivia did her best to fight against the growing tide. She folded her arms and crossed her legs, leaning slightly away from Robert's warm body. But there just wasn't enough room to escape his clean, crisp, manly scent. She pulled her hair over her shoulder as a curtain between them. Jax giggled. Bonnie was teaching him to fold origami frogs, fish, and puppies, the paper barley whispering under her expert manipulations. Olivia smiled softly. She'd done the same thing during church for Olivia when she was a child. Bonnie set the frog on the hymnal and made him jump. Jax laughed right out loud. Mr. Bird turned in his seat and glared over his shoulder. Robert's ears turned bright red. Olivia put her good hand on Mr. Bird's shoulder. You doing okay? Just trying to listen to the pastor, he grouched back. Robert sat up in his seat. His embarrassment flooded their bench. Well, we can't have that. Besides enjoying having Robert's solid body next to hers, everyone should feel welcome in church. She leaned a little closer to Mr. Bird. Can you turn up your hearing aids? Olivia asked innocently. I don't wear hearing aids, he said in an indignant whisper, which earned him an elbow from Mrs. Bird. You're disrupting the meeting, Jerry. But. Hush. She elbowed him again for good measure and turned back to the pastor. Olivia leaned back to find Robert's shoulders shaking with laughter. She pressed her lips together and put her finger over them to hold in the giggles. Robert gave her knee a squeeze, which made her jump. A small squeak escaped and she coughed quickly to cover it up. They managed to keep themselves out of trouble for the rest of the meeting. When it was over, Mr. Bird gave them the stink eye on his way out. Olivia smiled wide and patted him on the shoulder again. Have a wonderful afternoon. He grumbled a cursory reply and hurried Mrs. Bird along. Their small group made their way out the double doors and onto the front porch, where they blinked in the bright Utah sun and shaded their eyes with their hands. Bonnie was called over to discuss a meeting with her book club, which left Olivia, Robert, and Jax standing together. Olivia was just about to recommend that they hightail it out of there, knowing full well that tongues could wag in this small town when they were stopped by Mrs. Lamb. Olivia, dear, you must introduce me to your special friend. Mrs. Lamb was a fifth-grade teacher in Goshen, a small town to the east, down the canyon and across the valley from Eureka. Her hair was curled to within an inch of its life, and big cheeks lifted as high as the heavens. Mrs. Lamb was a hopeless romantic who bought wedding presents before announcements came and offered her services as a matchmaker, often. Olivia wasn't at all opposed to getting married. She liked the idea very much. But she'd been focused on rodeo, and riding the circuit wasn't exactly conducive to a long-term relationship. Then there was the accident and her focus had changed, though it was no less intense. She'd be lying if she said that she'd wondered what kind of a man would want a woman with a, the word only crept in when she was alone and lonely, deformity. 
a self-induced one at that. Despite knowing that she was about to open a can of worms, Olivia couldn't put off the necessary introductions. Mrs. Lamb, this is Dr. Robert Canton and his son, Jax. It's nice to meet you, ma'am. Robert held out his hand. Doctor? She shook Robert's hand while turning to widen her eyes at Olivia as if saying well done. Wouldn't it be just wonderful to have a doctor out here? She asked no one in particular. And to have you and Olivia together, why, it's too perfect. Olivia needed to nip this in the bud. We're not. I remember when she was just a skinny little thing running around with scraped knees and cowboy boots, at church, no less. Just look at her now. Mrs. Lamb beamed as if she were responsible for Olivia's turning out. It's about time someone snatched her up. There was no snatching. Olivia sliced her right hand through the air like a machete. Dr. Canton is renting the apartment above the barn and will be leaving at the end of the month. You sound upset, dear. Mrs. Lamb took Olivia's wrist. Were you hoping he'd stay? Olivia's mouth fell open. Did she really just ask that? No. What? demanded Jax, his eyebrows pulled down and his arms folded. The kid was so quiet she'd forgotten he was there. Olivia chanced to glance at Robert, only to find his shoulders doing that same shaking thing they'd done when she asked Mr. Bird if he would turn up his hearing aid. Robert pressed his lips together, letting her know she'd get no help from that quarter. Though his mouth was firmly shut, his eyes were speaking to her. They said, let's see how you get out of this one. Olivia pulled her hand free from Mrs. Lamb and placed it on Jax's arm. I didn't mean it that way, buddy. I love having you here. You're better at chores than your dad. Olivia smirked at Robert. Robert inclined his head. This time his eyes said, touché. Jax begrudgingly unfolded his arms. I guess. They all chuckled at his concession. Thankfully, Bonnie chose that moment to rejoin their group. Mrs. Lamb, I see you've met our adopted family. Robert's face, which only moments before had been animated and full of suppressed laughter, paled. Olivia reached out to steady him and pulled back at the last second. She didn't need to fuel Mrs. Lamb's misconceptions about the two of them. I have, Mrs. Lamb pulled Bonnie into a discussion about helping a few struggling students with their math facts when school got back in session. Olivia took a step away from the two of them at the same time Robert did. Jax hung close to Bonnie's side. Bonnie reached into her purse and extracted a paper fish without breaking up the discussion. Jax's eyes lit up as he took it, wiggling the tail to make it swim through the air. Robert shook his hands out. I feel like I've been sitting too long. How about a tour of Main Street? He still didn't have his color back. Maybe a walk would do him good. The white clapboard church was set on Main Street, near the bottom. Not the bottom as an end of street, but bottom as in bottom of the hill. Eureka was a mining town, full of hills, dips, mounds, rises, drops, and slopes. Being a mining town, high in the hills, Eureka's Main Street slanted like a wedge of cheese. Olivia turned west, observing the few shops, most of them boarded up or gutted completely, and waved her arm in a grand gesture. I can do that from right here. Robert chuckled, the sound deep and resonating, a suggestion that his laughter would echo into her life. Probably, but I have a feeling you wouldn't mind a little distance. He nodded towards Mrs. Lamb. Olivia lifted her chin in consideration. We Elial, when you put it that way. Jax? Robert bent over to talk to his son. Olivia liked that he did that, that he got on the boy's level instead of talking down to him. Wanna go for a walk? Jax glanced back at Bonnie. She said I could help her make brownies after church. Without missing a beat in her conversation with Mrs. Lamb, Bonnie held out a hand for Jax to take and nodded at Robert. I can take him home. Olivia grinned. Entertaining a child, maintaining her end of a conversation, and eavesdropping. 
Bonnie was the queen of multitasking. Robert scratched the back of his neck as if this decision were a huge one and there wasn't a pan of fudge brownies at the end of saying yes. His pause gave Olivia pause. Did he not trust Bonnie? He'd only met her a few days ago, but kids were a great judge of character. If Jax was drawn to her. She nudged Robert's shoulder, hoping Bonnie didn't notice his reluctance. He'd better not hurt Bonnie's feelings. All right. Robert moved slowly down the wooden steps and then picked up speed once they hit the sidewalk. They walked past the old car repair shop with the rusted Oldsmobile that looked like Doc from Cars. One day, someone would see the treasure amidst the rust and do something about restoring the vehicle. Until then, the families who came through town looking for a history lesson would take pictures. How are the fingers? Robert asked. Olivia stiffened, tucking her hand behind her back. So that's why he wanted to get her away from everyone, so he could ask about her hand. He may have had the decency not to ask in front of Bonnie or their family friends, but that didn't mean he had a right to ask at all. Fine, she spit out. There was a moment of awkward silence between them. Olivia glared at the sidewalk, not bothering to point out the reconstructed pioneer log cabin or railroad car from a bygone era. Let him find Bartholomew Smith and ask for a tour. The guy owned half of Main Street and loved giving impromptu Wikipedia lectures on the history of their fine town and the people, including Amelia Earhart, who passed through or stayed put. My back's fine too. Thanks for asking. Robert grinned like a kid who'd put a tack on the teacher's chair. Olivia bit her lip. Sorry. She managed to laugh at herself. A small laugh, but a laugh just the same. They passed the museum, closed for Sunday observance, and moved on to the old firehouse. The brown brick was well kept, and an old fire engine waited behind the garage door. There were three rows of windows, which allowed Robert to cup his hands around his face and take a gander. By the time he dropped his hands, Olivia had gotten control of her insecurities. Robert was a doctor, but he'd been asking as a friend or fellow hay hauler. I'm a little sensitive about this. She lifted her left hand, the last two fingers curling unnaturally despite her silent command for them to straighten. No need to be. He glanced at her fingers and then met her gaze. Life happens. Yeah, just not the way we thought it would. His laugh was tainted with sarcasm. Not the way we think it should, either. A more comfortable silence laced between them. He'd lost someone he'd loved. Maybe still did. And she'd been through something transformative. They walked past several empty buildings, some red brick, one gray with white trim, others with large windows and painted, wood frames. Maybe it was because he didn't know her before the accident, but he accepted her scars as part of who she was, like they didn't make her less of a person, less of a woman, or less beautiful. Funny thing was, when she was around Robert, she kept forgetting about her troubles. Like at breakfast, She'd moved without thinking about her hand because her hand wasn't the first thing on her mind, he was. They stopped in front of the HWY6 diner, which happened to be the end of Main Street. The front door was original to the building, painted deep red with a brass kick plate. The wood around the six-foot windows had been painted navy blue. Three long-armed, white lights arched off the front of the building to light up the new sign at night. Off to the side of the main entrance was a cobblestone courtyard with a few wrought iron tables and chairs that allowed customers to enjoy the sunset while eating dinner. Is the food any good? Robert rocked back on his heels to take in the full height of the building. The kitchen has been upgraded, before the sign, thank goodness. The food's pretty good, always fresh and always served with a smile. My brother's, Olivia paused, not sure if she should call Carol George's estranged wife or separated wife or what. Finally, she just said, wife, Carol, usually works the day shift, but she'll take a weekend night if she can get the hours and a babysitter. Olivia didn't feel like pondering George's marriage at the moment. That was a ball of yarn left in the litter box if ever there was one. She nodded toward the top of the street. 
They could walk past the log cabin, and she could tell him something about Eureka's history. It's a good thing your back's feeling better, because once the crew comes home, the real work begins. Robert clutched his lower back. It's a good thing I've been broken in. She shook her head, taking a second to admire his trim figure, before pulling her eyes away. Those muscles might be ready, but I'll bet your riding ones will be singing a different tune. Riding? Yep. Tomorrow, you get a crash course on Western horsemanship. I don't like you putting the words you, horse, and crash in the same sentence. Relax, a horse will throw you off long before it'll run into anything. He rocked his head side to side. That makes me feel so much better. Come on. She tugged on his arm, surprised at the strength she found there. It's time for that tour. They made their way up Main Street, stopping in front of each building for a short introduction and to read the Eureka Historical Society's plaques. Much like meeting the people outside of church, every building and business had a personality. Olivia didn't have to think too hard to talk about Eureka's history, which was a good thing, because she had a hard time getting her feet and her heart to work together. Her heart kept wanting to race ahead so she wasn't so close to Robert, and her feet wanted to take it nice and slow to extend their time together. While all the time her head kept telling her not to even think about a future with a man who was on his way out of town. Her land was here. Her family was here. And she wasn't going to chase after another dream only to have it crushed like fingers caught in a Kubota engine. Chapter 20 Bonnie Ruggles Bonnie stood at the kitchen sink, remembering the summer Dallas built the deck. She had, once again, determined that she wasn't pregnant, and they'd had a huge fight about Dallas seeing a doctor. He adamantly refused to let someone go, poking around in his business. Bonnie gripped the counter as the anger surged through her like a set of monster menstrual cramps. Sweat gathered at her hairline and across the bridge of her nose. She swiped it away with a dishcloth, and then used the cloth to fan herself. Moments like this came every once in a while, more frequently lately. They were her fault. She should focus on the good parts of her life. Really, she was so blessed. There were people without a roof over their heads and with hardly a stitch of clothing on their backs. Who was she to complain? To get so mad she broke into a sweat. With a shake of her head, she did her best to treat the rage with an emotional ibuprofen and stuff it back down in the corner of her soul where light couldn't reach. Beyond the window, Dallas, John, George, and Porter set up the picnic tables and benches. They talked about the rodeo, who had new trailers, new horses, new trainers, like a bunch of women at a quilting bee. The back door protested and George poked his head in. We're just about set. What do you want me to take out? Spying the serving dishes on the counter, his long legs crossed the floor with ease. When he was a child, they pumped like mad to be the first to the cookie jar after school. As much as Bonnie loved the Dumont children, she'd ached for her own. Still did. Ever a stubborn fool, Dallas had refused to adopt. He'd have to answer for that one day and if there was any justice in heaven, he'd answer for each and every tear Bonnie shed longing for a child. Not that she hated her husband. For the most part, she loved him. But years with just the two of them to fill this big house had shown the best and worst of the husband and wife. Was it possible to know too much about a person? Not that Dallas knew everything about her. If Dallas knew what Bonnie had done before she met him, the mistakes she'd made. Suddenly, the thought that those tears were her justice, her penance, shamed her to the chore. Bonnie shook off the disconcerting thoughts, focusing on George's question instead. Take the potato salad and the rolls, please. I'll bring the jello salad in just a minute. She tapped the beaters against the bowl, dislodging a large dollop of whipped cream. Don't mind if I do. George held out his hand. Bonnie laughed, popped out the beaters, and handed him one to lick while she cleaned the other. 
some things never change. Thank goodness. Having done a thorough job on the beater, George dropped it in the sink, gathered the serving bowls, and headed out the back door, where the family gathered for Sunday dinners in the summer. It wasn't too long before everyone, including Robert and Jax, were settled around the tables and the food was blessed. Bonnie had a hard time sitting still. First Jax needed extra napkins, and then she'd forgotten a spoon for the potato salad. Dallas dished out steaks, an inch thick and grilled medium rare first, followed by the medium wells as they took more time on the grill. Bonnie took a second to watch him, admiring how he teased the girls as if they were his own and spoke to the boys like they were men. She took a deep breath. They were men. They'd grown up, Porter graduated high school a few weeks ago. Where had the time gone? After the majority of the food was consumed and folks leaned back from the table as if their buttons would burst, John stood. He clanked his soda can with a fork a couple of times to get everyone's attention. We had a good run in Delta. The family clanked soda cans against the tabletop. John smiled at Anna in that special way he had. At one point in her life, Bonnie envied that look. Not because she wanted John to look at her like that, she'd always considered him the big brother she never had. No, she envied that look because she wanted Dallas to look at her as if she had hung the moon. Old insecurities laced their bony fingers into her thoughts. She forced them away, now was not the time. She had a family to feed and clean up after. Anna and I have something we'd like to say. John held out his hand and helped Anna to her feet. Right. Anna smiled at them all. Porter, will you join us? For a moment, Bonnie wondered if Porter would bolt for the field. He didn't much care to be singled out in the family, worked darn hard at flying under the radar. He couldn't do that for long. There was so much life in that boy it was threatening to burst out of his seams. Man Bonnie reminded herself. Porter's not that sweet, sandy brown-haired boy who hovered near the back of his class but soared academically. He was every bit as smart as his older brother William, and that worried Bonnie. William left for school, left home, left the ranch, left the family, and hadn't looked back. His life in a glass building in Lehigh was about as far from ranch life as a man could get. Bonnie emailed him every week. Bless him, he wrote back, every week. The Fair Catch Ranch was known for its horses and rodeo, but the true talent was raising good people. John slapped Porter on the back and moved him between his parents. Anna kissed his cheek and he ducked his head. When Dallas and I bought this place, began John, we wanted to carve out a slice of heaven. We worked like dogs, day and night, and then rodeoed all weekend. We thought we had it all, and then George came along, and Olivia, and I think all of us realized that this place wouldn't be heaven if it didn't include all of you. Anna's eyes were shining as her gaze swept from one child to the next. Bonnie hugged herself. She loved all of them as if they were her own, but when it came down to it, Anna was the one they called mom. Warm, strong hands wrapped around her arms. Drawing her against his chest, Dallas lent her his silent support. She continued to smile, for all the world looking like the proudest adopted aunt this side of the Mississippi. Leaning into her husband, she felt the anger from earlier subside. It would be there tomorrow and the next day, waiting for her to open the door a crack and let it out again. She hated that door. It stood between her and Dallas, and it locked her away from many joys. Anna put her hand on Porter's arm. We know you have been, lost since graduation, but we want you to know you always have a place here. She handed him a manila envelope. Porter opened it slowly and scanned the top sheet. I don't understand, he asked. Your plot, clarified John. Next to Williams. Porter held the papers out at arm's length. His eyes were wide with fear. I thought I had to be twenty to get this. There's no rule. 
Olivia didn't take hers until she was 25. Bonnie closed her eyes. Olivia hated that she'd had to ask for it when they'd handed over George's much like they were doing tonight with Porter. Sometimes John wasn't the best at voicing his thoughts. She wished he'd think about the way his words would affect the other people in the room, or on the deck, as the case may be. Opening her eyes, she watched Robert, their guest, to see if he was uncomfortable with the situation. On the contrary, he leaned forward, his head tipped to the side as he observed their conversation. He had a bit of a troubled soul about him. That lifted when Olivia was near. Like she was an umbrella that blocked the rain in his world. Next to Robert, Jax happily chewed through a piece of cornbread layered with a half inch of butter and honey. I don't know what to say. Thank you, might be nice, grumbled George. Yeah. Porter blinked. I mean, yeah. Thank you. He hugged Anna first and then John. Anna chewed her lip, like she did when things weren't going her way. Bonnie sighed. She could have warned Anna and John that this wasn't the answer to whatever plagued Porter. Let's get cleaned up. I made peach cobbler. Dallas released her arms, and Bonnie immediately felt chilled. That man sure knew how to create heat inside her, be it from anger or desire or a tender moment. She scrubbed her face. I'm a mess. Dallas tromped down the steps to the fire pit in the back corner of the yard, where two Dutch ovens waited. I'll get the ice cream. Bonnie flipped on her heel. I'll help, called Anna. She came into the kitchen like a woman on a mission. That wasn't the response I was looking for, she said low. Bonnie shook her head, feeling free to hand out her opinion, knowing Anna would do the same if the situation were reversed. Porter doesn't need another tie to the ranch. What? Anna opened the silverware drawer and grabbed a handful of forks. He's not unsure because he doesn't feel secure here, he's unsure because he doesn't know his place in the world. Bonnie pulled hard to open the freezer. The ranch is a slice of heaven, but he can't appreciate it if he hasn't seen what's out there. He's been out. When? He went to nationals. A chaperoned high school rodeo trip does not count. Bonnie shut the freezer with her hip. You need to let him go. Go? I don't think so. Anna folded her arms. Bonnie suppressed a sigh. I went. Anna paused, staring at the Indian rug. I know what you're thinking. Anna was Bonnie's one and only friend who hadn't turned her back when she'd slipped away for seven months under suspicious reasons. They never spoke of what happened, but Bonnie suspected Anna knew the truth. Bless her, she'd never said a word of condemnation, and she'd even introduced Bonnie and Dallas. But had I not been out there, I wouldn't appreciate what I have now. Do you? Anna's head snapped up. No life is perfect, and it's unfair of me to think mine should be. Bonnie tucked a stack of paper plates under her arm and headed for the back door. Anna stalled her with a tug at her shirt sleeve. Bonnie? Yes. I'm worried about you. Me? Bonnie adjusted her grip on the ice cream handle. Sometimes I get the feeling that you're not, settled. Anna transferred the forks from one hand to the other and took the ice cream from Bonnie. If you're not happy here. Bonnie cut her off with a quick shake of her head. I'm fine. She brought her cheeks up, forcing a smile. We'd better hurry, the ice cream's melting. Anna searched her face for a moment before opening the screen door and stepping out. Bonnie stuck her foot out to stop it from swinging back on her. She swallowed hard against the lump in her throat. Who wants cobbler? asked Dallas as he climbed the steps holding the Dutch oven by two iron hooks. Smoke wafted off the top where charcoal briquettes had almost turned to dust. I do. Bonnie smiled as she made her way across the deck. And I think our guests should have the first bowls. 
Jax's eyes lit up. That sounds good. The adults laughed, and Bonnie's heartache lifted all the more. Something about this boy lightened her emotional load. He was quiet, thoughtful even. Maybe it was because he'd lost his mom, but she had a feeling his nature was on the serious side even before that, not unlike herself at that age. Careful, it's hot. She ruffled his hair as he took a paper bowl, his lips forming an O as Dallas lifted the lid and waved the steam aside to serve him a spoonful of peach cobbler. Bonnie placed a scoop of vanilla ice cream on top. What do you say? asked Robert. Thank you. Jax grinned. You're welcome, little man, replied Dallas. Bonnie studied her husband out of the corner of her eye as he watched Jax take his first bite and grin. It's good. Dallas laughed heartily. You heard him. Get on over here and get some good cobbler before the little man eats it all. Bonnie stared. They never talked about not having kids, mostly because she broke down into sticky sobs every time they tried. But Bonnie wondered if maybe the reason Dallas had held her tonight was not because he knew she was hurting, but because he was hurting, too. Chapter 21 Dr. Robert Canton Monday afternoon found Robert and Jax headed back to the barn after lunch. Robert's stomach was full, his body was tired but mending, and he'd had a wonderful Sunday with Olivia all to himself for a couple hours. He hadn't enjoyed a woman's company in some time. His wife had preferred to bring Jax along on their outings instead of leave him with a babysitter. The situation had frustrated him, but now he wondered if she sensed her time was shorter than most and just wanted to keep her loved ones as close as possible. He no longer resented the lack of intimacy. However, he'd enjoyed Olivia's undivided attention perhaps a bit too much. The woman had drive. A passion for life that had him transfixed, a situation he wasn't entirely comfortable with since he hadn't come to the Fair Catch Ranch looking for a woman. Well, that wasn't true. He'd come looking for his birth mother. He frowned. He hadn't done much about that not since Olivia got in his way. Which, if he thought about it, was a good thing. He'd been so focused on hay and then the soreness that accompanied a day of hard labor that his troubles had taken a back seat. Dad asked Jax. Yeah. Are we going to stay here forever? Something in Jax's tone made Robert's feet stop. There was a hopeful quality, a liveliness that he hadn't heard for quite some time. For a while. Why? Do you like it here? Jax kicked a pebble and nodded. Curious, Robert hunched down to Jax's level. What do you like about it? Jax looked around. There's goats and horses and cows and cats, and Miss Bonnie says that fat cat over there he grabbed Robert's chin and turned his face towards a tiger-striped cat with a protruding belly. I see it. Robert smiled. She said it's going to have kittens. That's exciting. Ah and Jax dropped his hands from Robert's chin. What? Robert encouraged with a smile. We eat good. Robert laughed. What are you, fifteen already? He tickled Jax's stomach, earning a batch of giggles. I like it here too, buddy. There was something about the crisp morning air, hay leaves to dust off his jeans, and a general sense of openness that pulled off the suffocating grief that lived in their house. Not one to get all sentimental about things, Robert hadn't put much credence in giving feelings personalities, and yet grief had moved into their home and brought baggage with it. Leaving had been the only way to escape. Can we stay? Jax prodded. Where would you go to school? Asked Robert, keeping the conversation light. There was no need to explain about rent and the month-long lease and paychecks and bills and his partner back home carrying the practice's full load. I saw a school on the drive to church. Did you? Yep. Jax hooked his thumbs into his pants pockets, much like Dallas had done during dinner. Jax had stared at the cowboy, his mouth agape, for a full minute. Like John Wayne had walked on the set of Jax's young life and offered to teach him how to cowboy up. Dad, he'd whispered. It's a real cowboy. Robert had worked hard to keep his amusement off his face. The hero worship only increased as members of the Fair Catch rodeo team filed onto the deck. Robert stood up. I'm glad you like this place, buddy, but I have a job I need to get back to. Why? because. Because it's what I do. Do you have to? They started walking again, both of them kicking rocks as they went. Rocks were something Utah would never run out of. Robert worked to form an answer that would satisfy his son. The closer they got to the barn, the louder the voices coming from inside became. Jax reached for Robert's hand. What the heck were you thinking? Bella the mail base. Robert thought it could be John Dumont. He'd only just met the man, but they'd talked on the phone several times. I did just fine, replied Olivia. At the sound of her voice, Robert pulled Jax inside the building, making sure he was behind him. 
they found father and daughter standing boot to boot. The air was thick with dust and tension. The horses had their heads over the stall doors, as if they were bystanders who couldn't look away from the action. You only get two hands, darling. If you screw that one up they don't sew on another one. John's face was red. He jerked away and began to wear a path in the concrete floor. Olivia stood with her feet slightly apart, her jaw set. In the short time he'd spent on the ranch, he'd learned one look of Olivia's and learned it well. That's the drive. I. Am. Fine. You don't have to baby me anymore. She held up her hand. See, not any more screwed up than it was before. John ground his teeth. Olivia lifted her chin. Jasper's ears laid back and then flicked forward. His nostrils flared and his breath made Olivia's hair fly over her shoulder. She didn't turn around to look at Jasper. Maybe she thought he was agreeing with her. It looked that way from where Robert stood. Robert stepped forward and two sets of brown eyes, one bright as a glowing jewel and the other dark and brooding, turned on him and Jack's. Jack stepped closer to Robert, who held up his free hand. Sorry. Bonnie sent us out here for a riding lesson. He cleared his throat. I couldn't help but overhear. John, I checked Olivia out that night. John's chin jerked back. You did what? Robert's face flooded with heat as the double meaning became clear. I checked out her hand. He cleared his throat again. She wore several sets of gloves and took every precaution. In my professional opinion, if she hasn't felt the need to take over the counter pain meds in the last 24 hours, then she is healthy enough to perform the task. He didn't tell them that he had taken a dose of Advil less than an hour ago for a set of general aches and pains that lingered. John lowered his chin. I'm grateful to you for watching out for her when she was too bullheaded to watch out for herself. Olivia's jeweled eyes stormed dark and dangerous as they turned on Robert. I should run. Anytime. Robert nodded. Jax's grip loosened. He looked down at the same time Jax looked up and they exchanged a smile. John turned on Olivia. Sounds like it worked out this time, but if I ever catch you doing something foolish like that again, I'll what? Demanded Olivia. I'll ban you from the ranch. Olivia sputtered. You can't. I can. John shifted his weight as if the words were a heavy load that caused him to stagger. Someone's got to save you from yourself he muttered before throwing a hand in the air and storming out. Olivia let out a grunt of frustration, glaring at her father's back. Her eyes fell on Robert and he had the distinct feeling that he had said everything wrong. He gave Jax's hand a reassuring squeeze. If I want your professional opinion, I'll ask for it. Otherwise, keep it to yourself. But Robert wanted to tell her that he was only trying to help. She let out another one of those strangled grunts and bumped past him. He and Jax turned to watch her walk away. They walked the same Jax observed. Robert noted the way both Dumont stomped their boots and swung their arms. He laughed. But they do. Although, upon further observance, Olivia's hips had a gentle swing that John Dumont certainly didn't possess. Anna, Olivia's mother, crossed paths with her daughter. She took one look at Olivia and gave her a wide berth. Robert chuckled again. Anna was smarter than he was. Anna's shoulder-length brown hair was tinted lighter at the ends like so many women back home were fond of doing these days. She smiled broadly at Jax as she came into the barn. You two ready for a riding lesson? Jax perked up. Sure. Anna took him down a couple stalls to a brown horse with a black tail. There was a name for that kind of horse, he'd looked up a bunch of information on horses before coming out here, but he couldn't remember the term. This is Millie Anna introduced them. She'll be a good horse for you. Robert craned his neck over the stall to find that the horse was shorter than he was. Her tail swished lazily back and forth and she had the overall attitude of boredom with heavy lids and thick eyelashes. Anna showed Jax how to brush Millie, making sure he was comfortable with the animal before moving on to teach Robert. Once they were away from Jax's little ears, Anna said, I need to apologize for my family. John's protective of his daughters and Olivia's high strung these days. Robert accepted the brush she offered and followed her into another stall. Would you let me know when her low strung days are? Not sure I've seen many of those yet. Except for yesterday. After the sermon, Olivia was relaxed and charming. He wasn't sure how he felt about being charmed. Anna smiled warmly as she brushed the horse's mane. I wouldn't suspect that you have. It's a hard lesson for youth to learn that life doesn't go the way you think it should. For some reason, her comment chaffed. Olivia wasn't some naive woman child. The same sense of protection he'd felt when watching her father lay down the law filled Robert. I suppose it's not an easy lesson for parents to learn that children have a mind of their own, either. The brush stopped mid-stroke. Anna met a mite eye over the back of another brown horse sorrel. That's what they were called. Only his had a white strip down her face, and Millie was all brown. John's doing what he thinks is best for his daughter. I wouldn't expect anything less from him Anna defended. Robert didn't back down. Even if it pushes her away. Because that's all he accomplished tonight. She's not going to stop working or trying to prove she can do it all. Anna returned the brush to a bucket just outside the stall door. 
She retrieved a blanket, which she laid across the back of the animal. You've been here two days, Dr. Canton. We've been dealing with this for over a year. Robert was instantly contrite. Forgive me, please. He straightened the blanket and turned to face Anna. As your daughter seems to despise, I am a doctor. I walk into an exam room, I ask questions, and give a diagnosis usually in 15 minutes or less. He paused, realizing he was getting dangerously close to blabbing about how his bedside manner had deteriorated since Jessica passed away. How he'd struggled to sound like a compassionate healthcare provider instead of a Wikipedia article. I must have slipped into office mode. Anna's smile was genuine. I can understand that, and I won't hold it against you. She disappeared for a moment and reappeared with a saddle in her hands and Jack's trailing behind. Saddle up, Doc. You've got a lot of learning to do if you're going to drive cattle this weekend. This weekend. Images from the old movie City Slickers filled his head. Maybe he should have refilled the ice cube tray. Robert and Jax listened as she described the different straps and cords and what they were used for, but his mind wandered back to Olivia and her fiery eyes. He had to ask Anna to repeat herself on more than one occasion. He hoped being in the saddle was easier than putting one on. Chapter 22 George Dumont George looked forward to Mondays more than any other day of the week. He figured that if the good Lord had a problem with him hoping Sunday would speed by, then he'd better help George get his family put back together. Sundays with his little family would be full of pancake breakfasts and snuggling in pajamas, or out of them if he and Carol could steal some time to themselves. He managed to get Princess out of her stall and brushed down before Robert and Jax came in from their lessons. Mom followed on foot. She grinned at George. How was it, he asked under his breath. From what he'd seen, Jax did pretty well for his first time in the saddle. A lot of kids were timid. Not Jax. He was raring to go, and his enthusiasm paid off. George wished he could say the same for Robert. The man hobbled around like he'd taken a saddle horn to a tender spot. George's plan was simple. The more he thought about it, the more he worried it was too simple. He was going to remind Carol of all the things that were right between them. The first being Levi, of course. But there were others. Like the way they worked the horses. She'd been pregnant for the first part of their marriage and couldn't ride, but when they were dating, they spent hours in the saddle, and they thrived there. They'd also spent hours just sitting together on the porch, their hands entangled. They did other things as well, but those would have to wait until they were living together again. He wasn't fool enough to jump right into that. But with time and patience and a whole lot of talking, they'd get there. He nodded once to himself, jerking on the cinch to tighten it up. Princess huffed and glared. George patted her side. Don't worry, she'll be here. He wiped his sweaty hands on his pants before moving back to Gypsy. She stomped her hoof. I know I pulled you out early, but I'm nervous. About what? asked Jax. George smiled at Jax. He'd forgotten the little guy was here. His son wasn't that quiet. If Levi was in the barn, everyone knew. George patted Princess's side. I've got a lady coming out to the ranch tonight, and I'm a little nervous. A lady? Jack screwed up his face. George laid his hand over his heart. My lady. If she's your lady, why are you nervous? Because he's in trouble with his lady, answered Anna. Oh. Jax nodded as if that made perfect sense. Let's wash up for dinner. I heard Bonnie made spaghetti. Jax eyed her. With sauce. The best sauce. Anna shot back. K, cause my dad makes spaghetti without sauce and it's gross. Their voices faded, and George found he missed the distraction. In the silence, his mind took off at a hundred thoughts per second. He walked Princess and Millie out to the hitching post, leaving Gypsy there to stew for a minute. Sometimes, she needed a reminder that she wasn't in a herd. Carol's little red car kicked up dust along the lane. It stopped just a few feet from where Mr. Cancan was mowing the foxtail weeds. Levi scrambled out of the car and into George's waiting arms. George hugged him tight. 
I missed you, buckaroo. Me too. Levi gave him an extra strong squeeze. Georgia's eyes were all over Carol as she stepped out of the car, boots first. A sly grin stole across his lips. She came to ride. That was a very good sign. Nice boots, he said as he swung Levi up into the saddle, the boy giggling. Shut up. Carol's embarrassed grin didn't allow for a mean note in her words. I felt bad seeing Princess saddled with no one to ride her. She made a straight line for Princess, holding her hands ahead of her like she couldn't get there fast enough. For her part, Princess craned her neck and sniffed Carol's back pockets. Carol swatted her away. Work first. Treats after, she told the horse, rubbing under the bridle. She could use some work, she's getting fat, George said, knowing full well how protective Carol was of the paint. He wanted to get a rise out of her. Not the kind that ended in tears and taillights, but the kind that ended in laughter and kisses. There was a difference in Carol's mood this afternoon. A lightness he hadn't seen in quite some time. Tonight was the night, he could feel it. George Ruggles. Carol dug her fists into her hips. You should know better than to say things like that about a lady. That lady almost bit my fingers off and wouldn't take a bit, George countered with a wink. Carol untied her hair from the messy bun at the back of her neck, letting the loose waves fall to her mid-back. She loved to wear it down when she rode, and he loved to watch her ride. You were probably rushing her. She met his gaze over the back of the horse and lifted an eyebrow. She needs a man with some, finesse. Her words held a double meaning that had George fumbling with the fat elastics he wrapped around Levi's boots to keep his feet in the stirrups. If Levi fell off, the elastics would break, and he'd fall free of the horse's hooves, but the kid didn't have the body control to keep his feet in at a trot, so the elastics were needed. George could use a couple for his jaw if Carol was going to look at him with that mix of spice and fire. Carol led Levi into the arena while George went back to the barn for Gypsy. He patted her neck. I've got finesse, don't I, girl? She didn't respond. What am I talking to you for? He swung himself into the saddle and turned her towards the door. No one said much during warm-ups, and he and Carol focused on Levi during the lesson. The boy ran poles several times, his movements timid. Almost as if last week's stellar performance hadn't happened. George had seen this before. A kid could ride clean at home and fall apart under the lights. Having Carol here as an audience was throwing him off. Hey, he called across the sand to Carol. Show him how it's done. He winked before he could stop himself. Carol spun Princess in two tight circles. It's been too long. It's like riding a bike. I never learned how to ride a bike. George laughed. What did you need a bike for when you had a horse? Exactly. She could have lit the overhead lights with her smile. Go, Mom, encouraged Levi. He brought Millie over to stand by George. Adjusting her seat, Carol loped to the end of the arena. hi -oh. She kicked Princess, and the two of them went flying down the right side of the poles, turning at the end. She didn't weave in and out of them, she moved as if parting water, gliding past each pole on alternating sides. Whipping around the last pole, she flew. Bring it home, yelled Levi, waving his hat in the air. George patted him on the back, his chest bursting with pride. Seeing his son cheer on his mama was an amazing feeling. His throat tightened with emotion. Carol brought the horse to a stop at their side. She leaned back in the saddle and patted Princess on the rump. Who's fat now, she challenged George. He whipped his hat off his head and held it over his heart. His throat was still thick, and his words came out softer than he'd intended. My sincerest apologies, to the both of you. She wasn't the only one who could put a double meaning in her words. Their eyes locked, and George nudged his horse forward so he was right next to Carol, his hand on her leg. 
there'd be no room for misunderstanding on this one. I'm so sorry, Carol. He didn't know what he'd done to drive her away, but he was sorry for it. More sorry than he'd been for anything in his entire life. Carol licked her lips. Princess forgives you. Just princess. She's got a bigger heart. A smile played at her lips. I sincerely doubt that. He smiled, and then the most amazing thing happened. Carol brightened. She brightened and her cheeks flushed and she tucked her hair behind her ear. George's heart warmed inside his chest. Finesse. Levi got in another two rides, showing more promise and daring now that his mama had set the example. They headed into the barn together, Levi between them. George pulled off the saddles, Carol and Levi brushed the horses, and then George put them up and tossed hay into their feeders. The whole experience moved as if orchestrated by a master maestro. Perhaps it was. He and Carol were meant to be together. This evening was like sampling a piece of Bonnie's butter cake, it only made him want more. Taking a deep breath, he remembered the need for finesse and the satisfaction that came when it was applied with skill. Carol tucked Levi into his booster in the back seat. Robert leaned in and kissed him goodnight. You be good for your mom, you hear. Okay. The request was an easy one for the kid. George wrapped him up as best he could, wishing he could hold on to him, to this moment where goodbye was still a world away, forever. I love you, buckaroo. Love you, too. Levi leaned his head back, worn out from all the fun. The best type of worn out in the world. George shut the door and leaned against it. The moment had come. We're moving the cattle to the North Forty this weekend. I think Levi is ready for the long ride. Wanna come? He had planned to be nonchalant, to toss the invitation out there as if her answer wouldn't determine the state of his heart. He failed. She folded her arms across her middle. Both of us? You bet. She turned away, studying the barn where they'd once lived. I don't think that's a good idea. His arms went straight. Why not? It sends the wrong message. What message? He wasn't trying to broadcast anything. All he wanted to do was take his wife and his son on a campout. They'd do more of what they'd done tonight. Do it together. Laugh. Smile. Be together. All the important things. Besides, having them out there was part of his plan to woo her back. That we're a family. We are a family. The hair on the back of his neck stood up like hackles on a cat. He's my son, Carol. Everyone knows that. That's my ring on your finger. It's not a secret. Heck, half the town was here when we said our vows. She twisted the ring, his gut twisting right along with it. We can't be like that, she whispered, her voice lined with pain. Every bit of him wanted to take her by the shoulders and kiss away that pain, remind her of the many things they were good at doing together. Instead, he forced himself to lean back against the car. If you don't want to come, then don't. But let me take Levi. He'll have the time of his life, and you can take all the extra shifts you want and your mom can't say a word. Carol pressed her lips together, considering. With each second that passed, George realized how much he wanted this time with Levi. Finally, she nodded. He nodded in reply, not trusting himself to speak because if he did, he'd only try to convince her to come with them. As her car disappeared down the lane, one thought kept coming to George. Carol had said that they can't be together. Not that she didn't want to, but that they can't. Can't implied there was an obstacle. Obstacles could be overcome. He knew that from seeing the hay Olivia had stacked. If his sister could lift over fifty bales of hay with two useless fingers, nothing was impossible. He smiled. There was nothing more a Dumont loved than beating the odds. Chapter 23 Ellie Dumont
Wednesday afternoon, Ellie shuffled through the pink order slips on her desk. She entered the information into the computer, her fingers flying over the keyboard. What is with the orders today? Ellie griped to Olivia, who was busy with payroll. I've got more work than hands. As soon as the words left her mouth, Ellie wished she could take them back. Before Olivia's accident, she ran the office. When she was hurt, Ellie stepped in, well, it was more of a step up. Ellie had been an office assistant before that. A position that didn't sound glamorous, but had allowed her the flexibility that came with the lack of responsibility. When she was the assistant, she hadn't had to sneak Logan into the office just to spend time with him. Thankfully, he was patient with her, in more ways than one. She prayed Olivia would also be patient with her. The workload was pressing in, and she spoke before she thought. Olivia lifted her eyebrows but didn't say anything about Ellie's comment. They continued to work in silence until the top hinge protested and the door swung open. Ellie's eyes darted that direction, hoping to see Logan. She hadn't seen him in two days and wouldn't see him until much later on when they met up at the mine that night. The separation itched inside her heart like a giant mosquito bite she couldn't reach. Hi, said Dad, coming through the door. Ellie's shoulders slumped. Hey. Hi, said Olivia, much more enthusiastically. What are you doing here? Your mom gets tired of me hanging around the house, so she gives me chores to do. He dropped a lunch sack on Olivia's desk. Right. Olivia rolled her eyes. She probably tried to get you to clean the chicken coop and you hauled tail to your truck and disappeared. Dad lowered his eyebrows. I don't haul tail. Olivia laughed as she cleared a space on her desk for lunch. You girls going to be done in time to head out to the North 40 this weekend? Of course, Olivia answered for the both of them. Dad scratched behind his ear. We need at least one more rider. George is bringing Levi and won't be able to pull a full load. I wish he'd talked Carol into coming along. He looked back and forth between the sisters. Either of you want to give her a call? Ellie slunk down in her chair, and Olivia raised both palms. No, they said in unison. Whatever happened between George and Carol was between George and Carol. Ellie didn't want to get between the two volatile lovers. Dad wrinkled his nose. Me neither. Ellie was not looking forward to twelve hours of riding away from Logan. The rodeo was hard enough, and they could still text with the occasional phone call tossed in. Up in the North 40, she'd be out of cell service almost the entire time. She'd offered to stay home and do chores, but her mom insisted they'd be fine. She even pointed out that Robert and Jax were going, so neither she nor Bonnie would have to cook if Ellie stayed home. Her arguments didn't sway so much as a weed. Dad took three steps and dropped a lunch on Ellie's desk, too. Thanks, muttered Ellie. She didn't feel like eating. She hardly slept. She was head over heels in love with Logan and couldn't tell a soul. She'd seen the tear William left in the family when he walked away from the ranch, rodeo, and the family, and she had no desire to cause that much pain to people she cared about. The hinge squeaked and Ellie lifted out of her seat at the sight of Logan's long and lean frame in the doorway. Their eyes met, and sparks filled her vision. She gripped the edge of her desk to keep from launching herself into his arms. Here's the work order for Cal Ranch. We shipped it this morning, and I thought you might like the paperwork. He dropped the goldenrod-colored carbon sheet on her desk and winked. Ellie couldn't tear her eyes off of him, the sight was a cool drink of water in her desert. She just sat there, drinking in every whisker, every line around his eyes as they crinkled with a smile, and the beautiful gray eyes that brewed a mixture of love, devotion, desire, and tenderness. It was the last one that had her heart fluttering away like a startled bird. Logan's tenderness could melt concrete. Dad cleared his throat. Breaking their connection, Logan did an about-face. Logan Labrum. Dad planted both feet. Ellie worried her bottom lip. 
I haven't seen you in a few years. When did you come back to town? Ellie tapped her foot. Logan had left town to get out from under his father's pathetic shadow. His father's failings weren't Logan's favorite topic. Of course Dad would bring up the most sensitive subject the moment he sees Logan. She glared openly at her father. About a year ago, when Dad got sick. Joe had been diagnosed with lupus, but that wasn't what was killing him. His kidneys were going, slowly and painfully shriveling up in a daily bath of alcohol. He barely functioned, and it was only a matter of time. How's your mom? asked Dad. She's doing good. She moved to St. George with her new husband, and they really like it down there. Dad scratched behind his ear again. You still writing? When I get the chance. Logan put his hand on the desk and leaned like he was enjoying the conversation. Ellie marveled at his confidence. We're moving cattle on Friday. Why don't you come along? Olivia grunted, a sound that was very much a warning. Dad ignored her. Logan's gaze danced to Ellie and back up again. Ellie bit back her grin. There was nothing on this earth she wanted more than to have Logan on the cattle drive. Mom wouldn't be there, and Dad and everyone else could get to know him. It was perfect. Logan dipped his chin. I'd enjoy that. Thanks. Ellie silently screamed with joy. Her butt might be glued to the seat, but she was dancing in her head. Dad rubbed his hands together. All righty then. We've got ourselves a cattle drive. He hurried to the door. He paused before making the hinge squeal. If you see your little brother, tell him I'm looking for him, will ya? Ellie nodded, her chin tucked. Porter had been late to work again today and then disappeared completely. He wasn't answering his cell phone. She wasn't going to rat him out. There was a code between siblings. I'll see you girls tonight for some breakaway practice with the dummy. It's a date, Ellie replied, but she wasn't looking at her dad. Logan winked once more before following the same route. Ellie could hardly contain her excitement. A whole weekend with Logan. A grin split her face, and she reached for the lunch sack. L. Olivia began. What? she asked, wondering if Olivia had seen Logan wink or felt the air crackle between them. It was all Ellie could do not to follow him out the door and throw herself into his arms. She wanted to jump out of her seat. She schooled her cheeks and infused as much innocence as possible into her expression. Olivia pressed her lips, considering Ellie. Ellie resisted the urge to squirm under her gaze. It's nothing. Never mind. Olivia turned back to her computer, her lunch untouched. Ellie did the same, wondering if Olivia was honoring the sibling code by not ratting her out to their parents about Logan. That was silly. No one knew about Logan except her and Logan. A list of tasks ran through her head. There was so much to do before Friday. Her plan to bring Logan into the family was working. Slowly, but working. For the first time, she had hoped that she and Logan would be able to be together without sneaking around. Chapter 24 George Dumont George had been on the cattle drive every year since he was seven years old. By then, he could sit a horse just as well as the hands hired to ride along. The only thing holding him back from taking their place was his size. He'd been thin as a reed right up until his nineteenth year. He had no desire to throw Levi into the fray, but having him along was better than icing on cake. Friday morning dawned bright and early, and George was out before the sun. He brushed his and Levi's horses and the two horses that would carry supplies. Ginger, a red and white speckled paint, sidestepped when he entered her stall. Her blue eyes, so light they were almost white, grew wide. Come on, girl. George held out a hand full of grain. Ginger snorted and high-stepped. George chuckled. That's not going to work on me. The horse considered him for another moment before dropping her head and tail. 
George took a step toward her, and she came right for the grain, letting him slip a rope around her neck. There now, that wasn't so bad. Now that she was caught, she would cooperate. She was a female who loved her freedom. Out in the yard, the cattle weren't the only ones anxious to get on the trail. Robert and Jax, with Mom's help, hustled and bustled around Pepper and Millie, figuring out where and how to store their gear. They had a lightweight, two-man tent that they'd share, one sleeping bag each, and a change of clothes. Robert had a medical bag of some sort that was causing a few issues. Robert's knowledge and medical supplies brought an added measure of safety, especially with Levi riding along for the first time. The more George thought about what could go wrong, the more nervous he was about taking his son. The feeling was uncomfortable and new. Carol must have felt this at some point. That was probably why she wouldn't let him go to rodeos. She knew the dangers and wanted someone who would watch out for Levi when Robert was roping. He'd been angry with her when she had said no, but he understood that decision now. The understanding made him feel closer to her, closer in a way he hadn't thought about before. His worry was quickly overshadowed with the excitement that poked at him every time he tried to stand still or sit. Olivia walked Jasper in a large circle around the doctor's crew. She scowled at Robert's profile and then pulled Jasper up so he blocked her from Robert's view. George stared up at the sky and put his palm out. What are you doing? asked Olivia. George kept his voice low enough that only the two of them and the horses would hear. I was looking for the storm. There was an icy wind, oh wait, that was just you glaring at him. He nodded towards Robert. Olivia narrowed her eyes. George hugged himself and shivered. So cold. Would it matter if he deserved it? Olivia countered. Give the guy a break, believe it or not, we're kind of dumb when it comes to you, he waved his hand toward her. Females. Porter strolled out of the house, acting like he was right on time even though everyone else had been working for an hour. George was about to say something, but Dad beat him to the punch. The sun don't revolve around you, Porter. Get your gear, the old man barked. I'm packed. Don't worry. Porter disappeared inside and reappeared a moment later with his pack. He was dressed in a t-shirt, jeans, and boots, and George would bet dollars to donuts that he hadn't packed a jacket. Though the days were sweltering, Utah summer nights in the mountains could get downright cold. He had an extra long-sleeved shirt he could loan Porter if needed. Logan was arranging some things on his tailgate. It looked like he was taking out cans of food and stuffing clothes back into a pack. All food was provided on the trip, and he must have just found out. He worked with his mouth shut and his shoulders pulled forward. He was a few years younger than George, so they never shared a schoolroom. Most of what George learned about the Labram family he'd overheard when his mom thought he was doing homework. The attempted hostile takeover, or whatever mom called the situation with Logan's dad, went down when George was in elementary school. His memories of that time were spotty at best, so he'd never heard the full story. Ellie, yelled Dallas. Take Logan in my barn and find him a horse. Ellie jerked off the fence. She'd packed early and been standing around trying not to watch Logan. Sure thing, Uncle Dallas. Dallas nodded once and went back to attaching a leather gun scabbard to his saddle. They weren't going up looking for trouble, but if trouble found them, they'd be ready. Ellie was quick to usher Logan into the barn to pick a mount. Unable to wait another minute, and out of tasks to release his energy, George took Millie's and Gypsy's reins and headed for the driveway. He'd ride all the way to Carol's mother's if he had to, but he wasn't leaving until he had Levi at his side. John and Dallas swung up onto their saddles, checking their ropes and discussing the weather. The skies should be clear and the stars amazing. George could easily picture the scene from years gone by as his dad stepped out of the house, his saddlebag over his shoulder and a lingering kiss for his wife. As a kid, George hated those kisses. They were embarrassing and mushy. As an adult, 
he could appreciate the desire to kiss your woman long and good before leaving for the night. He could especially understand the need to hold her close upon your return. His thoughts turned mushy. He checked the time on his phone and considered calling Carol. She wasn't late, ever. Punctuality was a thing for her. Unlike him. Time on a ranch wasn't controlled by a clock, it was controlled by the work that needed to be done. Sure, dinner was on the table at six, but a sick cow or a broken fence didn't know that. George ran his hand down his face. Just as he was about to call, he caught sight of Carol's little red car chugging up the lane. Levi jumped out before the vehicle had a chance to settle into the parking brake. George fought against that darn fool's smile and then just gave up completely. Levi smiled right back. Carol looked like she might throw up. I packed two of everything, just in case he gets wet or lands in a pile of crap. She twisted her lips. Thanks. George took the bag that was bigger than his and secured it behind Levi's small saddle with a bungee cord. There was plenty of room back there, and taking things out to make the bag smaller wasn't going to win him any points. Carol wiped the corner of her eye quickly. A wealth of understanding brought George's hands to her shoulders. By some miracle, she didn't pull away from him. That alone said how stressed out she was. He did his best to transfer his strength into her. When she wouldn't look at him, he hooked a finger under her chin and lifted her face. I'll take good care of him, I promise. He thought about releasing her to cross his finger over his heart, but this was the closest thing she'd come to letting him hold her in ages, and he was enjoying it all too much. He needed her arms, noting the larger muscles in her triceps that were probably from whitressing. I trust you with him. She bit her lip, and George glanced at her mouth, wanting to kiss her goodbye. Her words were like oil on the tumultuous waters they tread. Do you want to bring him by Saturday night or have me pick him up, she asked. George stopped kneading her arms and lightly ran his hands up and down her skin instead. I'm not sure when we'll be back. He could count on one time the number of nights Levi spent in the bedroom at George's house. George was almost as excited to have him sleep over as he was to camp out. He tossed Levi on Jetta. Levi had been riding Millie, but Jax was taking the old mare today. Jetta was almost as old and just as well behaved. George made short work of attaching the elastics to Jax's boots to keep his feet in the stirrups. Dad came by on his gelding. Hey there, Carol. Carol stepped out of George's reach and shaded her eyes to smile up at him. Hi, John. How's Trigger? He's getting along all right. That's good to hear. Carol put her palm against Trigger's black nose. Bonnie's planning a welcome home dinner on Sunday, you should come. George wanted to bark at his dad to leave them alone. Not only had he interrupted their moment, but the last thing Carol needed was to be thrown back into the middle of this family. They weren't bad, they were just, intense compared to the way she grew up. He was working on finesse, and his dad was charging ahead like a wild stallion. I don't know. Carol leaned into Trigger, who took her weight with nary a sigh. John pushed his hat up with one finger. I'll tell you what, you come and we'll make George stay home. Hey. George scowled up at his dad. Carol laughed and shoved George's shoulder. You don't have to do that, John. Whatever reservations she'd had were chased away by the joke. I'll be here. Can I bring anything? Check with Bonnie on your way out. I will. George stared at her open mouth before snapping his lips shut. She brushed past him, her hair tickling his arm. Give me a kiss, she told Levi. Mom, cowboys don't kiss girls, Levi complained. George touched Carol's arm. Oh yes they do, he said, low enough for just her to hear. A small gasp escaped her beautiful pink lips, letting him know she'd heard, and she remembered. Remembered the way their lips could move together in a slow cowboy tango. Before she could tell him to back off, 
he hopped into the saddle. You ready? asked Dad. George nodded, settling his reins in his left hand. What do you think, Levi? Should we get this cattle drive on the trail? Let's ride, he hollered, lifting his hat into the air. George couldn't deny the smile that painted across his cheeks. You heard the boy, called Dallas from across the way. Let's ride. He turned his horse north and took off toward the far fence. Someone had to be the one to open it. Not to be outdone, Dad was right behind him. Ellie, Porter, and Logan faded off to the left of the herd, waiting for the signal to start pushing cows. Olivia was pointing things out to Jax with Robert listening just as attentively but hanging back. He'd seen her do that several times, give instruction to Jax that Robert would also need. That way she could still teach him without having to actually talk to him. George shook his head at the cold shoulder. Poor guy. If the way he watched Olivia was any indication of his feelings for her, Robert had a long pull uphill ahead of him. George. Carol stepped to his side, her hand on his knee. He couldn't believe the amount of heat that seared his leg at her touch. Yeah, he managed in a hoarse whisper. Be careful. I won't let anything happen to him. I know. I was talking about you. You're worried about me. He didn't know why that made him feel so good, but it was like drinking a dozen vanilla sodas. I'll be praying for both of you to get home safe. She glanced down at her hand, still resting on his leg, as if she wasn't sure how it had gotten there. To him, the contact was as natural as it was electrifying. I'll take all the prayers I can get. He gave her a confident smile and spurred his horse into the fray, taking up position next to Levi, who was in the back, looking a little lost. There was so much to teach his son, and he was grateful for the chance to be a dad today, to combine his love of ranching with his love for Levi. If he could bring Carol into the circle, he'd close it off and call it perfection. It took about half an hour to get the herd over the first rise. At the top, George turned to take in the view of the ranch. He'd meant to scan the pen to make sure they hadn't left a cow behind, but the only image that impressed his mind was that of Carol standing in the middle of the field, her hair hanging over one shoulder and her hand up in a final wave. He took his hat off and waved it in the air before turning north. It wasn't the kiss he'd wanted, but it was more than he'd expected. His horse moved with ease, but his heart was back there with the woman he loved but could not hold. Chapter 25 Bonnie Ruggles The central air kicked on in the doctor's office, and Bonnie adjusted the too small and too thin wrap against the chill. With her movements, the paper beneath her backside crinkled. Her cheeks flushed. Her hands twisted in her lap. Having finished the physical exam, Dr. Adams took a moment to glance over the test results. He was about Bonnie's age, and yet he was almost bald, his skin hung on his thin frame, and there were lines through his cheeks. Do I look that old? She absently brushed her fingers over her cheeks, feeling the plumpness. Sure, a pair of crow's feet had settled in and weren't going to leave, and there was a worry line between her brows that she tried not to worry about. She could handle a few well-earned laugh lines. Your ovaries are not aging well. Dr. Adams looked over his half-moon glasses. Bonnie nodded. What does that mean? He put the pad on the counter and shook his head. To be blunt, they're shriveling up like raisins. Bonnie pressed her lips into a thin line. It's not like this is a surprise. She'd been dealing with perimenopause for several years. While the hot flashes weren't fun, most everything else she'd been able to deal with quietly. Any new mood changes. When we talked last, you were working through surges of anger. They still happen. I'm, surviving. She grimaced. How much of the discord in her marriage was due to her roller coaster hormones, and how much was legit? I'm not sure what I'm allowed to be angry at and what is chemical, she admitted with difficulty. And on top of that, 
there's this sense of general disappointment that hovers over my life. Dr. Adam's whole head wrinkled, from his nose all the way back as far as Bonnie could see. Are you thinking of harming yourself? No. Others. Just my husband, she joked, but stopped chuckling when the doctor started typing. I don't mean physically. I've. I've thought of leaving. As soon as the words were out of her mouth, she wanted to gather them up and shove them back. Sitting on her hands, she stared at her feet. Dr. Adams put aside the tablet once again. If you're having serious problems with your husband, I can suggest a counselor. Yeah, like Dallas would agree to that. I don't know if they're serious, how does a person know? Her eyes stung with hot tears. It's not uncommon, at your age, for a woman to go through a midlife process. Process, don't you mean crisis? He shook his head and removed his glasses. A crisis would be drastic. Write a note, drain the checking account, and leave town without warning. It's a frantic change. A process is slower. You feel time-sensitive pressure to make a big change in your life. Change jobs. Change husbands. Change location. But not all three at once. Bonnie nodded. She loved being at home and cooking for the ranch, even though it drained her. She couldn't imagine her life without George, Olivia, William, Ellie, and Porter. She couldn't leave them behind if she was forced. She also loved her home. She had a rose garden that the White House would envy, her kitchen was modern and perfect, and the sound of cattle lulled her to sleep at night. And then there was Dallas. She loved him, she just got so angry over the past. When he wouldn't get tested for infertility, wouldn't get medical help, and looked at her like she was crazy to suggest the problem was with him, it left scar tissue on her heart. She couldn't reveal that she knew she could get pregnant because she'd had a baby. And so the trouble persisted. Now, with her ovaries like raisins, she'd missed her chance, and it was difficult not to lay that blame at Dallas's feet. She wiped a stray tear. What's the cure? Dr. Adams gathered his tablet and stood. Don't make any major life decisions until things even out. When you feel in control, you'll have more confidence in what you want. What she heard was, stay miserable until you are sure you're miserable because you're unstable right now. She could do that. She had practice. In the meantime, try to have some fun. Take a trip. Break out of your norm. She coughed a laugh. My husband thrives on normal. Go with a friend. There are tour groups and travel clubs. Check M out online. The possibility of getting away from the ranch for longer than a day or two was next to nil. Dr. Adams was a great doctor, but he had no idea what ranch life was like. Cows and horses couldn't feed themselves. And rodeo. PFT, rodeo was the keeper of the calendar and the taskmaster. As soon as the resentful thoughts flowed through her, they were followed by contriteness. She'd known what kind of a life she would have when she chose Dallas. Her place in life was no surprise. Dr. Adams didn't understand any of that, and by the way his hand lingered on the doorknob, she understood he had a schedule to keep. Thanks. I'll look into it. Once dressed and back in her truck, the tears flowed freely. She reached behind the passenger seat for a box of tissues and proceeded to work her way through it with gusto. In all the years they'd been trying to have kids, and then the time when a child would have been a great surprise, she'd held on to a secret hope that a miracle would take place. That somehow, someway, life would find its way past Dallas's stubborn pride. Knowing that her body wasn't capable of handing out eggs anymore stripped her of that hope and left her soul in a thin gown on a cold table with the central air blasting away. No matter what Dr. Adams said, change was coming. She couldn't live like this anymore. Chapter 26 
Olivia Dumont. Olivia nudged Jasper to the right to head off a group of stubborn calves. These youngsters acted like teenagers visiting the big city for the first time in their lives. Their eyes wandered over every rock, shrub, and knoll, and they were called astray by nothing more than a breeze. She'd taken this group to get away from Robert and Jax, who were up with the more experienced section of the herd and her dad and Dallas. Dad was keeping them close, seeing as how they were less experienced riders. Ellie trotted over, her blonde braid bouncing against her back. Small pieces had fallen out to frame her face. Even out here, in the wilds of the Utah desert, Ellie was the picture of beauty. Olivia wasn't the only one that noticed. Logan spent more time looking at her sister than he did looking where he was going. Which is why Olivia had to chase down the strays, again. You weren't lying. Ellie grinned. Olivia had the distinct impression a trap had been set. About what? He is stubborn and odd. She nodded towards the front, where Robert was listening to Jax tell a story of some sort. He's oddly hot and stubbornly handsome. Ellie cackled at her own joke. Olivia glared. You are not funny. A strange feeling tapped Olivia's shoulder. She didn't like Ellie looking at Robert that way, appreciating the fine figure he cut on horseback or the way his eyes took on a roguish quality just under that brim. She didn't like it at all. He's too old for you, she scolded. But not for you. Ellie laughed loudly, the sound echoing off the canyon walls. The steers parted as she rode right through the middle of Olivia's rambunctious teens. They came back together on instinct alone. It was a good thing, because Olivia's head was not in the game. She was lost in her own thoughts. She didn't want to entertain the idea that she was attracted to Robert. Yet the thoughts came right on in and settled at the kitchen counter for a spell. The way her breath caught at the sight of him in a straw hat and a pair of good jeans had everything to do with her entire body knowing this man was an option she would enjoy exploring. Of course, that was on a purely physical level. A level where her intentions were making camp. All morning long, she'd fought against a growing awareness for the man even though she was still mad at him for jumping to her rescue last Sunday. So mad. She didn't need some doctor to tell her dad she was fine. Dad needed to learn to listen to her, to trust her again. Yes, she'd screwed up trying to fix the tractor without him when he told her to wait. That was her mistake, and she carried it and the consequences firmly on her shoulders, or in her hand, as the case may be. Yet, Robert was the one and only doctor who had ever taken her side. He'd stretched the truth for her, too. He hadn't examined her hand. He'd glanced at it, given her a bowl of ice water, and she'd been grateful at the time. Was still grateful. He hadn't babied her. And she'd gone and alienated the one ally she had. She encouraged Jasper into a trot, bringing the steers with her as she came up beside Jax. Talking to Jax was easier than even looking at Robert with all these feelings zinging around inside her. She'd been ignoring him for days and wasn't sure how to jump over that hurdle. Now that she was within four cows of him, her palms were slick with nerves. Have you had anything to drink? she asked the boy. Yep. I drank one whole cup. Olivia turned to see Robert hold up an empty water bottle. We've stopped three times for him to use the bathroom, he called over. Good. Summer's heat was not something to toy with if you wanted to be well enough to ride home the next day. Olivia? Jax asked, drawing her attention away from the way Robert's hat cut a shadow across his face. Yeah? Are we going to leave the cows out in the wild? Olivia smiled. This isn't really the wild. She made her eyes go big, exaggerating the silliness. This is protected land where they can graze for the summer and get nice and fat. What if someone steals them? See that mark, right there on the flank? She pointed to a large heifer just to Jax's right. He nodded. That's our brand. Everyone knows that these cows belong to us, and no one messes with the fair catch ranch. 
Jax's eyes roamed over Dallas and John, who weren't too far away, and the shotgun cases attached to their saddles. They looked every bit the cowboys they were. Their hats rolled low, their plaid, button-up shirts were crisp and dusty, and their boots were well-worn. Jax's gaze landed on the small holster at her side, where a .22 nestled against her hip. You're part of the ranch now too, Jax, Olivia said, hoping to allay his fears. She doubted he had much exposure to firearms, and many kids believed they'd spontaneously go off, which wasn't true. I am? His eyes grew big. Yep, helping on the cattle drive makes it official. You're a ranch hand for the Fair Catch Ranch. He tucked his chin, pride almost bursting out his front buttons. Oh. Olivia smiled as Jax's head came up. Can you help Dallas round up those steers? A few of her charges had gotten away while they talked. Hiya, he yelled, kicking Millie for all he was worth. The most Millie could muster up was a light trot, but Jax bounced as though she was flying across the range. A horse blew out his breath next to Olivia's elbow. She turned to see Robert, still looking as breathtaking as he had that morning, touch his fingers to his hat and then lope ahead, every bit the row gold west bounty hunter. She held her breath, watching him move with the horse as if he'd been born into this life. When he was far enough away that she couldn't make out the pattern on his shirt, she reached for her water, needing a long drink to cool herself off. Chapter 27 Robert Canton When Robert went looking for his birth mom, he'd found her touted as the head chef of the Fair Catch Ranch on a Rough Around the Edges website, as well as a jewelry designer and crafts expert. The ranch website was what had given him the idea of renting out an apartment for him and Jax for a month. The Fair Catch Ranch peddled itself as a working cattle ranch reminiscent of life on the open range. Robert couldn't agree with the description more. He'd seen Dallas rope a cow and drag her back to the herd using nothing more than his hands, the saddle horn, and one of the infamous DR ropes. There were no four-wheelers on the trail, no trucks kicking up dust. Cell phones didn't work out here, and no one pulled out an iPad to watch her play games after dinner. Despite doing things the way their grandfathers had done them on the cattle drive, the ranch was surprisingly modern in their approach to roughing it. They had down sleeping bags that weighed less than three pounds and two-man tents that rolled up smaller than his arm. The camp chairs, rickety as they were, were made from a synthetic material that withstood being walked over by half a dozen cows. Porter's chair had dropped from his pack shortly after leaving the ranch and been kicked and rolled over before George retrieved it for him. Jax and Levi were a couple years apart, but they gravitated toward one another while the adults set up camp. Pretty soon, they were rock hunting, getting dirty, and becoming friends. Watching the two of them sit side by side at dinner and talk with their mouths full, their hair dusty and their cheeks poking out like chipmunks, was a revelation. His boy was happy truly happy. Somehow, out here on the trail, the pain of losing his mother had eased enough to allow his light to shine through. Robert could bask in that light all day. Time for bed George announced. Oh. Levi was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, a sharp contrast to his dad, who groaned when he stood up and had a distinct shuffle to his steps. Come on, buckaroo. I brought flashlights for story time. George waved him on. Okay. Levi bounced to his feet. Robert shook his head. How on earth could he have that much energy? Muscles that weren't supposed to ever be abused had taken a beating in the saddle. Fond thoughts of Epsom salt baths and ice bags floated through his head. For all the pain medication he could have prescribed, those Epsom salts had done wonders. I'll see you in the morning. Jax nodded encouragingly to his new friend. We can ride together if you want. Yeah. Levi grinned. George said goodnight to the group, and Levi gave Olivia a hug before slipping into the tent. Porter sat across the fire from Robert. He twiddled a stick in and out of the flames, slouching low in his chair. Ellie had taken off after dinner, mumbling something about needing to take a walk. If that was code for going to the bathroom Robert wasn't going to offer to accompany her. Logan said something similar and wandered the other direction. Neither one of them had made it back, but no one seemed all that worried. Dallas and John had gone to bed right after dinner. The lines on their faces got deeper as the day went on. Robert suspected that Dallas was having a hard time breathing with all the dust in the air. He'd tied a handkerchief across his face. He'd also taken it slow and rubbed his chest a few times while they were taking care of the horses. At 50, he wouldn't be rock hunting with Jackson Levi, but he should have the stamina to maintain the slow pace they'd set. Keeping an eye on him wasn't going to be easy, but Robert couldn't ignore the signs that Dallas struggled physically today. Olivia plopped down next to Jax on their side of the fire. Her presence took his mind off the cowboys and put it on a certain cowgirl. 
She'd been checking on Jasper's water supply for the last 15 minutes. He should know, he'd been keeping tabs on her out of the corner of his eye. Did you always want to be a doctor? The night sky was a swirl of indigo, black, navy, and twilight, with so many stars sprinkled about that there were millions of subjects floating around out there. Olivia had her choice, and she'd chosen to ask him about becoming a doctor. The subject was touchy with her. Robert swatted away a mosquito. I think so. My parents were both teachers, so education was an expectation. Did you always want to be in he paused, and the silence had him tugging at his shirt collar. Sorry. I just realized I have no idea what you do. You mean besides clean stalls, haul hay, and aggravate my dad? She teased. Yeah. She opened her mouth but was interrupted by Porter. Hey Jax, wanna roast marshmallows? Jax was halfway out of his seat. Can we? Sure. Porter shrugged like warm marshmallows weren't the coolest snack Jax had ever had. Jax was eight and Jessica had passed a year ago, so the last time they roasted marshmallows was probably when he was five. Robert's schedule and their high-end lifestyle didn't allow them to rough it ever. Come to think of it, they'd roasted the marshmallows over candles at the kitchen table. Porter poked a stick into the fire, turning over the burning logs to get at the glowing coals beneath. Jax dragged his chair around the fire. Robert wasn't used to having open flames around his son, but Jax was careful, and he soon had a new spot that wasn't between Robert and Olivia. Porter reached into the backpack at his side to pull out a bag of marshmallows and a two-pronged metal stick with a wooden handle. He showed Jax how to spear a mallow and then extend the stick so it would reach over the fire. So Robert scooted his chair a couple inches closer to Olivia. You were saying. I'm a peril specialist. Her gaze dropped to her palm and she flexed her fingers. I used to run the office, but typing was difficult for a while, and Ellie took over. Now I have her old job. Do you like it? She shrugged. You know how it is expectations. Porter huffed. Oh, shush. Olivia smiled to lighten the weight of her words. It's not like anyone's tying you to a desk. Might as well be Porter replied without lifting his eyes from the mallows Jax was turning slowly over the coals. You are so picked on. Olivia picked up a tiny twig from between her feet and tossed it into the fire. Porter and Jax got into a discussion about lighting the mallows on fire to see how they tasted. Jax's face was orange from the dancing flames and he talked with Porter as if he'd known him for his whole life. That was part of the magic of the cattle drive or maybe it was Olivia's words earlier, telling Jax that he was part of the ranch now that had given him a sense of belonging. Robert felt it too. Out here, in the middle of nowhere, without his phone or a GPS, he didn't feel so lost. Olivia scooted her chair closer and their arms brushed. I'm sorry about the other day. She spoke softly so that the crackling wood would keep their conversation private. I'm sorry, too. I wanted to help. He choked on the last word, wondering if that was the wrong word to choose. Olivia was the last woman on the planet who would ask for help. She gave him a small smile. Thanks I think. I guess this means we're friends again. He bumped her shoulder. I guess she admitted, glancing quickly away. Good. He tapped his hand against his leg. After a moment of quiet, he caught her looking at him as if she were slightly amused. What? You're kind of cheesy for a guy. What? She laughed. I can't think of the last time a guy asked me if we were friends. She was warming up to giving him a hard time, her smile growing. I mean, maybe this kid Fred in the third grade all right, I get it. He reached down and tugged on her chair leg, tipping her. She managed to catch herself while laughing. Ellie stumbled into the circle of light, her hair tousled. Robert checked her over and didn't find any rips in her clothing or other signs that she'd been injured, but she was rumpled, albeit happy. Hey, where have you been? Asked Porter. Nowhere. Ellie glared at him. Uh-huh. Porter slowly bobbed his head. Oh, oh, oh. Robert looked around for Logan but didn't see him. He couldn't see much past their circle of tents. Shut up. Ellie unzipped the tent she shared with Olivia and went inside, zipping it tightly behind her. Porter and Olivia shared a knowing look. Olivia held up ten fingers and started knocking them down while mouthing the numbers. One she said at the end, and she and Porter turned their flashlights on and pointed them the opposite direction of where Ellie had come from, blinding Logan, who looked mighty guilty and pretty rumpled himself. Geez. Logan shielded his eyes. Robert looked from Logan to the zip tent and back. A sly smile tugged at his cheek and his head started bobbing like Porter's. Hi Logan. Jax waved. They clicked off the flashlights. Did you have a nice walk? Asked Olivia in a sing-song voice. It was mighty fine thank you Logan replied. I'll bet it was muttered Porter. Logan tucked his hands in his back pockets. How are the marshmallows? He asked Jax. Jax's cheek was stuffed and he had white goo around his lips. Great. Everyone chuckled. Want some? Jax held out the stick. No thanks. I'm going to get some sleep. He had one foot inside the tent when Porter spoke up. My sleeping bag's by the door. Porter leveled him with a look. 
Olivia cleared her throat to stifle her laughter. All right. Logan nodded in understanding. There'd be no more sneaking out tonight. George's tent had grown dark and quiet, Levi's snores blending in with the other sounds of the night. The rustling of the wine through the sage. Twigs napping. Branches tapping together. Robert found the dynamics between the siblings interesting. Obviously, Olivia and Porter were well aware of what was going on between Ellie and Logan, but they were only willing to let it go so far without trying to protect their sister. And Porter, being the youngest, still felt the need to watch out for Ellie's honor. Yet here he was, entertaining Jack so Robert and Olivia could talk. It all made him feel like there was a set of rules he never got because he was an only child. Porter leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. I might just sleep right here tonight. Good luck with that. Olivia swatted at a mosquito. The bugs will eat you alive. I'm not sweet enough. I'm too sweet said Jax with a marshmallow grin. Porter opened one eye and grinned. Let's go over to the water buckets and clean you off. Okay. Here, take my flashlight, buddy. Robert handed it over. He watched as one steady beam and one flickering light headed off into the darkness. He'll wear out the battery turning it on and off like that. Probably Olivia sighed contentedly, but you're not going to stop him. No, I'm not. He's having the time of his life. Robert settled in. Not just up here, on the ranch too. I'm glad. Olivia yawned. What's the deal? He motioned between Ellie and Logan's tents. Olivia's eyebrows lowered. Nothing good. My mom would blow a gasket if she knew Ellie was dating a labrum. Robert rolled his hand over, indicating she should continue. She smiled. Many years ago, in a galaxy far, far away he laughed. Star Wars. She lifted a shoulder. Seemed appropriate. Her eyes went up to the myriad of stars above them. Robert rarely had the opportunity to see this many stars. And the sky. Breathtaking. Next thing you know, you'll be telling me that Logan's dad is Darth Vader. If you ask my mother, they could be twins. She sighed. From what I understand, Joel Abram had it in for the Fair Catch Ranch from the beginning. When mom and dad finally had the money to open the rope business, Joel petitioned the city council to shut them down on the grounds that the building was metal instead of cinder block or brick. George wrinkled his brow in question. There are several metal buildings in town. Back then, there were a group of citizens who wanted to turn Eureka into a mini park city. They wanted all the buildings to maintain the mining town appearance. The city voted them down. They loved having local jobs, and the tax revenue allowed for some road repairs. She waved a hand in front of her face to get rid of the bugs. When that didn't work, he did some slick talking and started his own rope company just a few doors down. If mom bought an ad in a magazine, he bought a bigger ad. If mom had a booth at a rodeo, he set up a bigger one. After a year, he'd burned through his startup money trying to outdo us. His company folded and he lost his house. The building's used by a lumber company now. That's sad. It is. But it didn't stop there. He turned his attention to the ranch and spent the next five years claiming we were doing everything from abusing cattle to ruining the environment. He'd get protesters to line up in front of our lane when it came time to take the cattle to market so we couldn't get out of the driveway. She rubbed her lips together. To my mom's credit, she did what she could to keep it away from us kids. What made him stop? Olivia shrugged. I don't know. One day he was making our lives miserable and the next he'd given up. Robert rubbed his rough chin. Where is he now? He lives up on the far hill in his parents' old place. Logan started helping take care of him when his mom left. She rubbed her palms down her thighs. Joe isn't well. He drinks too much, and I think he's dying, but I don't know how to ask Logan. So they're more like Romeo and Juliet than Han and Leah. He tipped his head towards the tents. Let's hope not I'd like my sister to live beyond this, thank you very much. He smiled. Ah, to be young again. Come on you're not out to pass here yet. The way her face changed color, as if she'd leaned too close to the fire, had Robert's pulse doing funny things. He stayed still, wondering what he was supposed to do about something like that. Was Olivia looking for a relationship? Was she interested in him? He didn't think that was a good idea. He couldn't stay at the Fair Catch Ranch. Not with his birth mother right there. That would be dishonest. And if he told them now, his intentions would be questioned, and he wouldn't blame them one bit for wondering what was in it for him. Hadn't he come here for himself? Finally, he was able to put thoughts into words that he could share with Olivia. Most days, I feel like I've lived ten lifetimes. Nine in the past year. He paused. A man can't just expect to start over again in life or in love. What about moving forward? She asked. Her gaze dropped to her left hand sitting in her lap. You can't ever go back. She curled her fingers into a loose fist. That's not an option. He wanted to pick up her hand and loosen the fingers to examine where she'd been cut open and put back together. To feel her skin against his. How do you get hurt? She sucked in a breath, as if the words were a bucket of cold water. The tractor was making a noise. Dad went back to get some tools and I sat there, listening. 
I could hear the problem there was something stuck in the belt. It was wearing on the rubber and the longer we left it there, the more likely we'd have to replace the belt. We didn't have any and the nearest part store is half an hour away. So she pulled an air. I thought I could yank it out, real quick, and solve the problem. It was a stupid stupid thoughtless move that I've regretted every minute since. I tried to get it out and my hand was pulled through the pulleys and jammed against a draft arm, making the tractor scream. Dad came running. Her eyes glazed over. I went into shock. I remember looking at my hand and thinking that it looked like it was made from play-doh because it wasn't stiff. The bones were crushed. She nodded. They had to vacuum out the slivers. Piece together what they could. She held her hand up in the firelight, the last two fingers crinkled. The surgeon said I was lucky to still have fingers. She dropped her hand. And every doctor after that told me what I couldn't do. She stood up quickly. There's no going back. No starting over. You just have to put one foot in front of the other and move on. Robert took her trembling hand in his. He turned it over, watching the dying firelight dance across the scars, feeling the metal under the skin that allowed her to keep her fingers. He brushed his thumb over the scar just below her knuckles, wondering at the softness he found there. This woman, who roped and hauled and pushed and stacked, was as soft as a rose petal. His eyes lifted to meet her gaze, and his chest grew warm with desire. She moistened her lips. Time slowed down, the firelight dimmed, and Robert's heart pounded loudly in his ears, drowning out the sound of cattle shuffling their feet and horses snuffing the dirt for feet. He ran his thumb over the back of her hand, wondering what it would feel like to have a woman run her fingers through his hair again. Not just any woman, this woman. He couldn't bring Jessica back, there was no going back. He'd come to terms with that. To love again would require something of him that he wasn't sure he had to give. With a gentle tug, her hand slipped away, taking the moment with it. Olivia ducked into her tent without looking back. It was just as well, because when he'd looked inside himself, he didn't have the strength to love a woman like her. Loving Olivia would be all-consuming. That was the fire inside her that he'd seen earlier. Been drawn to. Now that he'd identified where the flames originated in her being, he could let it rest. Robert put his hands behind his neck and tipped his head up, watching the stars and letting his thoughts meander like a mountain stream as he waited for Jax to return. Being a father was his course, a course he'd plotted several years ago with Jessica and the Lord. The three of them had agreed, and life was good. Of course, Robert and the Lord didn't agree about taking Jessica home. They disagreed quite fervently on that point, with Robert being more fervent and the Lord being more quiet and peaceful. Of course he was peaceful. He had Jessica. Robert looked beyond the circle of firelight, taking in the bigness of the sky and the miles of land, and he realized he wasn't angry anymore. In all this open area, this vastness that was tiny compared to God's kingdom, there wasn't any room for anger. God had to get him out of his small world to show Robert that he was small so small in comparison to all this. Small, but never forgotten, because God was here. Here, there was peace. Chapter 28 Carol Dumont The steering wheel was cool against Carol's palms. A fact she was grateful for, as she'd been a hot mess all day. Whatever daring or possibly demented spirit that had possessed her to accept John's invitation to the family dinner in the first place fled at first light. The whole weekend was a jumble of emotions. One minute she felt free and lounged on the back deck with a romance novel. No less than an hour later, she was tied up in knots of worry that there'd been an accident, and either Jax or George needed her. George needing her? The thought was hilarious. George didn't need her for more than a warm body at night. Nope, all George needed was a good horse and enough money to put in at a rodeo. She had to remind herself of those hard days whenever he touched her. His skin against her skin could make her forget her hair color. Anna was giving Millie a shower when Carol pulled into the ranch. The crew must have gotten back a while ago if it was time to wash off the trail dust. Anna gave a soapy wave and an easy smile. Carol retrieved the casserole dish filled with strawberry jello salad from the passenger seat. Hi, Anna called. Hi. Carol took a few steps in that direction and then stopped just outside the spray of water off Millie's back. Everyone make it back okay? Anna allowed the cool water to flow freely over Millie's back. The horse cocked a hip and her nose lowered. Carol laughed. She'd forgotten how much Millie enjoyed her baths. Her hip bones were cutting a sharp angle, showing the horse's age in the lack of muscle. Princess's hips were plump. Millie would get a dose of butte before being put away. They drifted in about midnight last night. Levi was a real trooper. He refused to go to bed until the horses were taken care of. He's such a good boy. Who will do anything to get out of bed? The cattle drive happened twice a year. She would have let him stay up, too. Thanks. She lifted the dish. I'm going to put this in Bonnie's fridge. Sounds good. Anna went back to her task. Bonnie met Carol at the door with a warm and welcoming hug. Hi, sweet thing. 
let me put that in the fridge. Thanks, Bonnie. Carol took a seat at the bar and picked up the chopping knife. She began cutting carrots where Bonnie had left off to greet her. I've missed you, she admitted. Being in this kitchen was like coming home. The pine cabinets were freshly oiled and shone in the light coming through the window over the stainless steel sink, and the room smelled like dinner with a hint of lemon pledge. Me, too. Did you have a good break this weekend? I think so. It was strange not having Jacks around. I kept wondering why it was so quiet. Bonnie chuckled. I know that feeling. This place is a ghost town during the cattle drives. I remember. But they always come home, dirty and tired. Carol smiled. And you always have something delicious warm and ready. You're the heart of this ranch, Bonnie. You know that, right? Without you, they'd all turn into pumpkins. She finished chopping and added the carrots to the green salad. She turned to wipe off the cutting board when she realized Bonnie hadn't answered and flipped around to find tears falling down the older woman's cheeks. Oh my heck. I'm sorry, Bonnie. I didn't mean to make you cry. She set the board and the knife in the sink and quickly wiped her hands on a towel hanging on the oven door before hugging Bonnie. Bonnie sniffed. It's not you, sweet thing. I, she choked on a sob. That was the nicest thing anyone said to me in a while, and it hit me right in the heart, making me all sensitive. Oh. Carol patted her back before releasing her. Bonnie laughed at herself. Stupid hormones. I hear ya. Carol laughed too. While they put the finishing touches on the food, there was a bustle of activity on the deck. From the many family parties Carol had attended through the years, she knew John, Dallas, and George were setting up tables out there. Her heart fluttered, knowing he was just beyond that screen door. She should go out and greet him, but she wasn't sure what kind of greeting she wanted. Rubbing her forehead, she tried to pass off the desire for a kiss as a reaction to the romance novel she'd finished late last night instead of believing that she actually wanted him to kiss her. Someone began tuning a guitar. Letting her curiosity pull her close enough to the door to see who was playing, she spied Porter on one of the lounge chairs, his head bent over the strings. A quick look assured her that George wasn't anywhere near. Dumb, right? She'd driven to his ranch, and now she was trying to avoid him. When he was around, she got all confused, and her tummy did stupid flips, betrayal flips that reminded her she was still in love with her husband, still craved his arms in the middle of the night. Seeing him now, after thinking about him all weekend, would be too much. She need time to prepare herself. After checking in with Bonnie, the woman could prepare a meal like nobody's business, she headed out to the deck, where she took a seat across from Porter. He lifted his head and smiled. Hey, stranger. You're the strange one, she teased. Look at you. I remember when you got that thing, Anna made you practice in the barn, but the horses kicked you out. She laughed. He did a complicated picking that had his fingers flying. Princess is my biggest fan, he said. Olivia laughed. Princess always had good taste in men. Course she does. George and Jax climbed the back steps, their faces just scrubbed shiny. She trotted right up to me at the auction. He winked at Carol. Gosh dang he looked so good, standing there all healthy and just as full of himself as ever. Her hands gripped the seat to keep her from throwing herself into his arms. The invitation to do just that was written all over him. Levi ran to her. Mom. He planted a kiss right on her cheek. Dad says cowboys are supposed to kiss their mamas. Is that so? Anna asked as she joined the group. George swiped his hat off his head. Yes, ma'am. He pecked a kiss to his mom's cheek. It's part of the cowboy code, right, buckaroo? Right. Is keeping your room clean and picking up your dirty socks part of the code, too? Carol asked. The first part of that inquiry was directed at Levi, and the second part at George. She couldn't understand how a man with so many brains couldn't figure out how to use a hamper. Levi's eyes got wide, and his head swiveled toward George, who gave her a smoldering look like he enjoyed her goading him about being messy. As if she was flirting or something. She felt the blood drain from her face. Holy heck, I am flirting with my husband. I don't remember socks being part of the code. He winked, and suddenly her blood rushed to her face. The things he could do with a look made her so mad. Focusing on Levi, she buried her face in his neck as she squeezed him close, breathing in his clean skin and sunshine smell. Mothers should have the power to forbid their children from growing every now and again. There should be a law. A boy about a head taller than Levi bounded past them and wrapped himself around Bonnie. Did you make it? He rested his chin on her belly as he stared up at her. With her hands full of serving dishes, Bonnie couldn't return the hug. Porter hopped up and took the plates from her. Bonnie hugged the kid close. I sure did. It's on the counter. Can I go get it? Somebody had better, Bonnie encouraged him. Let's go. 
The boy pushed Bonnie toward the house. She laughed and headed back inside the house with one excited boy leading the way. Carol turned an inquisitive eye to George. That's Jax, he said as if that should be enough information to fill her in. Who's Jax? My friend, said Levi. She brushed his hair off his forehead. Seriously, no more growing up. Did he go with you on the drive? His dad is renting the apartment over the barn, Porter volunteered. Carol wasn't sure how she felt about that. The apartment above the barn had been her and George's place. It was where they poured over house plans and brought Levi home. Sure, guys had stayed there temporarily, but this was the first she'd heard of someone moving in. The rest of the family appeared, saying hello and making Carol feel welcome but not weird for being there. She'd wondered if anyone would mention how long it had been since she and Levi attended one of these get-togethers, but besides Porter's good-natured tease, nobody said a word. It was almost like she'd never left. Things were so normal that she ended up sitting next to George with a plate full of food and a strong awareness of his arm brushing hers. Gosh dang he was solid. She loved that about him. Shallow much? She shook the self-reprimand off her shoulders. What woman wouldn't love a set of strong arms to get lost in, or those talented and warm lips trailing down her neck? She used a spare paper plate to fan herself. You feeling okay? Asked George as he drowned pulled pork in Bonnie's secret sauce. Fine, she breathed. Looking for a change of subject, she settled on the newcomers at the end of the table. That's Jax's dad? Whom George responded in the positive, his mouth full. He wasn't one to hand out a serving of gossip, but she'd hoped for more than that. What's Logan Labram doing here? Last she'd heard, Labrams were banned from the fair catch, for eternity. Those were Anna's exact words. Ellie sat on Logan's right and Porter took his left. They were all talking about some club that had live music on Saturday nights. Are he and Ellie, she trailed off, letting the silence imply what she wasn't going to put into words. George frowned. Olivia hired him a few months back when they were desperate for help on the floor. He stayed on. Hasn't been any trouble. Dallas asked him to come on the drive, he's been helping with chores when Dallas is gone. He wiped the corners of his mouth with a napkin. You don't approve. They say every boy turns into his father, eventually. In his case, I hope that's an old wives' tale. Carol sputtered into her cup. In my experience, it's pretty much gospel. How many nights had she waited up for George? How many times had the ranch come before her and Levi? She jumped to her feet. Do you want another lemonade? She asked as if she hadn't almost blurted out her deepest suffering. George studied her, and she knew full well that he had heard her. Smiling sweetly, she let him know she didn't want to talk about it, not here, and maybe not ever. He got the message. No thanks. I've got plenty. With shaking hands and knocking knees, she made her way down to the buffet table, where she refilled her glass and then got one for Levi and Jax, too. Though Jax was a couple years older than her son, he was good with Levi. She liked the idea of Levi having a friend when he came to the ranch. Jax wore a leather cuff with the ranch logo around his right wrist, just like Dallas's. Apparently, that's what Bonnie had promised to make him while he was on the cattle drive. Levi had one, too, but he only wore it when he came out for lessons. By the time she'd settled her nerves enough to head back to the table, talk had turned to what type of gear they would need to host a roping clinic in the fall. She tucked her hair behind her ear, jumping right in with what about the tough calf? I hear it pops off the sled when you rope, so you can tie it too. George pulled out his phone and looked up a YouTube video. Everyone crowded around the screen to watch. Carol was sitting next to him, leaning over his shoulder a bit and drinking in his soapy, aftershave smell. Why did he have to be so alluring? He dropped one hand to her knee, all casual-like, but she could feel his attention on her. Feel it as surely as she could feel his hand on her knee. They're backordered, Anna said when the video was done. She'd been going through their website. We'll have to get on their list. That's a smart design, added Dallas. Where'd you hear about that, asked John. At the diner. Two guys from Genola came up for breakfast on Saturday. I guess someone out there had one delivered just last week. He's had it tucked in his garage, so no one's had a look-see, but they're all talking about it. George's fingers brushed her knee as she moved back. If anyone saw the contact, they didn't say anything. Carol decided to follow their lead. I think it's time for Levi and me to head out. George made to stand, I'll walk you to your car. No, Carol said a little too quickly. This will be faster. She threw away their plates while George hugged Levi. She gathered up her son and what remained of her willpower and almost ran to the car with hardly a wave goodbye. She got Levi strapped in and shut the back door. When she turned, she found George standing close. Move into our house, he all but ordered. Bristling at his tone, she almost didn't process his words. George. 
she put up a hand to stop him. When he got this way, the best thing to do was walk away and let him cool his jets. Carol, he repeated in the same warning tone she'd used. A smile tickled her lips. What? He reached for her hands and then pulled back. That was the best cattle drive that I've had in a long time, probably even ever, and it was because Levi was there. He's, he took off his hat and ran his hand through his hair. He's a lot of work. Carol laughed. You just figured that out, did you? She wondered how he'd fare with round-the-clock care of a four-year-old. She also knew that George would run himself into the ground before he'd give up on his son. Well, yeah. He ducked sheepishly. The action was adorable and sexy all at once. But it got me thinking how much you do on your own and you've done an amazing job, he hurried to add. But I can do more. This time when he reached for her hands, he didn't pull away. Carol didn't stop him, and she didn't back away. Didn't want to. Oh, how she hated this draw she felt for him. She had to stare at his neck because she didn't trust herself to look into his chocolate teddy bear eyes. Those eyes were her undoing on more than one occasion. How, she asked. Hear me out, okay? Your first reaction is going to be to say no, but hear me out and then let it sit for a minute, okay? Okay, eh? He wasn't doing a very good job of convincing her that this would be a good idea. Okay. You move into our house. She went to protest, and he clamped his palm over her mouth. You said you'd listen. She nodded. For a brief moment, she wanted to kiss his palm and see what happened. That reckless streak that had her looking for a wedding dress to cover her baby bump was still there. She scowled. Trust George to bring out the worst in her. He dropped his hand before she had a chance to do something stupid. I will move into the barn. Her heart thundered with the possibility of being closer to George. She couldn't be with him again a lopsided love wasn't a healthy one. She loved him and he loved Rodeo. But living on the same ranch in separate homes might just work. I thought Robert was above the barn? He's over Dad's, but Dallas's is still empty. K. The word popped out, and she was too stunned to take it back. But it didn't take long for the rightness of the situation to wrap her up like a Carhartt coat. Every time she drove up the lane she slowed down, and her gaze lingered on the house they'd spent countless hours designing. George had even used the rock she wanted for the front of the house instead of the brick he'd insisted was better. She wondered what other parts of the design he'd done for her. George continued as if she hadn't spoken. Think about it. There's always someone around for him to hang with if you have to leave. Bonnie's here practically all day. Bonnie's the best, she agreed. Levi would adore walking up the lane to chat with his favorite grandma. So would Carol. Her own mother was emotionally detached, and she trusted Bonnie. And if you're close, Levi can ride almost every night. She realized George was still trying to talk her into it when she'd already said yes. She clamped her hand over his mouth and said quietly, K. He took her wrist and pulled her hand down. K? K. She smiled. His face lit up. As in okay? Yes. He leaned down as if he were going to kiss her. She stepped back, bumping into the car. George sobered, but his smile stayed in place. Okay. I'll, um, I'll let my mom know that we'll be out next weekend. I'll bring the horse trailer and a few guys to help carry your stuff. She was about to tell him not to worry about the guys, their possessions consisted of clothing, one dresser, a twin bed, and Levi's toys, but having other people around would be a good way to keep distance between them. Sounds good. Can I tell Levi? He bounced in his boots. She rolled her eyes. You might as well. George practically ripped the door off the car in his haste. Hey, buckaroo, guess what? What, came the little voice. Carol pressed her hand over her throat as it started to close off. You're moving home. I am? George had him unbuckled and in his arms before Carol could stop him. I want you to help your mom all you can this week to pack up, because I am moving you into your room on the ranch on Friday. Saturday, said Carol. I've got the dinner shift Friday night. George nodded. I'm moving you out to the ranch Friday morning. Levi threw his arms around his dad's neck and hugged him tight. Are you excited? Carol asked. Levi grew serious. Are you coming? She rubbed circles on his back. I'm moving into the house, too. And I'm moving to the barn. George made a face and blew a raspberry on Levi's cheek. Levi giggled. Why can't we all live there? There's a room next to mine. Carol chewed her lip. Cause we just can't right now. George spun them around in a circle until Levi was laughing so hard his face was red. I love you, buckaroo. Love you, too, dad. Levi smiled as George tucked him back into his booster. They chatted for a second before George slammed the door. He moved towards her, looking mighty pleased with himself. This will be better, Carol, he promised. He cupped her cheeks and pressed a kiss to her forehead. 
Caught off guard, she almost fell into the familiar smell of his aftershave and soap. In a daze, she got behind the wheel and headed down the dirt lane. Like every other time she'd passed the house, she slowed down. Moving in was a good idea on so many levels, but it wasn't until George surprised her with that kiss that she realized the extent of the danger. She hadn't had time to put up her walls or wave him off, and his effect on her was as strong as it had ever been. She'd have to be as strong, no, stronger if she was going to survive living on the Fair Catch Ranch with her heart intact. Chapter 29 Olivia Dumont Tuesday afternoon was slow in the rope factory. Slow and hot, because the air conditioning was out. If it wasn't one thing. A technician was on the west side of the building taking a look, and they'd know in about 20 minutes if the unit was worth saving. Olivia had turned on a small portable fan to keep air circulating, but moving hot air was still just hot air. The fridge in the corner was running dangerously low on bottled water. We're ahead on orders if you want to make a few calls, she suggested to her mom. Anna Dumont could sell a rope to a rug. With only a few calls, she could have this place scrambling. Mom mumbled something while staring at the door. She'd been hyper-focused on work right up until the moment Ellie left early. Then she stared into space, at the computer screen, or at Ellie's desk. Mom finally jumped out of her chair. I'm going for a walk. Olivia, who was fighting off an afternoon nap, waved her on. Have fun with that. She had barely entered Jose's time card when Mom burst back in the office. Her hands waved through the air. Logan's gone. Olivia looked up. I know. He requested the day off a week ago. Mom put both hands on Olivia's desk and leaned forward. Ellie's gone, too. She spoke low, like there were a dozen employees listening in even though it was just the two of them in the office. Olivia rubbed her eye. I know. I was here when she left. She worked hard to keep her voice even and her eyes full of innocence. She wasn't about to tell her mom that all her suspicions were true. That her second daughter was sneaking around with the son of her sworn enemy. Mostly because, when put that way, it sounded ridiculous. Even if it was true. Also, Ellie had neither denied nor confirmed Olivia's deductions. The clues were piling up. So much so that mom was even figuring out the mystery. If Ellie had wanted to keep things on the DL, she shouldn't have worn her best pair of jeans and boots into the office. Nor should she have had such a huge smile on her face when she left. Mom drummed her fingers on the desk. Olivia, the factory is too slow, I think we need to let someone go. Mom. Olivia was wide awake now. You can't fire a guy for dating your daughter. Mom smacked the desk. So they are together. Olivia threw her hands in the air. Heck if I know. Then why'd you say that? Because I knew where that train of thought was going. He couldn't prove that was the reason. Mom folded her arms and settled back into her hip. This time it was Olivia who leaned over the desk. She was halfway out of her chair with the importance of what she was about to say. I'm telling you right now. If you fire Logan Labram, you put everything you've worked for, including this company and the ranch, in jeopardy. You don't understand. I understand that you've worked too hard to let Ellie ruin everything. The hard lines of parental justice that had crisscrossed mom's face softened. I can't believe that after all this time, you still don't know. Know what? Olivia demanded. My kids are worth more than all of this. Her arms spread like wings. Olivia fell back into her chair. Anna's words didn't jive with what she'd known growing up. But you left us. Every day you left us with Bonnie to build this place. Oh, honey. The only reason I dared leave you was because Bonnie is so good. But you're our mother. Olivia tried not to think of the times when she'd wanted her mom instead of Bonnie. Part of her knew, even as a kid, that if she gave voice to those feelings, she'd hurt Bonnie's feelings, and she loved Bonnie. Anna brushed dust particles off the desk. 
she needed you guys. I think, I think having you kids around saved her. Olivia had never thought of it that way. She'd always seen Bonnie as this sacrificial lamb who gave up her dreams to be at home while all the other grown-ups chased the stars. Her dad and Dallas were gone more than half the time, roping, rodeoing. Her mom was here, being the boss. Bonnie had never ventured out, never looked beyond the front gate. Olivia's thoughts were ask you, and she needed some time to sort those out, but there was one thing she did know of a shorty. Mom, if Ellie loves him, and I'm not saying she does, but if she loves Logan and you make him go away, you'll lose her. Mom narrowed her eyes in challenge. Olivia wished she could vacuum those words right back into her head. Mark my words, Olivia. No daughter of mine is going to end up with a labrum. Anna tucked her purse under her arm and marched out. Olivia watched her go, her mouth hanging open. She wondered, and not for the first time, what lengths her mom had gone to in stopping Joe Labram all those years ago. There were moments since she began working in the office when Olivia could swear Anna Dumont was stronger than the August sun and colder than a January wind. A few minutes later, Porter waltzed in with a garbage bag hanging out of his back pocket. Where was mom going all fired up? She sprayed gravel getting out of the parking lot. Olivia had no idea what mom was up to. There was a family feud brewing on the horizon. She prayed it would blow out before it hit the ranch. If she could take care of Porter's bad attitude, then that would be one less cloud in the sky. Are you just getting here? Olivia checked the clock. It was almost six. She was cranky and tired, her beliefs about her childhood were scrambled like diner eggs, and she needed to warn Ellie about mom. It was time for a sisterly chat. Porter shrugged his response. Olivia rolled her shoulders back, fighting the knots. I'm just gonna lay it out for you, little brother. Porter paused, the garbage can in one hand and an empty sack in the other. Ellie is dating Logan. She figured he knew after the cattle drive, but there it was. And mom's on the warpath. She pointed at his chest. If you're thinking of pulling some stunt, I... I don't, Porter began to defend himself. I don't care what you don't. You listen. Now that she'd started, Olivia was going to have her say with someone. You get your head on straight and stop worrying everybody all the time. You're 18. If you're going to go, then make a plan and go. If you're going to stay, then show up on time and be part of the family. Stop hanging around and looking like you want to be somewhere else all the time, all right? Porter pulled his face into a scowl. What did you step in today? Olivia marched around the desk and headed for the door. A load of crap, that's what. She slammed the door behind her and pulled her phone out of her back pocket. Time to talk some sense into her sister. The call went right to Ellie's voicemail. She sent a text, emergency 911, and got no response. Throwing her hands in the air, she stormed to the parking lot. Olivia drove straight home. Ellie wouldn't be there, but Jasper was, and she needed some time in the saddle. Something about sitting on the back of a horse gave her perspective, and she desperately needed perspective tonight. She crossed the main road and onto the gravel drive. The rougher terrain made her slow to a crawl, otherwise she'd have to clean her truck again. She passed George's place without looking at the modern, yet country design. Carol's influence was all over that, even if she didn't live there yet. Olivia wondered if Carol would really come back to the ranch. George had already started the process by clearing his things out of the house. The field next to his was Ellie's. She was far from settling down, Olivia hoped. So her lot was in hay, the wheel line spreading water that glistened in the sun. Ellie and George had gone in on the fancy sprinklers together. Across from George's place was Olivia's lot, then William's, and then Porter's. The three of them still used the sprinkler pipe. A wheel line wouldn't do much good with William's place in the middle, because William didn't want to put any money into it. He allowed Dad to farm the land and keep the crop, though. 
movement turned Olivia's attention to Porter's lot, and she slammed on the brakes. Robert was out in Porter's field, moving sprinkler pipe. He looked so sure of himself out there in the knee-high crop, so strong. He'd filled out in the last three weeks. Nothing huge, because he was fit when he'd arrived, but he'd grown a little rougher around the edges. An improvement if there ever was one. Olivia parked the truck and hopped the rail fence. Robert waved and went to pick up the next piece of pipe. Olivia met him at the new spot and guided the two sections together. Thanks. He smiled, wiping the back of his hand across his brow. You're welcome. She liked that he hadn't told her he had it or tried to push her away like George or her dad would have. Where's Jax? She was used to seeing the boy follow Robert like a shadow. He's having a writing lesson with George and Levi. Carol had to work tonight. Well, you don't need lessons. Robert grunted as they lifted the next pipe and water poured out of the end near him. He had on rubber boots that came up to his knees. Olivia had on an old, worn pair of dress boots that had seen their fair share of irrigating. You ride like you were born to it, she added. Maybe I was. Robert waited for her to line up the end before shoving it in place. She shielded her eyes so she could see him better. What? He dusted off his hands. I was adopted. Maybe my birth parents were farmers, or my ancestors were something. Really? She hadn't known anyone who was adopted before. He looked across the land. This is your plot, isn't it? Porters. So how old were you when you met your, was there a term she needed to know? Parents? Two days old, he replied. They high-stepped over the half-grown hay. I've always known, so it's not weird or anything. That's good. He glanced at her out of the corner of his eyes and smiled, like he knew she wasn't on familiar ground. I've always felt this pull to come out west. Maybe it's a part of who you are. Like with me. I swear this brown dirt and hay leaves pump through my veins. Maybe. Robert turned north, towards the homes and the barns and the arena. She was rewarded with one of the most beautiful male silhouettes in existence. His jawline was made more pronounced by the swoop of the straw hat. His thick lashes cast a dark shadow over a chiseled cheekbone. She put her hand on his arm. Are you glad you came? He turned, capturing her gaze with the intensity in his blue eyes. I'm finding things that I didn't even know I was looking for. Like what? Robert pulled off a stalk of alfalfa and twirled it between his fingers. Jax, for one. That bright, happy kid he used to be is coming back. He's in awe of all these cowboys and cowgirls, and he feels important. That's huge. Olivia's chest warmed. I know what you mean. I had friends that thought my parents were too strict, gave me too many chores, and expected too much. But you know what? I never saw it that way. To me, well, it was like I was one piece in a big machine. If I didn't do my part, all the other pieces couldn't do theirs. Robert dropped the alfalfa and hooked his thumb in his pocket. You felt needed. Needed. Wanted. Essential. All the things a kid needs to thrive. What about love? Robert's stormy blue eyes captured her gaze. Did you feel loved? Olivia was immediately caught up in Robert's intensity. The word love setting off a fountain of giddiness in her belly. Always, Olivia croaked. She coughed and cleared her throat. Bonnie was a major part of that. She dished out more hugs than cookies and was a listening ear for all the teenage drama. Robert's face clouded over. He absently wiped his hand down his cheek. I'm glad you had her. Me too. She surveyed the field. There weren't that many more pipes to move. Come on, I'll help you finish. She tromped off towards the next section. That's not necessary. 
Robert ran to catch up to her. Sure it is. If I help you now, you have to help when it's my turn with the water. Robert stopped her with a hand on her arm. That warm fountain, almost like a chocolate fountain with yummy goodness flowing right through every part of her body, kicked into high gear at his touch. I'd like that, he said. Not wanting to croak, Olivia swallowed before answering. Me, too. Chapter 30 Logan Labrum Logan pulled Ellie close, pressing a kiss to her vanilla-smelling hair as they walked out of the Desert Star Playhouse and into the dry night air. The back parking lot was full of cars, couples, and families. For a Tuesday night, the place was packed. The Desert Star was a house of parody, comedy skits, and song. Tonight's show, Men in Tights, had him and Ellie holding their sides as they laughed. Logan's heart was lighter than he'd known it to be in years. Before his parents split, there was the fighting. The dirty looks at school. Then they lost the house and had to move. The Dumonts were well-respected business owners, and his dad was a troublemaker. He'd felt good for some time in college, out from under his dad's ugly shadow. When his mom called to say Joe had liver disease and his kidneys were going out, Logan couldn't turn his back on the old man. No matter what he'd done or who he bullied, he was the only dad Logan had ever known. If only to prove that he wasn't his father's son, Logan extended mercy when he had every right to let the heavy gavel of justice land on Joe's life. And then God had given him Ellie. He knew, without a shadow of doubt, that Ellie was put in his life because he'd sacrificed everything to take care of his dad. Ellie was good and kind and smart and the most magnificent creature in creation. And she loved him. God was beautiful like that. Where did you find this place? She asked. Rob recommended it when I told him we wanted to get away from Eureka. And get away they had. The Desert Star was in Murray, well worth the 90-minute drive from home. How is Rob? He's fine. I guess his wife's going crazy because the babies do any day and they haven't put the crib together. Logan opened the driver's side of the truck and offered a hand to help Ellie in. Isn't Rob the guy who works at R.C. Wiley Home Furnishings? Yep. But he assembles furniture for a living. I think that's what's ticking her off. Ellie laughed as she scooted over to the middle, leaving just enough room for him behind the wheel. He loved it when she sat next to him in the truck, loved having her right by his side. In fact, that's all he ever wanted, and it was about time they made that happen. He shut the door, and Ellie's arms were around his neck, tugging him down for a long and slow kiss. He sighed, leaning his forehead against hers. Ellie, darling, I love you. She moved closer, pressing her lips to his neck. I love you, too. He swallowed. When she was kissing him like that, it was hard to focus on what he wanted to say. I know you do, and when two people love each other as much as we do, they should be together. She stilled, her breath warm, her fingers in his hair. What are you saying? I'm saying I want to pick you up at your house for a date instead of meeting you in Genola. I want to go to your family dinners and hold your hand at the table. Ellie, I want to love you in front of God and everybody. Ellie's hands trailed down his shoulders and stopped on his chest, her palms flush against his heart. Surely she could feel the way it pounded just to be near her. I don't want to hurt them. She lifted her soulful brown eyes. My mom hates your dad. He rubbed his hands up and down her back. I hate my dad. We'll use it as a bonding moment. She smiled. You're impossible. I know. She kissed him once, then again, but he could tell she was distracted. He'd asked a lot of her, considering the past between their families. He could give her time to consider his request, especially if she wanted to think about it while kissing. The thing was, his love for Ellie only grew with time. Like a bean sprout in a jar, it just kept growing and growing until it was pushing against the glass. If they didn't take the lid off soon, something was going to break. He didn't want that something to be him and Ellie. Ellie pulled far enough away that she could look him in the eye. 
I don't want to hurt my family, but I don't want to hurt you more. If this is what you want, then let's do it. His hand stilled. Is it what you want? She ever so slowly traced her fingers over his collarbone. I want you. If there's ever a time to bring you home, it's this week. Mom and Dad are over the moon with Carol and Levi moving into George's place. Isn't it her place too? Actually, it's just her place. George is moving into Dallas's barn. Oh! All of Eureka knew about the couple's hasty marriage and subsequent separation. Carol taking a job at the diner had added to the gossip train. People wondered if George refused to pay child support or refused a divorce so he wouldn't have to pay. Ridiculous. All of it. George was a good man doing the best he could. Ellie grew thoughtful. You should come over tomorrow night for dinner. You come over. He tugged at her waist. She flipped her blonde hair over her shoulder and pressed herself against him as best she could with the steering wheel in the way. They kissed until headlights filled the cab and the car parked in front of them honked. Laughing that they'd been caught, they put on their seatbelts and turned up the radio for the hour-long ride back to Ellie's car parked at the Genola City building. As much as Logan loved having her sit alongside him in the truck, he was looking forward to being able to kiss her goodnight on her very own front porch. Chapter 31 Olivia Dumont Olivia muted the television so she could listen for the sound of Ellie's footsteps on the concrete stairs leading to their basement apartment. She thought she'd heard tires crunch the gravel drive. Sure enough, a truck door slammed and Ellie trotted down the steps. Olivia turned the sound back on and let the Hallmark movie continue. Their DVR was chock full of nothing but sweet romances and rodeos. Not that either of them had much time to watch television, but having a selection of shows to pick from was a blessing on a night when Olivia stayed up to talk to her sister. She'd brought in the tide quilt off her bed and a stack of pillows to be comfortable. She was in the mood for a good romance thanks to Robert. Just like the cowboy in the movie, Robert starred in her daydreams all the livelong day. If she was going to diagnose herself, she'd have to say that she was definitely smitten. Which was ironic, because she did her best to avoid doctors since the accident and now she was thinking about one approximately every four minutes. Ellie breezed through the door, but stopped when she saw Olivia was on the couch. Good movie? she asked. Yeah, Olivia replied. Wanna watch? Ellie ran her hand through her hair. Didn't you braid your hair this morning? Ellie froze as if she'd been caught in a flashlight beam. I wanted big waves. Olivia narrowed her eyes. You usually do four braids for waves. I was trying something new. Olivia clicked off the television. She was done tiptoeing around the obvious. Look, I know you're dating Logan, okay? Ellie rushed forward and grabbed onto the back of the couch. How? she demanded. We've been so careful not to be obvious. Olivia tipped her head and gave her an are you kidding me look. Porter figured it out, too. Ellie threw one leg over the back of the couch, rotated and kicked the other one over as she landed on her backside next to Olivia. Great. If Porter knows, we're doomed. What are you thinking? dating Logan Labram. Ellie chewed her lip. He's sweet. So are strawberries, but you know they'll give you a rash. Ellie smacked her leg. It's not like that at all. Logan is good for me. He's the most kind-hearted person on the planet. Logan is most definitely not good for you. If mom and dad knew. What? Ellie asked defiantly. What could they do about it? It's not what they could do, it's what they would do. Olivia plucked at the ties on the blanket. They hired him, Ellie said hopefully. He was the only applicant. It's not like there are a lot of people in Eureka who can run a rope factory. Olivia thought back to Logan's interview. Mom had come to visit her at the hospital that night. She'd had to drink three Dr. Peppers to get through the story of how she'd interviewed and then hired Logan Labram. 
their previous manager had been in an ATV accident. They'd all worked to cover for him, hoping he'd pull through, but he didn't make it. They limped along, but then Olivia had her accident and they were down two people. They were at the end of their rope, no pun intended, and needed someone who could start right away. Mom had called Logan a few choice names, not to his face, and then called to let him know he had the job. With Olivia out of the office and Mom seeing to her recovery, that left Ellie to train Logan. Ellie stood up quickly. I'm going to bed. Wait. Olivia reached for Ellie with her left hand and missed terribly. She brushed off the annoyance at herself. Don't do anything dumb, okay? Like what? Ellie demanded. Like fall in love with him. Ellie turned her head away. I already have. Olivia muttered a word better left in the barn. Ellie, have you lost your mind? Ellie lifted her chin. Good night, Olivia. She stormed off to her bedroom and shut the door. They didn't slam them down here, no matter how angry they were, because Bonnie and Dallas slept above them. Olivia flopped back onto the pillows and tucked her blanket up under her chin. Her sister was an idiot, but Olivia couldn't deny the note of truth in her voice. She really did love Logan. Heaven help them all if their parents ever found out. Chapter 32 Ellie Dumont Wednesday night was set aside for a family dinner, and Ellie and Logan planned to announce their relationship before eating. The cattle drive had been good. Dad had relaxed around Logan, treating him like anybody else. Dallas loved the guy, couldn't say enough good things about him. Tonight was their best bet, because the next few days would be filled with preparations for the Western Stampede in West Jordan. The rodeo started Saturday morning and ran through Monday. Ellie and her mom had drawn slots during the evening instead of Saturday morning slack. Ellie had spent most of the day trying to sort out a shipment that went to Oklahoma instead of Omaha. The supply store in Omaha wasn't happy, and she'd had to offer a discount to make up for the delay. Thankfully, the owner in Oklahoma was easy to work with and sent the boxes back that afternoon. She still didn't know how it happened, but at least it explained Olivia's 911 text the night before. With all that happening, she'd been able to keep her nerves under control, but just barely. Mom had been tense over the whole mix-up, and she should be. Omaha was one of their big accounts. She flew out once a year to make sure they were happy and to take samples of the new products. If she was tense about work, that meant she'd be tense at home. Mom was the wild card in Ellie and Logan's plan. She could blow up, or she could go deadly silent. Either option wasn't good, but a blow-up was much more likely if things didn't work out in the office. Olivia kept shooting Ellie dirty looks. Yes, the mix-up was her fault, but they'd had mix-ups before. There was always the chance that Olivia knew something big was coming. Ellie brushed the thought aside and she'd finally tuned her sister out. Things happened, and Ellie had done her best to right the wrong, so there was no need to be all put out. They were just sitting down to the family dinner when the sound of a diesel truck rumbled up the lane. All heads swiveled that direction, and a lump of fear formed in Ellie's throat. She had to force her body into motion. The feeling of eyes on her back burned into her skin as she made her way down the steps and across the lawn. Logan slid out of the truck, all long and lean, his shirt starched. He was so sweet to go to that much effort to be with her family. It was just a shirt, but he was respectful and thoughtful and just so. Logan. They reached for one another and Ellie didn't let the knowledge that her family was watching stop her from taking his hand. The yard was so quiet she could hear Mr. Can Can chewing. You ready? Logan asked, his brow low. I'm ready to be with you. She gave him a smile she didn't feel. I'm not scared. He kissed the back of her hand. This feels right. Ellie closed her eyes and drew from his well of courage. She pulled Logan along, and with a couple steps he was right beside her. She could hear her boots hit the dirt. Like on all those spaghetti western movies her dad used to watch. 
That moment when the hero stepped up to the saloon doors, ready to draw his gun at the slightest provocation. Yeah, that sound. Hey. She smiled lamely as they climbed the stairs. Her lips were stuck in place and her vocal cords moved as she took in the family's reaction. Dad's eyebrows were about to climb off his forehead. Dallas was shaking his head. Olivia's eyes were wide and she mouthed, don't. Mom and Bonnie were still inside. Robert and Jax were quiet, watching the Dumont family in crisis. For a second, Ellie wondered how William had faced this bunch and stood strong. If he could do it, so could she. After all, she wasn't leaving the ranch, she was just bringing someone to it. You all know Logan, she offered by way of introduction. At that moment, Mom breezed through the screen door with a hot pan of funeral potatoes. She paused as all eyes turned to her like a slow-motion tennis match. Ellie leaned against Logan. Mom took in the two of them, their hands clasped tightly, Logan's hand on her shoulder, and the pan crashed to the ground. Geez, Anna. Dad hurried over. Are you okay? He kicked shards out of her way. Mom's hands shook as she glared at Logan. I am not okay. She pointed at Logan. Get your hands off her. Logan's grip tightened. Ellie squeezed back. No. Ellie, hissed Olivia. Mr. and Mrs. Dumont. Logan's voice was clear and strong. I want you to know that I hold Ellie and your family in the highest regard. She's absolutely amazing in so many ways. I love her with all my heart. Ellie's hand went to her throat. Logan said all the right things. Olivia buried her face in her hands. This cannot happen. Mom stomped across the redwood, glass crunching beneath her boots. Ellie, you are a Dumont. You don't have to lower yourself with him and take the family name through the labrum mud. Logan's jaw twitched, and Ellie cringed at the way the words hit him. He didn't back down, though. Ma'am, I understand why you don't respect my father, and to be honest with you, I don't either. He's a mean old drunk with a lousy reputation and a worse history. But I've done everything I can to be just the opposite of him. I want to be a man Ellie can be proud to be with. I am proud to be with you, Ellie assured him. Logan's eyes shone. She had no idea how much those words would mean to him. She should have said them long ago. Her heart ached with the pain she must have caused by hiding their relationship all these months. And despite that, he'd still loved her. She drew herself up to her full five foot seven and one half inches, looking her mom square in the eye. I love him. I want to marry him. A collective gasp echoed as loud as a bull's bellow. In that case, I say yes. Logan grinned. Ellie whipped around and threw her arms around his neck, and their lips collided in a moment of joy. There was nothing she wanted more than to be this man's wife. To have and to hold him for all eternity. Logan's kiss was full of all the same thoughts. He promised to cherish her, to protect her, to... No. Mom shrieked. Ellie and Logan broke apart, startled by the outburst. Mom's cheeks were splotchy and her eyes wild. I forbid you from setting foot on my land. Ellie's mouth fell open. Mom was like a dust devil spinning around and around, building upon itself. I forbid it. Are you listening? Bonnie rushed to Mom's side and shook her arm. Don't make her choose, Anna. Don't put Joe between you two. He's not worth it. Mom snapped her teeth together. Nothing would escape those lips. Not an apology. Not a recantation. Not a budge. Logan was banned from the ranch. Of all the horrible reactions Ellie had envisioned, this was the worst, and it was happening right in front of her. Now that she was in the middle of it, that she could see the red in her mother's eyes, she knew what path she would chose, she chose love. My heart hurts for you, Mom. I refuse to live like you do, hating for the sake of hate. You don't know what you're talking about. Mom glared. Ellie turned, finding herself in Logan's arms. He was like a giant pine tree, standing against the dust devil and providing shelter, but less prickly. 
In fact, there were no prickles on Logan's soul. Can we go? She whispered. Anything you want. He kept his arm around her shoulders, and Ellie kept her eyes on the ground. She didn't want to see her family's reaction, to remember the looks on their faces as she walked away. There were no words. There was no sound. There was just the leaving. Ellie stopped at her truck to grab her purse. They'd need money, credit cards. She could hardly stand the thought of leaving, especially like this, but mom hadn't given her a choice. Without Logan, there was no life, no light, no love. Logan was her path. Logan opened the driver's side door and lifted her inside so she could scoot to the middle seat. Ellie, I'm sorry. I didn't want it to come to this. If you want me to go, I'll go. No, she took his cheeks in her hands. His wonderful, warm, loving cheeks. You are a man worth fighting for, and I've never shied away from a fight. He kissed her palm and then climbed up beside her. They drove down the lane. Ellie saw movement as they passed the houses and she turned to see Bonnie standing alone on her front porch, waving a dish towel, tears streaming down her cheeks. The sight nearly did Ellie in, and she choked on her tears as she waved goodbye to Bonnie, the Fair Catch Ranch, and her family. Chapter 33 Porter Dumont Hey, there's my little brother. Porter's head came up, and a grin spread over his cheeks. Will, what are you doing here? He waved, indicating the club that specialized in finding new bands. His group, a country-western band that played Lady Antebellum with a twist of Tim McGraw music, wasn't their normal garage band. The owner had joked that they were a barn band and had even put it on the posters advertising their group. William was in dress pants, shiny black shoes, and a polo. He didn't have a lick of country on him, but he showed up, and for that, Porter would always be grateful. I wouldn't miss your debut, not when I was the one who bought you your first guitar. Will slapped him on the back. You didn't tell anyone, did you? Porter looked over Will's shoulder, half expecting to see his mom blow through the doors with all the ferocity of the Wicked Witch of the West. Her performance Wednesday night was one that would go down in family history books. After Ellie left, mom dissolved into tears, and dad had to walk her home. Dinner was a quiet affair filled with Olivia's apologies to Robert and Jack's. To top it all off, Porter really missed the funeral potatoes. People thought he was a dumb kid, but he'd had the smarts not to bring that up. Bonnie had invited Porter to sleep on their couch, and he'd gladly accepted. It was Friday night, and Porter considered taking the couch again instead of walking into all the turmoil. No one had heard from Ellie in three days, and she didn't answer her phone or texts. Just my whole department. We'll wave to a group of people at the bar. Guys, this is my baby brother, Porter. Porter, this is Iris, Kimball, Trent, Jennifer, Angela, and Kelly. Porter made sure to shake hands with everyone. Thanks for coming out, guys. This is really great. You've got things to do, so we're going to hang out over here and watch you shine. Porter grinned. Thanks again. Will punched his arm and joined his friends. It wasn't long before the stage lights went up and Hank, their lead singer, stepped to the mic to introduce the Dusty Boots. William's group cheered the loudest, and Porter smiled their way. He couldn't make out faces with the lights shining so bright, but he played as if every girl were his. They finished their first set, and Hank announced a break, asking people to visit the bar while they waited. Porter hopped off the stage, his heart soaring. He'd mastered the rifts and was a solid backup voice. The future was like a blank page, and he had an idea what he wanted to print there. He wove through the crowd, which had grown considerably since they started. He wondered if that was normal or if they'd been so good people called their friends to join them. As he approached the bar, he noticed William had his arm around a girl's shoulders. Hey, he called over the din to get his attention. William spun the two of them around, and Porter was surprised to see Olivia. He swore. What are you doing here? She gave him a don't be an idiot look. I tracked your phone. She waved her cell in front of his face. 
He fisted his hands. You can't do that. It's a company phone, punk. She shoved his shoulder. How could you not tell me about this? Tell mom and dad. They'd want to be here. They wouldn't understand. But he would. She elbowed William. He grabbed his side. Hey. Don't act like you're innocent. You broke the family, and now you're encouraging him to do the same thing. I broke the family? William asked incredulously. Me? Yes, you. We'll look to Porter for confirmation. I was ten. Porter held up both his hands. But, yeah. Will cocked his head. I didn't. Olivia poked his chest. If you say you didn't know, I'll punch you. Will's face darkened. He broke the mold, he gets it, Porter broke in. You, he pointed at Olivia. Fall in line with everyone else. I do not. Olivia planted her hand on her hip. You tracked my phone, that's so mom, Porter fired back. He has you there. Will nodded. Olivia rolled her eyes. Wait. Porter threw up a hand. If you can track me. Can you track Ellie? Olivia pulled her phone to her chest. Yeah. Where is she? What do you mean, where is she? Asked Will, grabbing Porter's sleeve. What's wrong with Ellie? He and Olivia exchanged a look. You're the one who invited him, you tell him. Olivia jerked her chin at Porter. Porter sighed. She ran off with Logan Labram. Will's hand dropped to his side as if a fifty-pound weight were attached. Where is she? he demanded. Vegas. Olivia's lower lip trembled. She got there this morning. Will cursed and shoved away from the bar, pacing. Hank called for the band to take the stage again. The crowd cheered. I have to go. Porter wanted to go after Ellie, but she had her path to follow and he needed this, the band needed him. Go. Olivia shoved him towards the stage. Are you going to tell mom? Porter asked. Mom might just storm the strip and drag Ellie home kicking and screaming. Olivia chewed her lip. Not now. Maybe not ever. I don't know. He nodded once and darted through the crowd of people. Once they realized where he was headed, they parted to let him through. He vaulted onto the stage and took his guitar from Hank, who was waiting for him. You want to do the intro? Yeah. Porter bobbed his head. He stepped up to the mic, squinting against the spotlight. Hey out there. This next song is for my brother and sister, who came to see me play. Even when I'm an idiot, they know I love M. It's called, Mending Fences. He stepped back and waited for Bill to tap out the beat before picking a fast melody. Chapter 34 Bonnie Ruggles Friday night, when the preparations were all done and Dallas was in the shower, Bonnie headed out to her front porch and settled into the rocker. She'd been spending a lot of time rocking lately. Rocking and watching the chickens peck at her flower beds. The quiet didn't last for long. Soon, Jax chased Mr. Can, Can down the lane, the lead rope dancing along the ground just out of reach. Robert meandered behind them, a contented smile on his face. He glanced to the side, waved at Bonnie, and made his way up the steps. Do you mind? He gestured to the empty rocker beside her. She did, and yet she didn't. Having someone to talk to would help keep her mind from focusing on the sad things. Not at all. Have a seat. They watched Mr. Can, Can settle into a patch of weeds near the front yard and Jack's finally catching the lead rope. He stroked the goat's back, pointing out the yellow dandelions. He doesn't get that the goat is blind, said Robert. He doesn't act blind, Bonnie said without thinking. I suppose not. Robert stared at the floor. George's truck lumbered down the lane, the back stuffed with boxes. 
His smile beamed brighter than headlights. Bonnie waved as he went by. Having Carol and Levi back on the ranch was a wonderful thing. She should be celebrating, baking an applesauce cake to celebrate. But the energy just wasn't there. I guess you'll be packing up soon, too. Bonnie's heart had been through the ringer with Ellie leaving. She didn't know how she was going to handle losing Jax too. Robert slowly rubbed his palms together. I'd like to stay. I feel like the reasons I came aren't, settled. She rocked harder. I admire your courage. I wish I'd been braver in my youth. His hands paused. You have, regrets. She nodded, unable to put the darkest memories into words. Do you regret not having kids, he asked, and was immediately contrite. Sorry. I just wondered why you didn't, you're amazing with Jax. Her tongue felt huge and she had to work to swallow. Dallas wasn't, saying it out loud felt like a betrayal. Dallas was many wonderful things, but this one thing was bigger than all those put together. I'm sorry. Robert looked away. So am I. Rock. 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 Time is a funny thing. A minute is always 60 seconds. A year always has 52 weeks. But sometimes, it feels like a knotted ball of yarn that will never untangle. What are you supposed to do with knotted yarn? Robert set to rocking. I felt like I had a whole basket full of knotted yarn when Jessica died, I thought Jax's whole life would be tied up in those knots. And now? I'm figuring it out. He smiled. Being here has helped. The pace is slower, but there's always something to do which makes a man feel useful. Dad, called Jax. You have to come see this. Mr. Cancan -Can was eating weeds out of Jax's hand. I'm coming. Robert waved as he trotted down the steps. Thanks for the seat. His words stayed behind, and Bonnie mulled over them. A man may feel useful, but a woman just feels used up. She pulled up the tour site on her phone, browsing over the trips but always coming back to the one that touted six Broadway shows in five nights. Wouldn't that be something? She smiled at the screen. She'd have enough money after the fair when she sold her jewelry. Maybe she'd go right ahead and book the trip. Maybe she wouldn't come back. Chapter 35 Olivia Dumont The huge lights over the arena shut off, with a resounding click, dropping a blanket of darkness over the stands. Olivia's breath caught as Robert's arm brushed hers in the dark. His leg moved and she had an overwhelming awareness of his taut muscles. Heaven help her, she was going to internally combust if she had to sit next to him any longer. Bolting to her feet, she told the family, I'm going to check on the horses. Jasper didn't even need to be here since she wasn't roping, but she'd brought him along for moral support. You'll miss the fireworks, warned George. He passed a cotton candy cone to Jack's, who was wedged between Bonnie and Dallas. Bonnie fussed over the kid, making sure his fingers were wiped clean. Fireworks make Jasper edgy. I want to make sure he doesn't kick the stall down. Olivia stepped over them and landed on the stairs. George shrugged. I'll come with you, offered Robert. Olivia opened her mouth to protest. She was leaving to get some space from the man, from the scent of his cologne, and the warmth of his body pressed against hers in the crowded stands. Unable to come up with a good reason for him to stay, she clamped her mouth shut and headed down the stairs. Robert's hand touched the small of her back, sending shivers across her skin. They're about to start, Robert said just behind her. Hurry. Olivia began weaving through the people. Some of them lounged on blankets, while others clustered on their feet. She glanced behind her and couldn't see Robert. Spinning in a circle, she searched the crowd, but she'd lost him. Stumbling over a picnic basket, she apologized to the family. 
A large, worn hand enveloped her left one. Her instinct was to pull away, no one touched her left hand. But Robert was persistent. He hooked his last two fingers into the crook of her curled ones and offered a crooked grin. This way. He pulled her along, unable to run through the crush of people, but able to weave through them like she couldn't. She placed her right hand on his shoulder blade, soaking in the chance to touch him, be near him. Too soon, they cleared the masses and came upon the clearing where the horses stomped in rented stalls. Robert didn't release her hand, and she made no effort to remove it from his grasp. She was being silly, enjoying the contact as much as she was, acting more like lovesick Ellie than level-headed Olivia. Jasper was on the third row near the end. He stuck his head over the rail and whinnied. Zinger and Gypsy, in stalls across from Jasper and Trigger, munched happily on their hay. Jasper's dinner was crushed beneath his hooves. He seems okay, Robert said. A bright light filled the sky, and then a soft boom announced the beginning of the fireworks display. The horses all started or jumped. Jasper's eyes went so wide the whites glowed in the night. Olivia took hold of his bridle and stroked his neck, talking in hushed, calming tones. Trigger stomped his hooves and kicked the panel. Robert moved down and took hold of Trigger's halter, mimicking Olivia's low tones and soothing words. Trigger calmed quickly, despite the multicolored light show. Olivia released Jasper's halter and watched as he paced, tossing his head. Robert came back, leaning against the fence. He needs to run off the fear, she explained. If I hold on too tight, he feels claustrophobic. I know how he feels, muttered Robert. Huh? I've needed to think about what you said about not being able to go back. He rubbed at his chin. Heaven help her, the man had a day's worth of scruff, and she was all a twitter over it. You have? I'm not going back to Seattle, not yet. I've extended the lease for another month, at least. I don't know. I'm figuring this out as I go. Olivia's heart jumped up and down, doing a shimmy and a shake in celebration. That's great news. Robert scooted closer. So I guess you're stuck with me. She leaned against the fence and lifted her face to grin at him. There are worse things to be stuck with. Wow, thanks so much. She moistened her lips. Robert tucked her hair over her shoulder, his hand lingering on her neck. I'd like to try an experiment. Her heart pounded so loudly in her chest she was sure he could hear it. That sounds scientific. He nodded, slowly. It is very scientific. He adjusted to cradle her face, and Olivia leaned into his warmth. Olivia. He whispered her name, and his lips were on her temple, and her cheek. Her eyes drifted shut, unable to stay open any longer. She sagged against the fence, overwhelmed with the rush of desire Robert awakened. His lips met hers, and there was an explosion that had nothing to do with the firework booming through the night. It was as if his kiss had blown open her heart and her mind in one single shot. A soft whimper escaped her throat. Robert's kisses deepened, and the passion increased. She slid her arms up his chest, oh, that beautiful chest, and behind his head. He gathered her against him, holding her up and holding her tight. They continued kissing long after the fireworks ended and even Jasper had calmed down, drinking in one another like two lost souls who had found their missing pieces. Chapter 36 Ellie Dumont Ellie checked her boots in the mirror. She'd bought them this afternoon at a shop way off the strip. Teal, with just the right amount of bling. She'd wanted a splash of color peeking out as she walked down the aisle, just like her mom had on her wedding day. Mom's boots were red with white stitching. Ellie had loved those boots as a little girl, even tried them on and clomped around the house pretending to be a bride. She figured they counted for something new and something blue and even something borrowed, as she got the idea from her mom. The white dress, made of lace and tulle, swished when she walked. A cowgirl princess bride. 
she adjusted the veil tucked into her updo. We're ready, announced the chapel coordinator. She and Logan agreed that they wanted to be married in a church, and they'd found this small parish early this morning after driving through the night. Getting married in Vegas took a lot more work than she'd thought. Sure, there were dresses aplenty, but finding the right one took hours. The task would have been easier with Olivia at her side. Sisters should share these moments, and Ellie cried when she found the dress and stood alone in front of the mirror. She'd considered sending pictures and asking her sister's opinion, but chickened out. Olivia had warned her not to broadcast her feelings for Logan, and the last thing Ellie wanted on her wedding day was a lecture. So she'd done her best. Which, now that she was all put together and standing in front of a mirror, wasn't too shabby. I'm ready. Ellie lifted her skirts and followed the woman with a serious bun down a short hallway. Organ music seeped under the doors. Ellie worked to calm her nerves, but decided butterflies on her wedding day were welcome guests, especially since they were the only guests in attendance. The doors folded open, revealing a long red carpet. Olivia's gaze followed it right up to Logan standing by the pastor. His charcoal tuxedo fit him beautifully, but it was his grey sky eyes brimming with love that captured her attention. The organist switched to the wedding march. Her cue to walk down the aisle carrying the rented bouquet with red and white roses. Ellie couldn't move, she was so impressed with the magnitude of what they were about to promise and pledge that her hands were shaking and her throat was dry. She missed having her dad to lean on in this moment. Closing her eyes, she drew on the source of all strength and her feet took her toward her love. She moved with care, keeping time to the music and soaking in the sight of Logan, wanting to remember this for the rest of her life. Logan was reaching for her before she was halfway down the aisle. When they finally came together, all her doubts flitted away. He was her one and only, her forever. Somehow, someway, everything would work out. The pastor gave a short introduction and then asked Logan to read the vows he'd prepared. Logan caressed her fingers. Ellie, my love. We may not have had a traditional, or easy, beginning, but not all great love stories begin with a fairy tale. I promise you, ours will be the greatest love story ever told. I will work every day for your happiness, because when you are happy, my soul is at peace. Ellie grinned as two huge tears slid down her cheeks. It was her turn to pledge herself to Logan. Logan, my everything. Your goodness astounds and inspires me. You are my first thought in the morning and in my dreams at night. I can't imagine a life without you, but when I imagine our lives together, there is an abundance of love. I want our lives to be full of that love, every day. And I promise to give you all that I have, all that I am, and all that I will be." Logan squeezed her fingers, and two more tears fell from Ellie's cheeks and splashed on her dress. They exchanged rings, and when the pastor said, you may kiss the bride, Ellie got lost in the love Logan poured into her heart. He was right. They may not have had a fairy tale beginning, but together they would face the troubles that came their way and they would be happy in each other's arms. You've been listening to The Unexpected Groom A Lime Peak Ranch Family Drama Romance Novel Written by Lucy McConnell Welcome back! I hope you enjoyed your introduction to the Dumont and Ruggles families and the introduction to the family secrets and the introductions to the romance and all the things that are happening in this book. There's a lot happening. The series continues. There are two more books like this one and then one that is just from the point of view of the, the black sheep of the family who you will meet, I promise. Oh, I needed to let you know, next week I will not be here. So if you're following along, just pencil in that next week you have to go get a pedicure at the time that I normally upload so that you're not missing a thing. And I will be back the following week with the next book in this series. Of course, if you're watching these several months down the road and you can just binge watch or binge listen, binge listen to them all the way through. Thank you for listening today. Please subscribe to the channel. 
like it, heart it, comment, all of those things because it helps the channel get found by other viewers and readers and audiobook listeners and people who enjoy romance and all things cowboys, billionaires, and everything else I write. Thank you for being here. Remember that you are very loved and have a fantastic week.